Good evening. Um, good evening. How are you? All right. I want to thank you very much for inviting me to be with you to share concepts and ideas. I don't know if is uh, is the voice trans. Can you, can you hear me in the back at all? It needs to be louder. Well, they're working on that. All right. Let's see how is that better. Okay. Uh, how's that? Is that better? Okay. What I want to do today is uh, I want to share some concepts and ideas with you. And so I want you to take this piece of paper that says, that's going to give a lot of feedback or no? Okay. Um, the, um, leave this one on too. Okay. All right. Take the philosophical aspects of cultural difference. This is going to be our worksheet for tonight. In the United States, we have people that are from different ethnic groups. That's the first column. People from the different ethnic groups come from Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Native American. The concept of worldview means people who had a single historical event that changed everything for them. They were forced to speak a different language and forced to convert to a different religion. Hispanics comprise a collective of people who share a common world view. They were subjected to colonial Spain, they were forced to speak Spanish, and forced to convert to Catholicism. To be Hispanic is not race specific. You can be white, Hispanic, black, Hispanic, Native American, Hispanic. You can be Jose Wong and still be what? Yes. All right. Now, <clears throat> the other part of this is to be Hispanic is not contingent upon nationality. You can be Hispanic and come from Argentina, or from Chile, or from Nicaragua, or Cuba, or Texas, or New York. But if your history says you were subject to colonial Spain, forced to speak Spanish, forced to convert to Catholicism, then you are, by that definition, sharing a common worldview, and you are Hispanic. Now, Hispanic is also a political designation. And you need to be clear on that, too. You see, everything has an overt statement and a covert agenda. And in order to survive, you have to listen to the covert statement, but be very clear that there is a covert agenda. See, there's the overt statement here on top. That's what's said. But what is actually being done is the covert agenda to be carried out. So while you say, well, we want to know who these people are, you have to ask yourself, why do they want to know? They didn't want to know before. If you were Mexican-American, you were classified as white by the Treaty of Guadalupe, okay? But you weren't treated as white. But in Texas, when it got to be one-third black people voting, one-third white voting, then the Mexican-American vote was very important because it could shift the balance. So you need to know how many there were, where they were, how much money they made, and welcome to the Republican Party. Okay? So what I'm saying with you, it is a device by which we know the economic status, and we know the political status of a group of people that are classified with this nomenclature. Now the next three columns are classical philosophical disciplines. The first one is axiology. Please say it. Axiology. Axiology is the study of values. Values. Axiology is the study of what? Values. Good. The next subject is epistemology. Say it. Epistemology. That epistemology asks the question, 
How do you know knowledge? How do you know knowledge? How do you know things? That's epistemology. Logic asks the question, how do you reason? Now, since you read the materials that I'm a psychologist, the question is, why don't I talk about the psychological aspects of cultural difference rather than the philosophical? So you want to be clear on that. When we use our own disciplines, our focus is too narrow. So what we want to do is we want to expand, and the mother science is philosophy. Now, if I just use my discipline, psychology, I'm a psychologist, I'm a clinical psychologist, I'm a psychoanalyst with advanced training at Zurich, Switzerland. So you see, my vision of the world is very narrowly focused. Now, of course, since I'm the analyst, what does that make all of you? <laughs> Makes you all patients, doesn't it? You're sick, you need treatment, therapy, yeah, it's okay. I see that's too narrowly focused. Now let's try it differently. Let's see what happens if someone is an accountant, auditor, tax auditor for the IRS. What does it make all of you? Four. <laughs> okay. Now, you see that those visions are too narrowly focused because that's how you get isms, and that's how you get um, I am the good and you're the aberration from. I'm the correct, you're the wrong, I'm the good, you're the bad. Those are stereotypes. And that's how it's done when we're too narrowly focused with our own discipline. Now, what I want to do is I want to use the mother science. So now let's take a, what, what does mother science force us to do? It forces us to examine essences and how does that work? Well, I have a silly game that I've devised, and if we play that, then it'll be very clear. It has three steps. Step one, you're to close your eyes. Step two, I ask you to envision a specific noun. And step three, I ask you to open your eyes, and we, then we discuss it. All right, step one, close your eyes. Now, if your eyes are open, you're paranoid, okay? Step two, envision a chair, a chair. Perhaps even your favorite chair. Step three, open your eyes. Now. If we had taken a Polaroid snapshot of what each person had seen, all of them would be what? Yet if we collected all of them and gave them to any person in the room, each of you would be able to identify each of the pictures as a what? How is that possible? Because you have understood the essence of chairness and we would never confuse it with a what? Table, you see? So what I'm getting at is what are those very essential factors for difference? And I'm using the mother science philosophy to try to ascertain them. My belief system says that for Europeans, the highest value for them is in subject, object, member, object. So the important factor then is the external, the object. That's the highest value. Now, when you make a statement like that, you need some data to back it up. So let's look for some epidemiographic data that corroborates that construct. If a person says that their highest value is in the object, then you can understand what happened in 1929 when there was a crash. Many people lost everything, but significant numbers of white males did what? Yes, because they had lost that which for them was the object of highest value. What happened in 1970, there was an automotive industry that said, if you have worked for us for 30 years or more, effective the 1st of July, you retire. These were 50-year-old men, and for the first time in their lives, they would be without a job. But they had homes paid for, cars paid for, retirement benefits, health benefits, union benefits, everything you would imagine. But after the 1st of July, they would not have a job. So within six months after they were uh, in forced retirement, significant numbers of white males simply began to die. We didn't understand why they were dying. I was working with the National Institute at that time, and our boss came in and said, do something. We said, yes, of course. Now, what did we do? Well, we, of course, began to study. We formed a commission, and we studied the issue. What did we come up with? 
The findings were that these men did not use their, creative t their leisure time creatively. So how are you going to resolve that? Well, what we said was go to the community mental health, go to the community centers and learn how to do something creative. Now these are 50 year old men working with a ball of clay in the community mental health, in the community center. It didn't work, didn't it? Some of them went to your mother's kitchens with the idea of helping to get the wretched place in order, bring it into clarity and order. Well, it didn't work either. Some were mysteriously found murdered because they were meddling in the kitchen too long. So we don't know what happened to them. But others simply went out and got another one. Did that job pay as much money or more? It was just the object. Now, is object only materialism? The answer is no. Power, control, and authority are objects. Now, does it make sense to you in terms of why there's the brutality with police? Because they want to make sure that they maintain the what in any kind of, that's it, in a situation with you. They want the power. That for them is the object. Okay? Now let's go to the next one. For us as blacks, for those that are Hispanic, those that are Arabs, the highest value lies in the relationship between people. So if the highest value is between people in the relationship, it says people in this culture see themselves to each other to be one. Equal. If we are equal and you do something to treat me as less than equal, you have treated me with what? Yes. And what do we call that in black English? There you got it. And what happens to people who diss? Yes, they do. Do you see? See what's going on? Highest values in the relationship. If you do something to treat me as less than equal, you've destroyed the relationship because you have disrespected me. Now let's go back to our European counterpart where the highest value is in the object. If the highest value is in the object and I have all of the objects and you cannot physically take one from me, but you need it to survive the winter, how must you act toward me to have access to this resource? You must be what to me? No. Subservient, subordinate, so we develop a hierarchy. You see the hierarchy that has to develop? You are subordinate, subordinate to me, someone is subordinate to you, and so forth, you have a hierarchy. Now, let's see what the difference is between the two. If you have a hierarchy, because I have the object, then I can control your behavior and you. If I want something done, if we were in Germany, and I needed another marker or another piece of paper up here, I would say, now, we have Hans and Fritz right here. Hans and Fritz. Hans outranks Fritz, I outrank Hans. I would say to Hans, Hans, steh auf! Hold me doch ein Stück Kreide. Hans, get up, give me a piece of chalk. Hans would jump up and go get it, wouldn't he? If he had enough time, he would yell to Fritz, Fritz, hast du nicht gehört, was Nichols gesagt hat? Didn't you hear what Nichols said? And Fritz would go bounding out of here. Now let's see what happens when you're in a situation where people see themselves to be what? All right, now let's see the young black brother right here. What is your name? Aaron. Aaron, all right. Aaron is black, I am black, we see ourselves to be what to each other? Even though I outrank him, he expects me to treat him as what? I know, let's see what happens if I act with Aaron the same way I did with Hans. Aaron, get up off your black one. He's not women, man, I don't play that. <laughs> you see? Because the perception is I was not treating him as equal, I was treating him with what? Yes, and could destroy the relationship. Are you beginning to see now how important it is to understand what the axiologies are? Put this in the context of your job. How do people treat you at work? See, they say uh, in, in white culture you tell people what to do. In black culture you have to what? See how easily and spontaneous it comes? See? Because if we are equal, you ask. If we are in rank order, then you tell. Now, I share these things with you because 
working as a black man with white people umpteen years, I've had my feelings very, my jaw has been very tight on many occasions. In spite of the fact that I intellectually knew this, I still felt differently. You see? Because when people start yelling and hollering at me, I just get an attitude. That's what they say. It's not an attitude. It is that they are attacking my axiology. You know better than I am. Who do you think you are? I have a PhD, you got one too. So what? Even if I didn't have one, it doesn't matter. You treat me as a person. But of course, in the other culture, it is rank order. Whoever rank has what in European culture? Power and privilege. That's the way it is. And so what I'm sharing with you is that these are devices to help you to be more comfortable in the working environment and to understand what is operating. Also, if the highest value is in the relationship, we work constantly throughout the day to establish the relationship. How do we do it? Good morning, hello, how are you? I came up here, I got a big hug, okay? We are constantly working to maintain the relationship. Now, if you're working in an office and you walk by somebody's office, the door is open, what do you say? Hi. Come back by, what do you say? Hi. Go back by again, what do you say? Hi. At the time you walk by and don't say anything, what does the other person say? What's wrong with you? You stuck up, you got an attitude or something? Because we have to constantly reinforce the relationship. Now, how many times have you walked down the hall, break your face to somebody white and say, hello, and they walk right on by you? And you get mad, oh, you see? Now, why? Because as far as they're concerned, no, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't exist. It means that they're focusing on the object. You see, if, if I get on the elevator and my boss, I get off the elevator, my boss has told me, I want that report now. My focus is on the what? Which is the object and I'm preoccupied with the object and I don't have time to establish any kind of what? Yes, I'm not concerned about that. Or I might have said good morning to you when I first came in at eight o'clock. So don't expect me to say anything else, good morning or hello or anything else from that point on, because I did that already, okay? And you have to be very clear about those things because you'll be very uptight at work. And you wonder why your jaw is so tight. Because you're breaking your face and smiling and people just walk right by and just say, I don't see you. And you ask, well, am I, am I invisible? You can't just see me? They say, oh, oh well, I, I spoke to you this morning. Oh. These are things we have to be cognizant of. Now, it's very important that we also understand when people are asking, why can't we as blacks have greater unity? Well, if the highest value is in the relationship, you can't relate to a group. You relate to the individual. So in order to make black groups function, we have to relate on a one-on-one -on -one basis to each person individually, okay? And the person who is the leader for a black group is charismatic. Now what does that mean? It says that when I speak to the audience, each of you hears me speaking directly to you alone. Take one of the old recordings of Malcolm X and play it. Is he talking to people out there, over there? Who, to whom is he speaking? He's speaking directly to me. Even though he's been dead all these years, he is still a charismatic speaker because he is addressing me. The best pastors and ministers in churches, the best of the black leaders speak and people know that he's speaking directly to whom? Yes, to you the person, individually. Now that's how you get persons and that's why when we get a person like that, they kill them off because they're too powerful. That's why charismatic leaders are killed. The reason you have to relate to each other is because our value system says that. Now let's look at a very powerful pastor in a church. He's got all these sisters out here. He doesn't say, I want all the women to work hard together. John says, hmm, they ain't talking to me. <laughs> okay. But he says, Sister Mary, I want you to work on the altar committee, and Sister Jones, I want you to work on the food committee, and 
he assigns a, then they feel very important because it has been a what? One on one relationship. So if you want black organizations to function, then the people who come together and say we want an organization have to be treated on an individual basis, constantly reinforcing that there is a relationship. And the moment people feel that there is no relationship, they feel that they're being what? Yes, and you've lost your organization. It's very difficult, it's very time consuming, but it is not impossible. It takes work to make a black organization work. Okay? Because you have constantly got to maintain the what? The relationship. Okay? It has to be done that way. That's the only way it works. Otherwise it won't work. You cannot say, uh, let me show you the differences between the two groups. Now, suppose you're going to have a meeting. If the highest value is in the object in the European set, then a meeting would be called by sending you a brochure. How many of you attend meetings based on a brochure? You may not even open the letter. The only way we would get you to come out to a meeting is in what kind of way? Somebody get on the what? On the phone. See? See, you have to, get, you have to establish that one. That one-to-one -one relationship. I want you to come out and hear the philosophical aspects of cultural difference. What are you talking about the philosophical what? I want you to come out. I want to be there by myself. Well, okay. Okay? It has to be one-on-one. -on -one. That's how we do it. Now, to try to make ourselves into someone else or something else is not going to work. That's the way we are. That's the way that we have to devise methods to be successful in what is ours. So if you're in an organization, don't spend your money on postage, spend it on telephone. Okay? Go visit, sit down and talk to people. People say, the children are so bad in school, we can't do anything with them. I sent a letter. Uh -uh. See, when I was coming along, the teacher would go visit. Now, she wouldn't go into your house talking about how bad you were and telling a woman who's worked all day what a bad child she's got. She would just say, Hello, Mrs. Nichols, how are you? I'm so glad I'm Edwin's new teacher and I want to be sure that we understand that you want the same things for Edwin that I want for Edwin. And uh, I'm very happy that he's in my class and I'm sure he's going to be a wonderful student this year. She hasn't said one thing about how bad I was in class and how evil I was and what have you. She's just said how interested she is in me and wants to know if my mother is interested. My mother said, yes, I am. Now, the next day when I get in school and I get ready to cut up, she says, do you want me to call Lena? Because she's already established what with my mother? That's right. And if I get out of line, you know I'm in serious trouble. Okay? So this is the way historically we have done it, and this is what is necessary to do in a we're going to have organization today. That's black organizational structure. Now, let's see what happens when we deal with a culture that says the highest value is in the cohesiveness of the group. It's the Asian culture. When you are trying to ascertain how other people see themselves, we don't always have all the tools to do that. For an example, <clears throat> if I look up in the dictionary the word group, whose name is on the cover? Webster. How many trips did Webster make to Asia? And you can get there. So he may not know how they see the word group themselves. So what I'm going to do is share with you a way of doing it. I guess it's already on. Um, I take the word group and I write it in Chinese. This is the Chinese word for group. This word by itself is king. And this one is she. So in order to be a group, you have a leader and what? Followers. You see what I'm saying? Now the language is much more sophisticated than that. So let's take a look and see what it means at a, at a different level of sophistication. Um, in monarchy, there is hierarchy. The king is higher than the queen, who's higher than the duke, who's higher than the duchess. And we see sheep as stupid, dumb animals. They see sheep as conformist animals. 
So the essence of groupness is to be a conformist within the hierarchy. How many of you have dealt with total quality management on your job? Okay. Then Deming says we must be conformist in the hierarchy in order to maintain group cohesiveness. Now, how do people make decisions that will keep a group cohesive? Well, who's the tallest man in here? Who's taller than 6'3"? Raise your hand. All right, stand up. Anyone taller than this man? All right, stand up. Okay, how tall are you? How, t yeah, six, six, seven. All right, this is the biggest man. He says, what's your name? Michael. Michael says, we are going north for water. Whom among you will argue? But Michael, if we get up north and there's no water, how long would you be in charge? Not very long. Thank you very much. Unilateral decisions do not keep groups cohesive. Now let's see what we learned from the Greeks. Majority rule. All those in favor of going north for water, please be so kind as to raise your hands. Or we're going to have a group over here going north and a group over here wanting to go what? South. And the groups will start what? Splitting. And we'll never be what? Cohesive. So we have to ask ourselves, in Asian culture, what do they do in the decision-making process to keep their group cohesive? They have to come to a what? Consensus. Now, how do you write consensus in Chinese? Now, it's dyslexic, because I'm dyslexic in English, but dyslexia transfers, okay? But I'm going to give it to you anyway. If you look at this as a single word right here, that's the Chinese word right there for heart. Okay, heart. Now, if you look at the next word above it, up here, it's voice. So in order to come to a consensus, your heart and your voice have to say the what? How many times have you said something with your voice that you didn't mean with your heart? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's called passive-aggressive behavior. It's listed in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, Roman numeral four, for mental illness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when your voice and your heart say the same thing, you have a new Chinese word which is intent. So if I know how you think and feel, if I know your affect and your intellect, I know your what? If we all have the same intent to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day at the corner grocery store, does anyone have to be awakened to get to work on time? And that's your Korean experience, isn't it? You see? Because they have said with their what? And their what? And everyone knows they have the same what? Yes. Now we're ready for the last part of the calligraphy. And now, this is the Chinese word for come together and speak with one. That's how they write one, Mao. And that's a consensus. Now that's how they do it. And it's very easy, once you've been in the decision-making process, to be a conformist in the hierarchy and keep the group cohesive. Does that make sense? Say amen. Yeah. Now, what I'm sharing with you is, it is not that others are better and good and all these things and we are bad. It's that we are all different. And we have to find out what works for us and work it, rather than to always criticize ourselves because we are not Korean or we're not white. Black people have very successful organizations, but you have to understand how to work it and what the dynamics are. Okay? All right. Uh, let's look to see what the experience was with a Native American, because I think that's very important. You have to understand what happened to them can happen to other people. Their value system said oneness 
highest value lies in oneness with the great spirit. In traditional metaphysics for Indian culture, Native American culture, they think of seven essences for the world. Those things that travel on two, those that travel on four, those that travel with wings and feathers, flippers and fins, under the earth, on the earth, above the earth. So those seven things constitute the way the world is for the Native American. So if you see them doing a hoop dance, they dance with how many hoops? Or multiples, seven, 14, 21. The idea is that all of them will come together into a single hoop. And here's the single hoop, the Great Spirit. Now, because they believe that they have oneness with the Great Spirit, you see at this level there's nothing connecting them. But if we have oneness with the Great Spirit, then here I am, here is the Great Spirit. All of us have our oneness in the one. Now, if you have oneness way up here in the Great Spirit, would you ever do anything down here to hurt, harm, destroy, or damage? Doesn't make sense, does it? So their highest value is in a totally ecologically balanced system, total ecological balance. That's how they are happiest, that's how they survive, that's their belief system. That's why they have the Great Plains and all the other things, because they had to be in total ecological balance. Now, if your axiology says that the highest value is member to the Great Spirit, and you come in contact with people who have a different axiology, member to the object, well, both of you are trying to provide for your families. This individual said, this individual, the Native American, says it takes me two buffalo to survive the winter. The meat and the hides from two buffalo, maximum three, will take care of my family for the whole winter. But this man does not see the buffalo as his survival. He sees only the buffalo's what? It's hide. So we see that white people think about what all the time? Yes. So when they look at a woman, they look at what? Yes, and start talking about her what? Yes. You see? Or her hair. Mm -hmm. I had a black woman tell me, Nick, Ed, ain't nobody ever asked me for a piece of hair. Okay. I didn't hear amen on that. Okay. Because we don't deal with what? Yes. Now when we get to epistemology, you'll find out why. Now let's go over here. They want as many pelts as they can get. So they killed off a lot of what? If you want timber from the forest, you don't want one log dragged through the forest. You have to cut down a whole side of things, float them down the stream to get to the mill, and you kill off the fish. Now, do you see what they've successfully done? They've destroyed the ecological what? In order to have the what? Yes. Now, can these people keep their axiology in place? Now we're going to put them on a reservation. There's no way you can maintain an ecological balance on, the, on that little tiny reservation. So what they end up doing is drugs, drinking, fighting, killing each other off. Finally, they woke up and they said, all right, there's a treaty between the United States and the sovereign Indian nation. Are we a sovereign nation? The government said, yes, of course you are. They said, well, we're going to open what on our reservation? That's it. Now it's time to do what to the rules? Yes, because it, they charge an income tax for the American federal government on the money they make on the reservation. All right? Okay. 
Now let's look to see what happens to our children in school. Go to the next column, epistemology. The epistemology address how do you know knowledge? How do you know something? That's what we're talking about. How do we know things? Europeans reduce knowledge to its lowest common denominator. Let me explain that. If you were a young Greek centuries ago, you, like your father and your grandfather, when you were of age, you would be sent to study in Africa at Memphis or Luxor. That's where they were educated. They would leave as a young adult. A young adult was 15. Jews are adults at what age? 13. Bar Mitzvah. Already you have a child, so your, parent, your seed has been carried on. Now you're released to go study. They had to study the rhetoric and those things for about 12 years, four years engineering and four years of math. That's about 20 years of study. So 15 plus 20 equals 35 years of age. When they went home, they found that the life expectancy for the rest of the Greeks was what? 27. That's not a very cost-beneficial educational program, is it? So you have to reduce what has to be learned if everyone is to learn it because it took too long. All these people will be what? So you've got to reduce it. Now how do you reduce it? You reduce it to its lowest common denominator. In the African learning process, we always dealt with the spirit with the mind and with the body, which is the intellectual, the intellect, and the physical. Now they said, we will reduce learning to its lowest common denominator. We will say that you can know if you can count and what? Measure. See it on your paper? So knowing has been reduced to what? Counting and measuring. The what? the object. That's called scientific what? Method. You see what they've done? They've elevated that which was already lowered to something greater than what it is. Let's go through that again because you didn't get it. Counting, they took valid African ways of knowing and reduced it to its lowest common denominator, which is you have to what to know? And measure the what? And they elevated it in their language to scientific methods. So if you don't count it, and if you can't count it and measure it, they said it's not knowable. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? All right, now let's go through that and see what happens here. They said to count and measure. Fine. You can count and measure physical things. You can count and measure intellectual things. Idiot, imbecile, moron, IQ. Can you count and measure spirit? Then scrap it. Now you have a dilemma. The knowledge is stored in the what? But in a very short time, the body what? Dies. So the Greek dilemma is to separate the what? From the what? Yes, that's called the mind-body split. Now what comes out of that that we still live with today? <laughs> That's true. What happens is people ascribe values. So they ascribe that people who work with their head are good and lead us to God. Those people who work with their physical things, physical things then become bad. So you have white collar workers and what? Who gets paid more money? Yes, because they are one, using their one. 
with the exception of plumbers. <laughs> now, here's what's very important in this. If a person says, I want to be your leader and I will lead you to God and goodliness, then they are required to give up the what? Yes. What religion has that practice today? Catholic Catholicism. Celibacy of the priesthood. You see how that goes? Now let's look at some of the other things that happen on the jobs today. If physical things are bad, sex is a physical act. Therefore, sex is, by this way of thinking, what? Bad. Unless it has been elevated to procreation. Now, do you see how some groups of people think the only reason you to have sex is to have what? Babies, you see? And they practice laws and things like that that say that's the only way you have sex. Do you see what I'm talking about? That's where all these crazy things come from that have nothing to do with us as black people. Okay, now let's go and look at this again. If sex is a physical act, what kind of an act do you have to perform to show, to show sexual intent? Let's go through this again. Sex is a physical act. If I have sexual intent, I must perform what kind of an act to let you know that I have a sexual intent? Physical. Now let's take that into an office. Harassment. What happened? What happened? He won. He touched me. You see the idea of touch being the physical, expressing sexuality? Now you see in black culture, we hug each other all the time, and it has no what? No sexual content to it. All these women that grab me and hug me out here would be offended if they thought I thought they were trying to get over with me. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? Because it's what? An expression of what? Love and establishing the what with us as blind people? Relationship. You see what I'm talking about? Now, if you don't think that it, it has sexual content, Look at two white men and ask them to hold hands. I do these lectures where it's all white. It was like 15 white men and nickels. I asked two of them to come up here and I said, well, hold each other's hand. They turn purple. Because in their culture, touch is linked to sex. Touch and sex are linked. And in Catholicism, we have an admonishment against touch. Don't touch me. Because they're constantly linking touch to what? Which in their perception is physical and therefore what? Yeah. But that's not us. Okay? Now let's do some things here. Now that you know the origin, if the highest value is in the object, you count and measure, how do they know? They assemble parts, there's that word, that becomes the what? The whole. They do it in a linear way, and they do it sequential. A follows B follows C follows D follows E follows F. Now, take parts to the whole, linear sequential, put it into a factory. Tell me what that's called. Assembly line. That's how Europeans got rich. Henry Ford made us a billion dollar nation by having the process by which we make automobiles linear sequential parts to the whole count and measure. All right? Now let's see what our situation is. Ours is symbolic imagery and rhythm and we perceive the whole. Now, on your paper, after the word rhythm, somebody's going to ask you, do they mean clapping your hands? That's not that. Rhythm means function. Put down function. If your heart is out of rhythm, it is not what properly? It's not functioning properly. You see what I'm saying? Now, what are symbolic images? Parables, proverbs, 
You see? These are the things we use all the time. Hmm? Okay? Man, that's bad. Okay, that's symbolic imagery for what? Good. That ain't too cool. Mm -hmm. What are some other symbolic images? All right? Don't act ugly. Now, how can you act ugly? But that's a symbolic one. It's not a grammatical error. It's a symbolic image. Pretty is as pretty one. There you are. See, this is the way we know. This is our epistemology. It's very important that we understand this because our children come into dealing, they come from homes where the highest value is in the relationship. They go into public schools and they carry this holistic way of knowing. Give me the big what? Yes. But they're given a what to learn and told to do what to it? Then you're given another what? That you what? Then another what? Now on Friday, you're given a test on the what? And our kids don't do too well. How many of you are of West Indian descent? You will have brothers and sisters who grew up in the West Indies. And then the youngest children were born and raised here. The ones born and raised, boy children, in the West Indies read and write and spell. The ones born here, for some reason, are dyslexic, need special ed, some kind of problem. Same gene pool, what happened? Two different epistemologies for teaching. Two different methods for teaching the same idea. Teachers in the islands maintain the what with the pupil? And the what? The relationship. Children are treated here as the what? Yes. They're never told the what? They're only talked to about the what? Yes. Are you beginning to see now where we have problems? Because the place they start our children to learning is contradictory. It's confusing. If you have always looked to ask, what is the big what? And somebody starts talking about this little point over here. Let, let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at these markers. Well, people will say, looking at the part, this is the red marker. Because it has a red cap. This is the blue, this is the green. But for our culture, we say this is the black cap the white bottom, the felt tip, the black ink, what is the chemical composition of the ink, because we're thinking about the what, not a what. And that's the difference. Many of you go to college, you get your first assignments, they have given you a thousand what, and then test you on the what, and you're always confused because you didn't know you had a whole or a part. Now let's see what happens at work. You go to your boss and you say, here's the program. You've given him a what? He can't perceive the what. So he forces you to break it down into what? It takes a lot of time. Here's another situation where you have these parts assigned to you, but you thought he gave you a what? And so you're working for six hours on the whole and the, your white counterpart did it in an hour and gave it back. So everybody thinks that you're one, slow and dumb. Then when you turn in your 10 pages, you say, I didn't want all that. You say, well, what'd you give it to me for? <laughs> OK. Yeah. Then after a while, you get real angry because you said, these white people have never talked to me about the what. They've only given me one. Oh my goodness, you're racist, you're thinking that way. I have nothing like that, it's not that way at all. Well, it isn't, because they only do it that way. 
our children have to be given a principle or an idea about what are you talking about. How many of you had algebra? Raise your hands. How many of you can tell me what algebra is for? <laughs> but you certainly know all the what? Yes, and you can count and measure them, can't you? We have to have educational systems that are designed to help our children be successful. Otherwise, they're always told that they're dumb and stupid and learning disabled and everything else, and it has nothing to do with any of that. It's just that there are differences in epistemological models for knowing. Now, let me show you what happens in the Asian set. In the Asian set, they have to be able, theirs is a transcendental, highest values in the cohesiveness of a group. It's a transcendental way of knowing. You have a little x, and you have to connect it to its universal truth, the big X. In order to do that, you have to be able to see the whole concept and all of its parts simultaneously. That's the word you want to write down. You see, you cannot read Chinese if you cannot see the whole character and every single stroke simultaneously. You can't read Chinese linear and sequential. You can't do it that way. You have to see the whole and all the parts simultaneously. Now, how do they know something? They study the tiniest detail until they know it thoroughly and connect it to its universal truth. They want to learn how to do arithmetic. Arithmetic is comprised of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Now, in order to do that, they had to know the smallest concept. Well, the smallest concept, if you're going to do arithmetic, you've got to know all of your what? Our numbers. That's what they teach on Sesame Street. They looked into seven. Seven is a... Uh, primary number seven is a sacred number. They found, when you look inside seven, sets. Zero and seven, one and six, two and five, three and four. The moment they recognized two and five, they said if you manipulate the sets of two and five, you can do all the forms of arithmetic rapidly. So they built a machine with a set of two above the bar. They put five beneath the bar, and they called the machine a what? Abacus, yes. And they can do all the forms of arithmetic rapidly. Now, what's the difference between the Chinese and the Japanese? Well, we say the Japanese lack creativity. They don't lack creativity, they just have creativity in a different form. And that's what we have to find, is our form for doing things. The Japanese take whatever you give them, they improve on it, and they make it uniquely there. So the Japanese abacus is the set of one and four, as opposed to two and five. Mother China gave us the rice bowl and the chopstick. The Japanese says, it's hard to get rice out of that bowl. So they redesigned the bowl. And that's how their bowl is shaped. You see what I'm talking about? See that side coming down here? See? And their chopsticks come to a sharp one. So you can pick up a single one, grain of rice. It lies right on the side of the bowl. And the rice from physics falls to the center. Who discovered the microchip? We did. Who got rich on it? They did. Because they took what we gave them, they improved on it, and made it uniquely theirs. Now, we do that with style. We do that with style. If you do it with style and make some money in it, then that's good. But we do it with style. Now, let me give you an example. When I was growing up, if someone had said to me, wash your hair every day, but don't comb it or I'm going to braid your hair into 50 little braids, and you walk down the street as a boy with an earring and your 50 braids. You'd have had to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to kill me. That's what they used to do in fraternities. They'd braid people's hair, do other crazy things with it. You see what I'm talking about? Or shape it. Now, somebody cuts a line across your head like that, that's style. 
Well, the Japanese are now doing what? Trying to style after us. Every, everyone's trying to style after us. Okay? So it isn't that we don't have creativity and talent. It is we have to now change it from where it is just temporary and makes a little money to where it is important and makes a lot of money. Now one more set, and then we're going to ask questions. Logic. How you reason. In um, our way of reasoning as black people is di unito. And di frasismo is the Hispanic way of reasoning, which is exactly the same, and it comes out of Aztecs. The Aztec, the Aztecs down there in Mexico had that same way of reasoning. They called it diferencismo. But it says that you take two things that are ostensibly in opposition and you make them into oneness. Now we have to ask ourselves, why do we reason that way as opposed to dichotomous? Now remember I told you when those Europeans came back from Africa studying, they reduced learning to its lowest common denominator. So if you're going to reason to an answer, if you say there's, it is either yes or what? Plus or A or, then you don't have any problems. But everything isn't either what? Or plus or minus. But they reduced it to its what? Lowest common denominator. Now, that's because the highest value is in the what? And you either, either the object is a yes object, no, a plus, or a minus, or an A or a B. Our highest value is in the what? Therefore, we have to be able to reason in such a way to reinforce and keep the value system intact. Now, look at that very carefully. You have an answer, and he has an answer. Is his answer more important than yours? Is yours more important than his? But the two of you have an answer. Now what we have to do is to maintain the relationship, we have to take these two things that are ostensibly in opposition and bring them to oneness. Okay, let's go through that again. You have an argument, he has an argument. Are you gonna fight, and destroy each other, and destroy the relationship? No. So we have to reason in such a way that the two of you maintain the relationship so your arguments come to oneness. And therefore, when we, we reason to a point at which we try to do that, but if it, it's not going to work out that way, then the reasoning says to make a statement that shifts the whole thing away. Now let me give you an example in Scripture. Christ was confronted by the Pharisees, and the Pharisees asked questions in the dichotomy. Do you pay taxes to Caesar? The answer could only be what? Or what? That's all. Either case, he's trapped. If he says, yes, I pay taxes to Caesar, then when in the temple, they would say, you, you support the imperialist Roman government that oppresses your people, you're a hypocrite. If he said no, the, the tax collectors would have taken him to jail. Now, see, some of you don't believe they had IRS, then it would take you to jail. But what well, was St. Matthew? He was a one. He was a tax collector, not for greater Israel, but for Rome. Do you see? That's why they were so hated. So either way, Christ is trapped. So what does he say? He says, show me the coin by which the tax is paid. They showed him the coin. He said, well, whose picture is on it? They said, stupid, Caesar. He said, well, then give to Caesar what's Caesar and give to the Lord what's the Lord. And went on in and turned the tables over in the temple. You see what I'm talking about? That was a diunital. He took two things that were in opposition and made them into one. Oneness. All right? Now, we call them smart-ass answers. That's what you have when you're children call them. Okay, all right, okay. Now there's another way that we deal with situations trying to maintain this relationship. Let me give you an example. There's a white woman who came into a very exclusive white store in Washington, D.C. Well, I mean the upper, 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 upper. And she wanted a dozen frappe glasses. The glasses cost $100 per glass in crystal. The black saleswoman was somebody that had been there for a thousand years. You remember the old black women that had their hair pulled back very tightly into a little ball? And that hair was straightened and not a strand ever got out of line and this little ball on the back? 
And they have this natanola right around here, nut brown. Looking pre-embalmed. If she died, they could just put it right on in the coffin, go see what's in. <laughs> that sister was heavy though. If you walked in and you took a glass out and you looked at it, she says, oh, this is Bracara crystal. This is an Obrian pattern. The patterns are now obsolete. This specific glass is a, is a Riesling glass. How many would you like to the French develop? They make them in April and September on special order. It would cost you X and that's how she did it. This white woman came in with all her furs, very rich, and she wanted a dozen frappe glasses and she said, I want a dozen frappe glasses. And the woman put them out and she said, Madame, these are they, and began to demonstrate and show them to her. The woman said, these are not frappe glasses, they are too thin. Now you can get into a what kind of argument? Yes, they are, or what? And you could lose your what? Or break the what? So the woman said, well, let me show you some more. Okay. All right. She said, well, let me show you some more. So she put others out there. The white woman became annoyed. I told you these are not frappe glasses. They are too thin. Madam, plastic's in our next section. Because it's clear you don't know what a frappe glass is, OK? She's not going to do this what? Either or. She gave her both and. Okay. All right, now, what gets us in trouble is we live in a society that is both racist and sexist. And it costs us because it is both racist and sexist. So this is a way of looking at how people reason dichotomously to form isms. I'm going to form an ism for you. I want you to tell me what the ism is. In order to form an ism, there are three things that are necessary, and these are they. The first thing I have to, you have to, I have to say, number one, what is good and what is bad? Number two, who is good and who is bad. And number three, I have to socialize you to believe what I have said to be true. Those are the three steps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by telling you what is good and what is bad. I am using dichotomous logic, but I am corrupting it with my cultural bias of good and bad. I'm saying to you to be assertive is good, to be submissive is bad. But in many cultures, to be submissive is to be what? Assertive, submissive, aggressive, passive, powerful, powerless, strong, weak, fearless, timid, intelligent, ignorant, independent, dependent. Now I have told you step one, what is good and what is bad. And step two, I have to tell you what? Yes, who is good and who is bad. Through the grace of the gods we find Do you see that? No, not really. Do you see it? It's nail. Okay. Now, what ism have I formed with that? Yes. Men are good. We are assertive, aggressive, powerful, strong, fearless, intelligent, and independent. And therefore, women are, through the lower forms of nature, submissive, passive, powerless, weak, timid, ignorant, and dependent. Do you see that? Now I have to get you to believe it through socialization, and I say to you, as a little girl, don't try to do that, my dear. You are not. Get whom to help you. Yes. Don't go in that dark place. Something will. Yes, I want you to be one. Yes. Ninth grade, don't take algebra because algebra is too. I'm really saying you're too what to learn it. Yes. Now, do you see how dichotomous logic works and how it stays in place? Okay. Now, after a certain point, women say, well, my goodness, Nichols, um, I, um, I don't like it. And I don't want it to be that way. Well, why do we keep isms in place? Privilege. Uh, if you write nothing else down for the day, that's the magic word, privilege. 
isms give privilege. You see, when you ask white people to give up their racist, sexist behavior, you're asking them to give up what? Yes, let me explain that to you. Uh, of the men in this room, please raise your hand if you are not a sexist yourself personally. Raise your hand if you're not a sexist. Raise your hand, you're not a sexist. Raise your hand, we have men who are not sexist. Now, here's my point. Even though you are not a sexist, as a male in a sexist society, you still enjoy the what? Of being male in the sexist society, even though you are not a sexist. You see what I'm saying? All right, now let's understand that because it's very important. What are some of the privileges that we have as males in a sexist society, even though we are not sexist? When a woman buys a car, it costs her what? More. Her clothing costs. Her haircut costs. Her laundry costs more. You see what I'm saying? Now do you see what happens when I deal with my white friends? They say, oh, but Ed, you know I'm not a racist. I say, well, yes, I know you're not a racist, but you enjoy the what of racism. Yes, because all of my insurance rates are higher than yours. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, can you break down racist and sexist reasoning with pure logic? The answer is no. You can only re-socialize the society to change things. Let me give you an example. If we add to this now, I think this is the important thing I want to do is I want to show you what the system does to us when we fight racism or sexism. So take a look and see what happens now. We, the system wants to maintain privilege with the isms. And here's what we do. We say, I don't want that to be that way. I want it to change. I want them to stop being sexy, stop giving privilege, having privilege. They're not about to do that, so this is what they do to us. They start out with the little girl, race, the sexism first, with the little girl, they say to her, my dear, they call her, call her a name. They say to her, when you were a little girl, it was cute for you to be a tomboy, which was not very what? Ladylike, now that you have grown up to be such a lovely young woman, if you continue to go around being so assertive and aggressive, you will never get a what? Never get a husband. If you're lucky enough to have one and you act so independent, you will not be able to keep him. You see how spontaneous and unrehearsed that is? See how I socialized them to us? Okay, now what happens? The next game is people say, well, Nichols, why on earth is this happening to me? I just don't understand it. Well, the standard answer is, my dear, I thought you realized that this was all God's will. Yeah, and of course, if you're a Catholic, we believe it's God's will, they'll tell you that, because of original what? Yes, who was that act created, uh, committed by? What was her name? Yes, you see, you know all the answers. Now, if you're, if you're Orthodox and Jewish, in the second litany of the morning prayer, I thank God I'm not a slave, I thank God I'm not a... Yes, it's right in the prayer book, therefore it must be what? Now you see, all of these things are taken out of what? Out of context to maintain the status quo. You see what I'm saying? To keep privilege. Now what happens is a group of women get real mad in the back and they say, now listen, when this meeting is over, we're going to take care of this. So what happens is we label that woman to keep down the problems. What is the label we put on aggressive women? We call her an aggressive? Yes. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> yes, all of the above. Okay. Now, once you're labeled, you can't form a constituency because if you try to get the other women to come and be with you, they say, oh, no, I can't go around her because she's a troublemaker, she's this, she's that. You see, it destroys the constituency. Now, here's what happens in both sexism and racism. We have to understand that, and this is the next point. Some people then are very, very angry, and some women say, well, that noun has been applied to me on many occasions. 
There are times when adjectives have preceded, and on a special occasions there have been adverbs that precede the adjective that precedes the noun. I've been called them all. So that's not getting it. And I'm insisting that you do scientific proof and data to show that women are less than men. Now what the system does is it brings out a scholarly person who has written a great book. Yes. And that person then tells you all the great truths. You see? What he will tell you is that women are indeed less than men. And the problem is, you see, the problem with women is you are ontologically the negative of our society. You have an impediment which prevents and precludes you from being on the good side. The essence of your impediment is physiologically based. As males, we all have a penis, and you do not. Now, as quickly as you can acquire one, you can join us on the good side. <laughs> and the proof for that is given to us by none other than Professor Dr. Sigmund Freud, who has told us that women suffer from? Yes, of course, that's what it is. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to stop for a moment because this is the most important part of this. Where is penis, list, uh, penis in the listed? If you had to go look it up, where would you find it? you find it in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, Roman numeral 4, which is used by psychiatry in the classification of mental illness. So women have now become what? Mentally ill, fighting against their what? Oppression. So the harder black people fight against racism, the society tells you that you're what? Yes. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. Now, if you have a situation in which these are the characteristics of the good, these are the characteristics of the bad, and then to be white is good and to be black is bad, you have racism. If you combine sexism and racism, you've made a statement. The ultimate good is to be a what? And the ultimate bad is the what? Now look at epidemiographic data and see how you get paid based on that way of thinking. I'm not giving college information. I'm only giving high school graduation. Among full-time workers 25 and older, whites earn more than blacks at all levels. And the difference is greater between men than between women. The white male high school graduate is 26,000. He is the ultimate good. The black woman high school graduate, the ultimate bad, is 16,000. That's $10,000 differentiation. If I gave you a check for $10,000 more today, you could live in a different neighborhood and drive a different car. If I took it away from you, you'd have to live even differently. You understand what I'm saying? So the, uh, the, because we live in a sexist, racist society where people believe all this stuff and act on it in employment, hiring, promotion, and so on, then you get the ramifications in the epidemiographic data of a 10,000 differentiation with the same high school diploma. What incentive is there to go to high school? Now let's look to see what happens in terms of race. The white woman earns 2,000 more than the black woman. The white male earns 6,000 more than the black man. Do you see why we have problems, even though the black man works every day, has a high school diploma? Okay. The white woman earns 2,000 less than the black man, but she earns 8,000 less than the white male. But the biggest difference is between the black woman and the black male. Hispanic women aren't even on the chart. Now, what I'm sharing with you is these are the ramifications of sexist, racist thinking that is then carried over into hiring practices and promotions. Okay. Now, I want to close with a couple of little things so that you can be very clear about how did I come to think this way. 
Um, people always ask me, Nichols, how do you come to the way of thinking that the highest value for Europeans lies in the object? Well, I tried to go back 12,000 years ago to the origins of people. And I want us to begin to look at this because I want to understand that we are different from and we must not accept the problems of others to be our issues. They're not our issues. So let's begin. If the highest value is in the object, I take you 12,000 years ago to North Central Europe, in order for you to be alive next spring, you and all those with you shall have had to have had sufficient water or you'll all be dead. Food. So food, in essence, is the object. Now, can you plant seeds in the ground and go grow food in North Central Europe in the months of September, October, November? December, January, February. March, April, May. In Minnesota, the ground is still what in May? Yes, all right. So we have three, six, nine months in which the European cannot grow food. How long then is the European growing season? If all is not accomplished in that three months, then they face what? And what? Are there any second chances? Now that's the very harsh reality of where they lived 12,000 years ago. And this still is a big issue with us, but I'll develop it for you in a moment. Now let's see what happens. It says that they have to hunt. Well, you hunt almost every day. Women go with the men to hunt. If you were a woman in your third trimester, though, you can't be out there running up and down the hills. So those women became very observant of everything around them in the gathering and storing close to where home was. Early this morning, right over there, is a little goat that went into labor. Very hard time, little goat's not delivering. Finally, the little goat staggers to her feet, stumbles over there, and nibbles leaves from that small bush, dilates and delivers. You've seen about two or three other little animals in labor eat from the bush, dilate, and deliver. You are now in labor, it is not going well, what would you be likely to do? Go to the bush. Now based on that, European women developed a pharmacopoeia from roots, herbs, barks, grasses, roots, and leaves. They developed the, the pharmaceutical properties of these things and began to understand what they meant. So they have a body of knowledge that men don't have because the men are off on the what? Hunt. Now we stored a lot of food last year, but it rotted because we didn't know how to do what? Who then is going to have the knowledge base necessary for the preservation of food, men or women? So that now gives women two sets of knowledge that men don't have. Therefore, it's time to do what to the rules? Change the rules. We label first. What is the label that we put on European women who deal with roots, herbs, barks, grasses, and roots? What do you do to witches that get out of line? Now let's stop for a moment and go to other cultures and see what happens with that same phenomenon. If you are in Africa and you deal with roots, herbs, barks, grasses, roots, and leaves, you are a medicine woman. If you are in Native American culture, you are a shaman. If you are in Asian culture, you're an herbalist. And if you are in Hispanic culture, you're a curen, curendera. Yes, you are none of which are negatives. They're only negative where? Because women had too much what? If you have the power, you can then control the what? So the fight between European men and European women is a struggle over what? Over power, control, and authority. And that's their struggle and their fight. Now let's see how they try to resolve it. Okay. Now let's examine what happens. At a certain point, the food has been preserved, allocated, and stored for 10 months. Someone has to make a decision about when do you start eating this pile so you don't run out. So the men, because of their physical strength, makes the determination. 
in North Central Europe 12,000 12, years ago, how could you know when a month would begin? You could observe the what? Well, no, what? once a month, the what? The moon, yes. But right here in New York, there are many times you couldn't see the moon. But whom among us, with great clarity and regularity, can tell us one month from another? Yes, because of their what? Menstrual cycle. Now, why was the menstrual so important? Because you could learn how to do what before men? Yes. If your husband told you in February, at the end of the third moon, you can plant, snow is up to here, would you believe that crap? No. But at the end of the third moon, February, March, April, May, you can start to what? Plant. You see how powerful that was? It's a very powerful thing. Very powerful thing. But it was too much power for one and had to be taken away from them. So a device is to tell you there's something wrong with it. So we tell women when they have their period, it's God's what upon them. Now that's only a man could come up with that. When you have your period, you're cursed. Isn't that simple? How many women were terrified when they missed their period? You see what I'm talking about? Don't let people define for you what is reality and truth. Know what's true for you. Okay? Now what happens is there has to be a point at which the determination is made and physical strength was used in Europe. And the men took over because they had the physical strength to maintain the what and keep the what object. He simply said, get out. He told you to get out in February, North Central Europe. What would happen to you? You'd freeze to death and die. So from that point on, European women have to act how in the presence of the men? submissive and subordinate. And every single one of their laws then becomes real for that. According to European law, European women are the what of their husbands? Property and chattel, which makes them philosophically a what? Yes. According to European law, the moment a European woman marries, her dowry becomes her husband's what? Why would her dowry be his property? Because if she acts simple, he could threaten to divorce her, and she would be what? Penniless. Now here's something else that came up. In order for them to control their women and to maintain discipline, they had the rule of thumb in English common law. And the rule of thumb says, you have a right as a man to discipline your wife with what? No, a stick the size of your thumb. A stick the size of your thumb. So you give her a sound thrashing, but you don't damage the property. Now you see, I'm getting a whole lot of other sounds in here, like a stick. Mm -hmm. But you see, I told you all that's not your what? Axiology. All right, now you got to, we're going to deal with our own axiology. If the highest value lies in the relationship, people see themselves to each other to be one. All right, now how does that come about? Let's go back to the experience for food in Europe. If you are in equatorial Africa 12,000 years ago, and you went out and you gathered seven large stalks of bananas, could you store them for nine months? Nine weeks, nine days, because they'll one. Is it necessary to store food? Now, women, can you get your own food in Equatorial Answer? Yes, you can. If your husband said, get out, could you weave pound leaves in such a way to keep the sun off of you? If there was a snake that came along, could you hit it with a stick and make it leave you alone? So according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, black women in Africa can provide the first three essentials on the way to self-actualization, food, shelter, and safety. So therefore, you see yourself to be what? That's right. Now that's how we survive slavery. Okay. That's how we survive slavery. When we came here in the Middle Passage, do you all know what that Middle Passage was like? Has anybody ever demonstrated that for you? I'm, I'm going to demonstrate that for you real quick because I want you to vividly see that. I'm going to finish and do this first, then we'll do that last. 
on that middle passage, many millions of people died. Now, don't let other people tell you that they're the only ones that have had a Holocaust. Okay? Many millions of black people died in the middle passage. They got on the boat and never got off. They fell into the sea and died. Okay? Or were pushed, jumped, or pushed, okay? Or just thrown over to die. Now, the point is this. Once getting here, the conditions were so horrendous that the life expectancy plus the harshness of slavery for the black male was nine years, and they died. Nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about that. So the fact that we are physically here says we come from excellent stock because we survived. All right? If I'm the slave owner and I observe you, you're beginning to deteriorate. Am I going to keep you on my plantation and let you deteriorate? I will fatten you, oil you, grease you, and what? Sell you. Because I don't want to lose my capital investment, the what? Yes, it's nothing personal. The black woman is then left with the infant. Can an infant or toddler produce work? But they eat and they take the food out of the mouth of a slave that can produce work. Am I expected then to feed the infant or the toddler? No, think about that. Can it produce work? Can it produce work? Then why would I feed that little toddler running up and down here and take the food out of this man's mouth when he can produce work? Do you see what I'm talking about? Let's do that again now. Do I feed the toddler the infant? I feed the slaves, and whose responsibility then is it to feed the child? The mother, because the black woman must always be able to take care of herself and her want, and her children. That's the African tradition. Because if anything happens to the man, you have to be able to take care of yourself and your children. And that was our victory in Africa. You see? Now let's go back through that and see what happens with that. Slavery is now over. Yeah, and let's, let's look to see what did black women do. You have to, re, you know, people don't talk about the slavery experience. We just kind of let it go by. But I want to talk about it for a little bit because I want you to realize what it is. People got up before dawn. People always talk about black people can't get up. Well, you got up before dawn and you were in the fields when the dawn came, okay? And worked in the field until it was dark. Now, how can you get food? Because if you steal food, they'll dismember you, kill the child, or both. So the food that they got were literally weeds by their culture. Poke salad is a weed, but in the South it's food. So many of the greens that black people historically eat were traditionally what? Weeds by another culture. Do you see what I'm saying? If you come across an animal that has been slaughtered and you can get its ear, its nose, its tail, its foot, its hoof, its entrails, you've got food. Now how are you gonna clean chitlins at night? What they did was to take the chitlins, to slice them, that is to cut them down the middle so that they're open, and soak them in potash all day while they were in the field. Then wash them in the stream and put them in a pot the next morning and boil them with a the log all day. When they would come home, there'd be a thick layer of what floating on top? Grease. Skim the grease off, put it in the potash, boil it, and you've got what? Soap. Do you see what I'm saying? Those black women and black men knew how to survive in a very oppressive condition. Slavery is now over. As big as the black men are, they're put in steel mills and foundries. Black women have to see themselves as equal. They'll never earn as much money as the black male. Unless, and this is what black families did, black parents gave their daughters a good what to keep them equal with men. Yes. In Europe, whom do you educate? You have five sons, which one? The oldest. You see their culture? Theirs is different from what? I say to my son, Daddy loves you. You can stay here, but you got to what? But Daddy will work two jobs to send his baby to school. 
That's when times are hard, when times are good, we send them both to school. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why you have more black women educated for degrees than men. But it's to keep us equal. Now the confusion is, white women want you to think that your problems are the same as theirs. Okay? Now let's look to see what happens. According to European law, European women are the property of their husband. If you see yourself as equal, you can be somebody's property. According to European law, your dowry becomes your husband's property when you marry. All right, here's this African woman. In, order, in West Africa, for you to get me, to get my daughter, you have to bring me what? Gifts. We give her gold, bangles, all the way up her arm. Now, do you think the sister takes all this gold off and gives it to this man when she gets married? Does that make sense? No, it, don't make, it didn't make sense then, it don't make sense now. Okay? Now, what's the ramification of that today? Black women still keep their dowry. Now, how is that possible, Nichols? All right, we have a young black couple here. What is your name? Anomaly? Nalmaya. And your name? Sako. All right, Sako and Nalmaya are married. All right, now we're looking, and she says to her husband, we have to have savings and money. So both names are on the savings book. One day he is helping to clean up, and another savings book falls out. <laughs> Whose name is on that savings book? <laughs> yes. Because black women always keep their what? Their dowry. Why? Because if anything happens, the black woman must be able to take care of herself and her children. Do you see what I'm saying? Now let's go to this rule of thumb. Uh, which one of the black men in here want to take a stick and beat a black woman? It doesn't make sense, does it? Because you could get seriously what? Yes. <laughs> okay. Now what that translates to is that black women are not intimidated by men. Because you see, if you, you can hit one, but you better not what? Go to sleep, okay. Hmm? See? Yes, indeed. We had a lot of people converted with hot grits. <laughs> okay. Now, what is happening is we are moving away from what is ours and acquiring what is theirs. And so what we're doing is we're raising little black girls to act like little white girls, and they become victimized. And they end up in shelters and all this kind of stuff. I see black women crying on television about, oh, he hit me. And I look at my 90-year-old mother who is 4 foot 11 and weighs 92 pounds. I don't know any two men that want to tackle her. You understand what I'm saying? Because she was raised not to be intimidated by one. But we're now telling our little girls it's not ladylike to fight back. It's not ladylike. You don't, want to, you don't want to raise a daughter to be a victim. We don't want to raise daughters to be victims. I have a daughter. My daughter was taking all this chemistry and physics at night and would walk across the campus. You know, in these labs, you have to stay there until the stuff cooks or whatever it does in the middle of the night and you walk across campus. They were snatching girls and raping them on the campus and all this kind of stuff. I gave her something to take with her. And she said, oh, Daddy, I couldn't do that. I said, listen, I'm not raising a victim. I said, I don't want anybody to ever ask you, what did he look like? What did he look like? I want you to be able to say, roll him over and look for yourself. We love our women, we respect our women, we revere our women, because we are equal and one. Thank you very much for inviting me to be with you.
Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Let's give one round of applause for a great presentation. Dr. Edwin Nichols. Thank you very much. Certainly, that's something we will not forget. Those of you who are about to walk out, stop, hold somebody's hand, affirm your Africanness. We will. That's why we don't. Those who are walking out, please hold somebody's hand. Don't, don't do that. Brothers who are going up the aisle, hold somebody's hand. Huh? Okay, about five minutes. All right, but nobody can leave, though. All right? Nobody can leave. Close the doors. Clo oh, sorry, I'm now close the door. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, what I want is I want a group of about, um, I want the black men that are right in this section right here. Just come right up here about from about where the red shirt is. The guy with the red shirt, the sea. The rest of you on that aisle, come right on up here on the stage, please. Hurry up. Just quickly come on up on the stage. All right. Uh, why don't you come on this side over here? And all you guys right there, come on up here too. Come on up. Come on up. All right. There. Now just stand shoulder to shoulder right across there. Okay? All right. Now, I am a slave master. I'm running a slave ship. As I run the slave ship, I make my money based on how many slaves arrive. Okay? A lot, yes. Now, what you can see is I'm, I have a situation here in which I have this number of slaves. And the very first one is here. You see where he is? See where he is? All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I make my money on the number. So I'm not making any, not any money this way. What I want you to do is I want all of you to turn this way. All the slaves turn this way. I want you to overcome your homophobia and move right on up. Go ahead. No, no. Come on up. No, come on. We've got to pack you up. Oh. Okay. All right, let's go. Come on. No, no, closer, 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 closer. Come on. There we are. All right, let's go. Now you see how many more I can get on this ship? Do you see what I'm saying? Now, here's what I want you to understand. I am afraid of them, so I have shackled them by their what? Wrist and their what? Ankles and their what? Now, you have iron rubbing on the neck with salt water. How do you think that feels? On the ankle, on the wrist. And they're all chained together in a long chain. So if I have to dump them over, I can just push them all over at one time. This man's got to go to the bathroom as he raises him and say, would you please be so kind as to unchain me so that I can go and defecate or urinate? You're in serious trouble. This one has malaria and starts to have a seizure. This one has amoebic dysentery. Are you beginning to see what's happening? And of course, millions begin to simply what? Have to be pulled out and thrown overboard, okay? So that by the time we get here, we have lost, what? A lot of them, okay, you go right on off. Now the rest of you have arrived, and now what we're going to do, turn around and face, this is the slave block. Because they didn't have any scientific information, they assumed that the biggest will be the most powerful. All right, I want them to breed other slaves. So how can I look and what can I determine to see if they're going to breed, if they're going to be able to breed? S size of their what? Yes. So I'm going to go into each one of their own and feel to see the what. Can you imagine how humiliating that must have been? If I'm buying a woman slave, then that she can nurture the child, she has to have a big one. And so that she can pass children through the birth canal, she has to have broad one. Thank you very much.
And thank you very much. Let's give Dr. Nichols one final round of applause. This was a tremendous evening, very tremendous evening. And I think that it goes to show again that we can achieve our liberation only with superior intelligence. And we are most thankful for a person such as Dr. Edwin J. Nichols in helping us bring that about. And certainly, this won't be the last time that he will be invited back to the slave theater. As we hold, get ready to hold hands, let me also say that we will be sponsoring a Holocaust exposition where all of the accoutrements of slavery will be displayed the last Saturday in February. So most of you should stay tuned. There are people amongst us who have gone in and around Africa as well as here and have the type of exhibits that will really demonstrate slavery in a very deep manner. And on that particular day, you should certainly bring a young child alone. Finally, let me say that Brother Shange here, uh, situation still has not been remedied. And all of us under the Nguzu Saba should recognize that his problem is also our problem, and not just engage in empty rhetoric about it. And so we should raise the question as to what has happened to him and where has his support gone. You should ask that question on radio and elsewhere because to lose this brother would be a real tragedy. But the community can be strong enough that we can overcome that. But it is clear that his support in the face of Jewish pressure, in the face of prosecutorial investigations, have all run for the tall grass as they always do. And so, Brother Shange, as I've indicated to you before, all that we can do, we're still committed to it. Because there are some of us who don't run from trouble. We run to it. And so we will be with you. We don't care what anybody says, because charges of anti-Semitism don't bother us here, because we are not financed by white folks. And speaking of finance, as you leave, please drop a couple of dollars in the plate uh, on a serious tip. Uh, I will not be offended if you put a five or a 10 in the basket. I mean, seriously, on a serious note, and at our membership meeting, I will explain to you why. These are things that we keep among ourselves, but we share them openly at the membership meetings. We want to thank all of you coming out this evening for a, a great evening uh, with uh, Dr. Nichols. And uh, I certainly will be one of those who will be reviewing your tapes uh, because there was a lot of knowledge that was given here this evening. And we are all most grateful for it. And next week, we will be back here uh, to deal with some serious questions as Reverend Bevel uh, talks about and give parallels to the lives of Dr. King, who he served as the chief strategist, and Minister Louis Farrakhan, whom he has worked very closely with uh, with respect to the Million Man March this year as well as next. And he will be discussing King and Farrakhan, one in the same. And uh, it is a deep lecture, and certainly one that I'm sure that Dr. Bevel, uh, because of his deep philosophical understandings, uh, can present like nobody else. 
And so uh, he will give a preliminary, however, on WLIB next Wednesday at 12 noon. He'll be on there for a few minutes. But he will deal with it in its entirety here uh, at the Slave Theater. We're an African people, robbed from our homeland, robbed of our names, our languages, our cultures, our religions, our selfhood, our nationhood, our womanhood, our manhood, our sisterhood, our brotherhood, our motherhood, our fatherhood, and our self-respect. But we shall rise, never to fall again. Up, ye mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Hug the person again and let them know you still love them because they are African. America's inner city crack problem. You'd agree with that, right? I'd say I was part of a contributor. Problem. Yes, I played a part of it. And a, and a big player. Yeah, a okay. major part. I influenced it, I promoted it, I supplied the drugs, and I probably was one of the advertisers. You know, I was one of the people that people could look at and say, well, I want to be like him. You know, I, I, I felt bad about what I did, and I still feel bad about what I did to, to, to my people because I helped other people use them, you know, it was like, I guess it was like, you know, like some of the books you read about slavery and they, they said that, you know, when they go to Africa and they was catching the slaves, a lot of times the, the Europeans couldn't run them down, you know, they was too fast. So what they would do is they would hire a brother and he would run them down and catch them, you know, and hold them until the Europeans got there to, to make slaves out of them. It can be argued that Rick made slaves of his customers, and although drug addiction knows no color, urban black communities have been particularly hard hit. You've heard the statistics before, but it's worth repeating. Eight to one. There are eight black men for every single white male in prison for crack-related offenses. At first glance, Ricky Ross's story is all too familiar. There was a Rick Ross before Freeway Rick. I've been, been, I've been Freeway Rick for a long time. Really? That. Yeah. Because all of us were Freeway boys, basically, mm -hmm. but... I was really Freeway Rick because my mom stayed right next to the freeway. Okay. And so we hung out in my backyard. Like a lot of young black men growing up in South Central Los Angeles in the 1970s, it was supposed to turn out differently. The son of a single mother who never knew his father, Rick played football in this park when he started to look up the gang members, the Bloods and the Crips. You know, they used to didn't fight. It was like rival streets play football against each other. You know, they would one set with where we're red and one we're blue and then all the younger kids like myself we would go up to the park and watch them play football and then you watched these guys and you wanted to be like one of them yeah i wanted to be a crip but by the time you had a chance to become one i started playing tennis started playing tennis but yeah. tell me about you were a good tennis player yeah i was pretty good i made all city i think two years mm -hmm. all league every year at dorsey but but you may you you make it through to the 11th grade and nobody knew you couldn't read or write well, I think my teachers probably knew. And I was, I was, I guess you, I would say I was a, a good student. You know, I came to class every day on time. I would sit in class. I wouldn't make noise. You know, I didn't, I never made disturbances in the class. But you looked at the coach or the coach looked at you and said, Ricky, you can't read or write. So how the heck are you going to go to college? Is that how it happened? Yeah. And what did you, what, what, what did you say to him? 
I didn't know what to say. I was just like stunned, you know. I, I didn't know what to do. You know, it was like I was in like no man's land, I guess. What we call it in tennis is when you're out of place, you know, when you don't know what to do. What Rick did was drop out and become more involved with his gang friends, something his mother supporting five other children on a janitor's salary didn't like. And my mom was telling me once she found out that I wasn't going to school no more, she wanted me to do something too. So she was on me like, you're gonna have to do something. What you gonna do? You, you ain't got no job. You don't know what you gonna do, you know? So she, she was on me like that there. So I wound up going to LA Trade Tech to follow my tennis career. But that isn't what happened. Stay with us as we learn how Freeway Rick became the Johnny Appleseed of crack cocaine in California. We'll be right back. Okay, that's Freeway Ricky Ross. The wholesaling that Ricky Ross was doing. And uh, we're even looking into a few people right here in the New York area. But that's a whole nother issue. The point being is that here's a young man who was by and large illiterate. He could neither read nor write until about five years ago. Here's a young man who by and large had the quote unquote American dream, full of materialism and lust for money and all the other things that go along with being a quote unquote good American. Things became very simple for Ricky Ross. I gotta get some money in order for me to get my dream. So, if you're illiterate, by and large, you see life in terms of abstractions. Things are very simple to you. So, the offer of dealing drugs became very attractive to him. If it's drugs that will get me money, that will get me a nice car, then I will deal drugs. If it is drugs that will give me money, that will give me nice girlfriends, then I will do drugs. If it is drugs that will give me money and, and allow me to live out this American dream, then I will do drugs. And we have thousands of brothers and sisters throughout the urban centers of this country that are potential Ricky Rosses just laying in wait right now for the white, for the right white hand to come along with the right white powder or rocks in their hand and they will be Ricky Ross today tomorrow and forever. That is our challenge, brothers and sisters, is how do we combat that mindset in our own house, in our own community? How do we tell our young people that it's unacceptable to deal death in your own community? The white man can offer you all kind of tangible things. By and large, what our young people hear from us is rhetoric and ideas. I need a car, I can't use that talk. I need a house, I'm sorry, I can't listen to you today. You hear that all the time. Somehow we've got to reach our youth. A Couple of other points I want to make and then I want to show a few things on the overhead projector and then we'll take some questions. Um, as I was doing the interview with Gary Ware, we were discussing some things that were not in the tape, and one of the things, we briefly talked about that this afternoon with uh, Imhotep Gary Bird, is I had developed a timeline of events and some issues that I thought that were pertinent during that period of time, and that period of time being 1979 through 1990. What was happening in society that was making crack cocaine use attractive acceptable almost, and lucrative. Number one, I want everyone to think back to around 1983, 84. Did you notice in New York that it became increasingly difficult to find reefer? That's a phenomenon that I've found throughout every city that I've been speaking about this issue. It was very difficult to find reefer, as if Reefer was being swept up off the street and we were being flooded with crack. So if you were one that wanted to participate in that type of activity, you only had one road to take towards crack. Number two, how do you promote it? This is a conclusion that I've come to that's very touchy, and I'm sure it's very touchy to some of us in the audience, is you have to develop a culture a subculture in some respects that makes drug proliferation, drug usage attractive and acceptable.
Ashton's session is going to be application of the theoretical construct. So just so we can do a quick review, we'll go through a few things, and then we'll start applications. The way I see the world. In the United States, there are people who come with different ethnic groups from Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Native American. There are people who share a common worldview. To share a common worldview, there are three factors. One, you had a historical event that changed everything for you and your people forever. Two, you were forced to speak another language. And three, you were forced to convert to another religion. Hispanics share a common worldview. They were one. Um, subjected to colonial Spain. Two, forced to speak Spanish. Three, forced to convert to Catholicism. So we have people, and Arabs also share a common worldview. Okay? They were subjected to Islam as a military force. Okay? They were forced to speak Arabic and forced to, co to convert to Islam. Now, to be Hispanic or to be Arab is not race specific. You can be white Hispanic, black Hispanic, Native American Hispanic, Jose Wong, or Fujimori, and still be what? Hispanic. Okay? Uh, you can be a black Arab from Sudan, a blonde Arab from Morocco, blue eyed Arab from Iraq. But if you share those common things, then you are Arab by definition, because you share a common worldview. From my perception, uh, there are three factors that motivate behavior. Axiology, epistemology, and logic as three classical philosophical ways of seeing the world. Axiology is the study of values. If you know the highest value for a collective of people, you know how they're motivated and how to motivate them. Epistemology asks the question, how do you know knowledge? Not knowledge, but how do you know? And that differs, let me explain to you. People in the room that can read this word, that is because they have what? Knowledge. But how you read in this way is the task of the epistemologist. In Western culture, we read linearly and sequentially. But you cannot read this in a linear or sequential pattern. Okay? So epistemologically, the way they know that, on your second sheet of the handout, you will see that in order to read Chinese, you have to be able to see the what? And all the what? How? That's the most important factor. The whole and all the parts are seen how? That's the only way you can read Chinese. If you can't do that, you can't read Chinese. Okay? So those are the tasks of the epistemologist. Logic is how you reason to an answer. Okay? How do you reason to an answer? Well, in Western culture, we use dichotomous logic. So we reason yes or plus or a or zero or one, we know who knows computers. Now, logic restricts your ability to reason. Okay? Logic restricts your way to reason. Let us assume you're using dichotomous logic. So it has to be either what? Okay. What is this? Now, which is it? What is it? No, don't give me either. Tell me what it is. It's a gobbler. Somebody else tells me it's two faces. Now, what is it? You see how, how in this little game of sophistry, I'm demonstrating to you that the logic form, either or, limits your ability to reason? Because this is a situation that cannot be resolved with what? Either or. Okay? Now. Let's look and see what we use as blacks as a logic system. We use diunital, and the Aztecs use the same system, and they called it what? Dicrasismo. All right, now let's explain what those are and what it does. Western logic was 
again, remember I told you <clears throat> that the Greeks had to reduce learning to its lowest common denominator? Yeah. We've got some folk that came in late for this session. Mm -hmm. We're here for the 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. We didn't get the handouts. So we oh, those of you that didn't get the handout, if you raise your hand so you can get some. Okay. Thank you. Dichotomous logic, um, if you recall this morning, I said that <coughs> when the Greeks returned home from Greece, after studying where? In Africa. In Africa. The life expectancy of Greeks at that time was? Years. Which was not cost beneficial. <laughs> okay. So what the Greeks did to reach their manifest destiny was to reduce learning to its lowest its common, lowest common denominator. Reduce it to the simplest thing. So in their epistemology, they reduced it to something that you could count and what? Measure. All right. And logic then was reduced to either, you see how it's, a re you see how it's reduced to the lowest? OK. So that everyone could understand and everyone could take part. Now, when you reduce it to its lowest common denominator, either or, um, what happens is there are things that you cannot resolve in either or. In physics, there were people who wrote journal articles on particle theory. All right, all mass moves in particles. There were other scientists, physicists, who said, no, 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 everything is in waves. So you had journal articles on particle theory, journal articles on wave theory, and they were always in conflict either what? When they changed the logic system to the African logic system of diunito or the Aztec logic system of digrasismo, where two things in opposition come to oneness, they found that particles move in what? In waves. See the waves? And that made quantum theory. So the way they move from Newtonian physics to quantum physics was to change the way that you reason from dichotomous to di what? Diunito. When young people are doing problems in quantum theory, they lose it sometimes and have difficulty because they go back to thinking what? Rather than to think diunito. Now, why do we have a diunito logic system? <coughs> if the highest value lies in the what? You have an opinion, I have an opinion. Is your opinion greater than mine? No. Is mine greater than yours? But you have an opinion, and I have an opinion. And in order for us to maintain the what? The relationship. Then we have to take these two things, ostensibly in opposition, and bring them to what? To oneness. OK? Now, when we talked about general systems theory and process this morning, we said that in churches, you have different systems functioning in the church. The trustee board, the this board, the that board, this ministry, that ministry. And when systems get out, any system, then out of whack, the whole system is out of what? Out of order, OK? In your body, you have systems. So if your respiratory system is out of function, then the rest of the body is not functioning what? Properly, system, because all these systems are interrelated and interconnected, OK? Now. <coughs> If you have an opinion <coughs> and the minister has another opinion, is yours greater than his, his greater than yours? No. It, and you're going to try to maintain the what? <coughs> so then you must have a logic form that makes that possible, that two things ostensibly in opposition can come to oneness. Otherwise, you would destroy the what? Because it would be either what? And if he's the minister, he is what? And you have to be what? That's it. 
You see how you have those kind of splits? If you're thinking that way. So we cannot permit ourselves to think dichotomously when we're living in a diunital environment. Okay? Now, are there answers or ways to see this way? Well, Christ was confronted by the Pharisees who were always trying to trap him. And they posed questions in the dichotomy, and he answered in the di. All right, give me an example, Nichols. Um, do you pay taxes to Caesar? Now, your answer is only one. Yes or no, if you're restricted to dichotomy. Now, what is the consequence of either answer? He's in trouble. If he says, yes, I pay taxes to Caesar, then how can you come into the temple and, and be a hypocrite with your money that you pay the imperial Roman government to oppress your people? Hypocrite. Now, some, now, if he outside says, I do not pay taxes to Caesar, that's treason. And he could go to jail <coughs> because St. Matthew was a what? Tax collector. And he wasn't collecting taxes for Israel. He was collecting taxes for what? For Caesar, for the Roman government. So how did Christ prevent himself from being entrapped in a dichotomous logic? He used di what? Unital logic, which was, show me the coin by which the tax is paid. Whose picture is on it? Jesus. Then give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Give to the Lord that which is the Lord's. And he's out of it. So very often, black people will give die unital answers and the workplace. And you will call them smart ass answers. Okay? But the idea is twofold, to give an answer, but also to stop the argument from, pro from progressing to a point that it would do what? Destroy the relationship. You shut it off. All right? My best example is a black woman working in a gross in a I Magnum's department store in the Washington area. As I've told you before, her hair was pulled all the way back, a tight little bun on the back end of her head. At that time, all black women, there was only one kind of powder made for black women. It was called nut brown. <laughs> I don't care what your complexion was, you wore nut brown powder. And so she had her nut brown all around here and her makeup on, and she looked pre embalmed. So if she would die, <laughs> they would just lay her in the coffin. They wouldn't have to change a thing because she was really made up. She was a very gracious woman. She's the kind that you could walk in and you could take um, something in a paper bag a glass, crystal glass, and she would say, oh, this is Baccarat crystal. This glass is a German design glass for reasoning why. It was prepared for the German market by the French. The pattern is Aubrien. It is obsolete but they do make them by special order in April and September. How many copies would you like to have of this Bakra O'Brien Riesling class? Okay, sister was heavy. It was a white woman. This is the richest county, Montgomery County comes in from the Chevy Chase and says, I want a dozen Pepe glasses. Well, those glasses are $100 per glass in fine crystal. So that means $1,200 plus commission. So that is a lovely sale. She begins to put glasses out, and the white woman says, these are not Pepe glasses. They are too thin. Now, the dichotomy is, yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, and you could have a what? And get into trouble. OK? So the black woman says, I assure you, these are they, because you can't see these are them and work there. Okay? <laughs> and proceeded to put out more what? More frappe glasses. Now, the problem was that there was no communication. Communication is too way. 
I have to say something and you have to respond to it, and I say, you say something and I respond to it. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, it's two way. Now, if it's only one way, shut up and listen, and I'll tell you what you have to do, then that is not a communication. So, neither of the two women was communicating with the other woman, because they had something in the back of their mind that they were not what? Saying. The white woman was saying, if I put frappe in these glasses, take it out of the freezer, put it on the table, the first spoon will what? Crack, Crack these $100 glasses. The black woman in her mind is saying, if you remove the frappe glasses and sit them at room temperature for three and a half minutes and then serve them, there will be no problem. <laughs> but neither woman is doing what? Communicating. Communicating. They're just coming to a point where there'll be a what? an explosion or an argument, and the black woman has to shut it off so there's no more discussion, otherwise she might lose her temper and lose her what? I told you these are not frappe classes, they are too thin. Madam, plastics are in our next section. <laughs> Is there any other thing to discuss? Is it over? Okay. Now, that was a diunital answer to a dichotomous question. You see, these are two ways of looking at this. All right? Now, when you go to the next logic system, which is the Asian logic system, you move with that way of thinking. Remember, we move Newtonian to quantum, quantum to chaos theory. See what happens when you change your logic systems? You change your ways of doing physics, okay, and opens the world up for you greater. All right, now let's go through these very quickly. In European culture, the highest value is in the what? Object. So if the highest value is in the object, and the object is save the company because we want to save the stockholder share, if that's the highest value, then Axiological ethics, those are ethics that are based on your what? Value. On your value system. Then this man who fired thousands of people, Chainsaw Al, cutthroat, okay? His behavior was what? Axiologically correct because he was saving the what? And the stockholders what? because that is the highest value, the object. When he could no longer perform that, they got rid of him, because he could no longer perform his task, which was to save the what? Now, if you were one of those 20,000 people that were fired, you'd be very what? Very upset, crying and everything else, but axiologically, it was what? It was ethical. Because that's his value system, you see? Now, let me show you what happens when you deal with black people. If the highest value for us is in the relationship, and you go to your boss and he gives you a negative evaluation and says, don't take it personally, <laughs> how do you feel? You're very upset because in, in your terms, he has done what to the relationship? Yes, because it could cost you your what? Yes. You see? Now, do you understand Uncle Tom? Mm -hmm. Let's understand Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom thought he had a what with the master? But the master only saw him as a what? And when the master was through using him, he sold his wife and children, because his wife and children were for the master just what? And, this, and Uncle Tom was also for him a what? Object. Well, then Uncle Tom perceived that he was being what in that relationship? Dist. Dist. And that's when they ground up glass and fed Massa. <laughs> and as Massa laid hemorrhaging in the bed, he <laughs> held his head up and gave him some more hot soup to go down on that ground glass. Uh-huh. See? But Poor Uncle Tom thought he had a what with master? Yes. 
Now, you can have a relationship with master. And you see, this is what we have to be mindful of when we talk about black organizational structure. The driver for an organization in Europe is the what? So you'll have people that'll come together and work on a project that hate each other. Hate each other. But they will work together because they want to accomplish the what? The task or the goal, the object. All right. Black people in organizational structure must establish individual what? Relationships. So I have to have a relation I have a relationship with this woman. Mr. Hampton has a relationship with this woman. Now, we both have what with her? Relationship. Okay. But I don't have a relationship with Mr. Hampton. Do you understand? I have one with her. He has one with her. She has one with him. She has one with me. But just because she has a relationship with each of us, it doesn't mean that we what? We don't have a relationship. So what we have to do is establish a one. And that takes time. So black organizations are built on individual what? Relations. And you have to establish them one on one. OK? You can't say, I want all the sisters now to work together. Hmm, I don't know her. She don't know. <laughs> well, you're all sisters. Mm. You see? It's not a collective. You see? So when people tell you, I can't work with her, well, don't put them on the same committee. Because you can't force people to have a what? Relationship. Yes. Now, the thing that we do sometimes is we will have a group of people who have a relationship and another group who have a relationship. But these two groups don't have a what? Relationship. And that destroys the church. That destroys the church. OK? So you have to recognize that while you have a relationship in here, because you are part of a system, this is the respiratory system, circulatory system. If the circulatory system says to the respiratory system, I know what I'm doing in the hell with you, what happens to the body? Illness. It dies. You understand what I'm saying? So we can't have that kind of thing. You can be your own system independent, but you have to work within the, in the confines of other what? Systems. Systems to make this whole thing what? Work. All right. You see? The heart can say, I am the most important thing. Nothing can do without me. The brain says, how do you get your information? <laughs> Okay. And the digestive system says, well, how do, you get the, how do you get the food to carry all around there if it ain't going through me? All the systems say, well, we would not want to be that part way back there. Right. It says, all family. right, I'm going to close up on you. All see right. what happens. <laughs> Shut it down. Now, if I ain't working, we'll see how long you work. Some start backing up. <laughs> Be all over your nose. <laughs> okay. Are you understanding how oh, systems yeah. have to interact with each other? And this church is a series of systems. Okay? So you have systems that are independent, but they're all interrelated in a harmony. That's how you survive. Now, if you're going to bring dissension into the church, you take one system and throw it out of kilter. And what does that do to the whole church? Disrupts it or destroys it. And that's the presence of evil. That's the devil. The devil is real. OK? All right, are you seeing how these things work now? All right, now in the Asian culture, the highest value lies in the cohesiveness of the group. And that says, how do they perceive groupness? They perceive groupness based on the way they define the word. Now, if I look up the word group in my dictionary, Webster wrote my dictionary, and that's not very clear about how the Chinese see the world, because 
Webster never made it to where? Never got there. Not even get cast in Mississippi. So he will not know how the Chinese see themselves. So if I want a no group, the secret that I've learned is I will write the word in classical Chinese and look at the, I look at the etymology, that is the origin of the words. There are two words that make up the Chinese word group. One is king and one is xi. So in order to be a group, you have a leader and followers. Now remember yesterday, Cornell um, West said tertiary. Remember the word tertiary? How many do not know what tertiary means? You don't know what it means, OK. You have primary, secondary, and tertiary. So this is a third level meaning, OK? So one of the meanings of this is leader and all right? A lower level, a tertiary level, is in their culture, they don't see sheep as stupid and dumb. They see them as conformist animals. In monarchy, the king, you have what? Hierarchy. So conformity within the hierarchy is a tertiary interpretation of this concept, a deeper level. Do you see? A third level down. OK? Now, in Asian culture, you have to make decisions to keep the group cohesive. All right? Who is the tallest man in here? How tall are you? In the blue. How tall are you, sir? Six. Six foot. He just has good posture. Who's taller than six foot? How tall are you? Would you please stand? How tall? 6'2". Six two. All right. He's standing 6'2". He says, we are going north for water. <laughs> Whom among you will argue? <laughs> but if we get north and there's no water, sir, how long would you be in charge? <laughs> okay. So a unilateral, that comes from una, it means what? Uno means one. what? One. one. So a unilateral decision is a decision made by what? one person. So he has made a unilateral decision. But unilateral decisions do not keep groups Together. cohesive. All right? Let's see what, the chi what we learned from the Greeks. Majority rule. All those in favor of going north for water, please be so kind as to raise your hand. These all want to go north. Those want to go south. All right, sir, break the tie. Do we go north or south? Uh, north. North, damn Yankee. <laughs> and the groups do what? Split, 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 split. So now these Asians have to make decisions that keep their group what? So how do you accomplish that when unilateral decision making or majority rule won't do it? The way you do it is you come to a what? Consensus. And how do you write consensus? And what is the etymology of the word in classical Chinese? That's the Chinese word for consensus. Now, this word written by itself, etymologically, is the Chinese word for heart. And the word above it is the Chinese word for voice. So in order to come to a consensus, your heart and your voice have to say the one. How many times have you said something with your voice? You did not mean with your heart. Mm-hmm. That's called passive aggressive behavior. It is listed in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual used by psychiatry to classify mental illness. Yes, <laughs> so you see what happens. People run around here saying something. Will you be on our committee and work real hard? Oh, yes, but call me. <laughs> You're saying it with what? Yes, and you don't mean it with what? Uh -huh. You see the difference? Yes. So if you're going to come to a consensus or work on any kind of program, within you, your voice and heart have to say the what? Same. Same thing. Now, interestingly enough, if I write just the Chinese word voice and heart as a single Chinese word, this word is intent. So when I know how you think and feel, I know your what? I know your intent. 
And if we all have the same intent to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day at the corner Korean grocery store to get enough money to get out of this neighborhood and say bye to y'all forever, mm, does anyone have to be awakened to get to work on time? No. Does anybody complain about working overtime? No. Because we have said it with our and our Hearts. and we all share the same one. Hearts. Yes. Are you seeing the difference now? Because in our world, we very often say what? And don't mean it with what? You see? See how we do that? Would you please help me with this program? Oh, I'd be delighted to. <laughs> Call me first, though. <laughs> Will you help with this? Oh, I, I'll try as hard as I possibly can to get there. Are you coming to the meeting? <laughs> See? Talking with what? Not meaning with what? Now, what we have to understand is that in our culture, let me finish this off. So you know one's intent. Now, once you have the same, everybody has the same intent, you can do this last part of the calligraphy. You can then come together. That's how the Chinese write, come together. And you speak with one mouth. That's a consensus. OK? Now, what we have in black culture is very often we have to speak with our what? Even though we don't mean it with our what? In order to maintain the what? Are you coming to my meeting? I'll try as hard as I possibly can to get there. Which means what? Yes, because I can't say to you what? No, because that would destroy what? See? So I'll try as hard as I possibly can. OK? And when you see them, you say, oh, I tried, but I just couldn't what? Couldn't make it. I'm so sorry. And you're still maintaining the one. But both of you know that it wasn't coming in the first place. <laughs> okay. Okay. See how we use language to do things? Now, there are times when somebody says, are you coming to my program? I'm going to try as hard as I possibly You say, no, no, no. Now, don't you have me stand up in front of all them people by myself. I need you to come out and what? Support me. And then it's putting the relationship on the one. Yes, and people have to say, well, I, I, all right, I'll be there. You see what I mean? And bring somebody with you. You see? See the difference between the two? When you know and when you hear? OK, you hear, I'm going to try as hard as I possibly can. But when you know is, yes, I'll be, I'll, well, OK. Then you know. See the difference? All right. Now. What I want to do is I want us to look very quickly at epistemology, because I talked about that earlier today with the other group. In Western culture, always start with the axiology. The axiology, the highest value is in the object for the European. How are you going to know you have the object? You have to be able to count it and what? Measure. And how are you going to teach children things in school? You always give them a little part, and the part becomes the what? And it's always done in a linear and sequential pattern. A follows B follows C follows D follows E follows F in this direction. Now, put a linear sequential parts to the whole idea into a factory and tell me what the factory is. What is that called in a factory? Assembly, Assembly line. That's what Henry Ford did and made us our billion dollar nation. Now, when you are dealing with black people, if the highest value is in the relationship, how are you going to know you have a relationship? You can't count and measure anything about it. So you have to use other things like symbolic images. And we talked about rhythm this morning, which means function. If your heart is out of rhythm, it is not functioning properly. In the black context, we see the whole concept. And our methodology is to look for the critical Path. All right? Let's look at that. We say, what is the big? Extension. Cut to the? Chain. There you are. See how you have it? OK, now let's look here. Symbolic imagery. What is an example of symbols? Winnie Mandela, after they put her on trial, trial is over, and the woman that she's accused of having killed the 14-year-old son, the mother, is here with her. Now, the white press, when you read this article, would tell you that the black people down there really don't trust Winnie. But you look at this, and you tell me if it's true. 
Can you see that woman's eyes? First of all, they're in a what? Embrace. Do you embrace the person who killed your child? No. Okay. How are her eyes? Down. And her head? Uh-huh. Those are signs of what in, West, in black culture? Respect. respect and deference. She's showing deference and respect. Does she believe this woman killed her child? No, she doesn't. You see what I'm saying? Okay, now that is a set of symbolic images, and we know that there's a what between these two people? In spite of what the Washington what? Wrote and tried to tell you. So use your own epistemology and you'll be clear about things. Don't let somebody always define you and tell you what is and what is not. All right, now let's go on. <clears throat> And let's look at um, the, the way in which Asians know, okay? They know through striving toward the transcendence. What does that mean, Nickel? Well, here's a way of doing it. The Chinese wanted to learn how to do arithmetic, which is, arithmetic is, is, subtract, is addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. Now, that arithmetic, then, is a universal concept. So we'll call that, in an algebraic expression, the big what? Now, a transcendent means to come down to or transcend up to, says that we have to, in order to do that, we have to understand all of the characteristics of x-ness. So we take the smallest x we can find and study it intensely. We know that in order to be an x, they have to what? Cross at a certain point. There's an equal parent between here and here. And we're just learning all things about x-ness. Now, once we understand everything about it at this level, if we ever see it way up here, we'll still be able to what? <coughs> Identify it as, the big, as x. No matter how many shapes or forms it comes, we know x. Now, that's what they have to do. That's a transcendental epistemology. Now, let's see what we do with that. <coughs> The Chinese said, we want to do arithmetic. What is the smallest idea you have to know to do arithmetic? You got to know all of your what? All your numbers. Seven is a primary number. Seven is a sacred number. If you study seven by looking inside of it and examining it, you will see sets. Zero and seven, one and, two and, three and, OK, the Chinese recognize very quickly if you manipulate the sets of 2 and 5, you can do all of these forms of arithmetic rapidly. Therefore, they designed a machine. They placed the set of 2 above the bar, and the set of 5 they placed beneath the bar. What is the machine called? And can, what can one do with an abacus? All the forms of 1, arithmetic rapidly. Now, in order to read the abacus, go now to pedagogy on your thing, go to where it says pedagogy, under Asian. In order to read the, pe the, the abacus with all these beads in different positions, you've got to be able to see the what? The whole abacus and all of the positions of the beads, the parts, how? Otherwise, you cannot read the abacus. You can't read the number. See how that's done? Yes. To read Chinese, you've got to be able to see the what? And all of those strokes, how? Or you cannot read Chinese. Okay. Now, that's very important. Some people don't recognize the value of epistemology in business, and that's why I have to tell them, because that's how I make my money. Telling white folks that it's important to have people that think differently from you in the workplace. So I have to show them some examples. Okay. <clears throat> this is called solving the hidden line problem, okay? Historically, when you put something into the computer to rotate the figure for design purposes, see how they have all these lines and you can't tell which is, which is what? This black man, whose name is David Hedgley, developed a formula to say when to take one of the lines out and at what time when you're rotating to put the other line in. 
So it, you always have three lines, but you're rotating it, when in order to make the whole thing work, you have to put four lines into the computer. But you don't want to see four, you only want to see one at a time. Because that's the only way we can perceive depth, is three dimensions. But yet, all of the dimensions of a cube, all four sides, have to go in there. But we only want to see what at a time to get the perception of depth. Okay? Now, <clears throat> how did Hedgley do that? The problem was that the computer does not see a solid object as the human eye sees it. The computer defines the what? Whole object without regard to what? Perspective. All right? Now, who can think about the whole? People that are what? Black. And Hedgley is what? And Hedgley solved it. Now, do you know how much money that puts into the white community? All of these architectural designs, all, of, all these things that are moving around, and it's Hedgley's formulation that made that possible. Now, this is a, a publication that is put out by this agency that he worked for, NASA. Now, when you make a big discovery like that, there should be what in here what, talking about you, a what of you? A picture. But they put a picture of another factory. So you don't see any what? You don't see any picture about Hedgley, do you? Well, now, why would they not want to put Hedgley's picture in there? Well, no, Brother Hedgley wears a jerry curl. <laughs> so they definitely cannot have him in there, because that says that blacks have poor math skills. And here you have a man that so solves something that nobody white could solve his curl. with his jerry curl. <laughs> and his bachelor's degree from a black school. And the white boys had PhDs from Stanford. And they couldn't solve it. And here is Brother Hedgley. Ain't he cool? <laughs> now, when you talk about what happened to him, they gave him one hell of a time. They didn't want to believe it even when they saw it, because it came out of somebody won. But the reason he was able to solve the problem is because he thought how holistically. And he could take what his eyes saw and put it into what his brain saw and make it work. OK? Now, <clears throat> here's a Chinese boy. All right, he's up here in New Jersey. He's watching snowflakes. Snowflakes are falling down. OK? Coming down, coming down, coming down. OK? And he looks at all those snowflakes. And the snowflakes don't stick together. They're laying on top of each other, layer after layer after layer, but they're not what? They're not sticking to each other. They're just kind of laying on, just kind of there. He said, well, that's interesting. And then when you get so many of them, it got so heavy on the car that all the snowflakes slid off. But the way they slid off was to slide off as a whole unit didn't fall apart, just kind of slid off the side of the car. So all these snowflakes that did not want stick together are in a vertical position. So he applied that to computers, and it's called vertical doping, and he won lots of money. Now, you see, he was able to see the whole and the parts how? Simultaneously. So what I'm sharing with you is the more ways do you have of solving problems in your work groups or in your workplace, the more likely you are to be what? Successful. Then you become what is called culturally competent. OK? That's what you want to be. That's what we should strive to be, culturally competent. All right, now I've gone through the paradigm for the purpose of those of you that had never heard it or wanted to repeat it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some practical applications of the paradigm in the workplace. OK? Now, here is socialization first. Remember what that is. Socialization is concepts, principles, and ideas of a society that have been reinforced to become the status quo. 
If I take an idea and repeat it to you over and 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 over again on television, what does it become for you? It becomes for you reality. All right? You picked up your morning newspaper, you saw the picture of a young black male with a positive story. What section of the newspaper would you be most likely reading? Same picture, young black male, negative story, where are you reading? Okay, now if that's the information that you have, then your perception of young black males is that they're either athletes or... Then you act on that. All right, how many black men in here have gotten on the elevator and the white women go, <gasps> or hold their purse? Now, why are they acting that way? I know I'm ugly, but I ain't that ugly. No, they have been what? Socialized to see me as a threat. Okay? It's very clear Nichols is not an athlete. I used to be, but I ain't no more. But athlete, so I have to be what? Some kind of what? Criminal. Now, you're saying, well, Dr. Nichols, you all dressed up in your suit and tie. I ain't got nothing to do with it. I can go in the suburban shopping mall, just like I am, and the white clerk is always following me around because black people want. Yeah. Yes, of course. You see, and they act on that by wanting to stop you and search you and all this other kind of stuff. Okay? And of course, you have to understand something about the law. So when they stop you, you can say, is, I'm, am I under arrest? Well, shopping mall, police cannot want. No, they cannot arrest you. So if I'm not under arrest, don't harass me or you'll get a suit like you can't imagine. See? Force that black man to take off his clothes and strip search him and strip search his little boy. Isn't that horrible? Okay, all right. You have to know your rights and how to, how to use them. Okay, socialization. Now, what does the socialization in our country? Television. What do we see every day on television as the norm? Violence. That's normal. How do you resolve conflict with the one? Okay, well, if that's the norm and you resolve conflict with a gun, why are you upset when children out here carry guns and kill people? Why would you be upset? Now, you see, it isn't just here in the ghetto. It's in Oregon. You see that woman sitting over there with a pin in her mouth? She lives out there with all the white people in Oregon. Oregon. Yes, and they were scared to death out there in those little all-white communities. She lives in Portland, and there are about that many black people in Portland, and they are so afraid they have moved further away. <laughs> And so they're all white communities. And they're still having young people doing what? Killing. Going down to Mississippi. Go to Paducah, Kentucky, not where the black people live, but out in the what? Suburbs. And what did these people do? Killing. Yes, they did. Now, we have to, if, if white children are doing all this, we have to have proof that who is doing it too. So a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old murdered this little girl. Now, how could they have murdered this little girl when semen was found in her underwear? Even black boys, as gifted in the <laughs> testosterone that we have, as much as we have, at seven years old, you ain't doing no sperm count. You understand what I'm saying? Then the guy who did it, they found him with his DNA, and he's lying, and he said, I didn't do it. I did it when she was dead. Now, Sperm is on her little panties, and the panties were stuffed into her mouth to the point that she suffocated to death. How could he have raped her dead with the sperm on the thing that he choked her to death with? But you see, police aren't weren't willing to listen. They're still saying those boys must have what? Because we've got to have some black boys doing something horrible. You see what I'm saying? That's what is the image thing. Now, one of my colleagues asked me, the impact of media on black children, how media controls our lives. One of the things is the silliness of the cartoons. Remember the other little boy in Chicago? On the 13th floor, they were ready to throw his little brother out because the little brother would not want steal. And they asked the, little, the brother that was maybe seven or something, they said, well, why didn't you protect? Why didn't you do something? He said, I ran downstairs as fast as I possibly can, running down from the 13th floor. What had he seen on television? He could get down and what? 
And that's what he was hoping that he would be able to what? Catch his little brother. That's the impact of television on our children. The other impact on television on our children, if you have die good and smart and so on, and black children have to be what? Okay. Now, how do we reinforce that? Well, we reinforce it with always showing something that ordinarily we don't have, which is Okay. All right. So all little girls are coming in what? Ought to break their neck. <laughs> Trying to throw them braids, and the braids are moving like this. Okay. All right. Okay. You see what I'm talking about? All right. Well, we've gotten past that now. We can all do it, can't we? <laughs> okay. What I'm saying is that television gives information that says, what is the norm for the society? And once it tells you that, if we are not careful, we will pick up the sick message and dis divide ourselves. And we always divide ourselves in terms of who is high yellow, light eyes, straight hair, Ackerman features. And then from there on, it gets bad. You see what I'm talking about? Which says that none of us have looked in the face of our what? Grandmother, great grandmother, great great grandmother. Because we haven't looked back to see who she is. And we lose it. Okay? Now, if we're going to be successful, we have to move past all of these distinctions and gradations. Because they're only given us to us by whom? White as the standard, and we're trying to meet the standard. Okay? All right, I want you to ask questions. I'm going to answer your questions. And then I'm going to have two of my nearest, dearest, kind of like former students, share with you some of the work that they're doing that corroborates the paradigm. Because I want you to see practical ways of using the paradigm. OK? So let's talk about some questions. What questions do you have? Let's go. Yes. Sir, yes, ma'am. How do you It's very difficult, OK? Now, what you can do is you can buy her one of the white dolls. Let her have it. And she will carry that one forever. And we may have all kinds of thoughts about it. And I used to think the same way as you. If they don't have it, then they can't think about it. They do. And what blew me away was I was on a flight up in South Dakota. You know, we're south for this, all white up there. Even, even the Indians have gone away. They don't even stay up there so cold. <laughs> and here was this little white girl with a black doll. And she had carried this black doll until her hair was standing all over the head. No, it was not one stitch of clothing on it. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And this little white girl was holding onto this black doll and was sleep holding onto the black doll on the plane. So I, I leaned across the aisle and I asked her mother, I said, um, how difficult do you find it to be the grandmother of a transracial adoption? <laughs> she said, what? 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 And I pointed to her. She said, oh. She said, listen, I couldn't take that doll away from her under any circumstances. She said she wanted that doll, and she has kept it. Uh, you said the doll doesn't have clothes or hair or anything like that, but that is her doll. So sometimes it's just they want that doll. That's all. Now, here's a little white girl in the middle of nowhere where she doesn't see anybody black. But she, that's what she wanted. So it could be that. Now, the other thing is sometimes you can get kids to understand that there are differences and there are ways of doing it. Uh, some of us are less evil than others, OK? My daughter, we put into the French school because we wanted, I wanted my children to be bilingual. I wanted to be able to speak French and English. And if I had my choice, they'd speak Spanish, too. You understand what I'm talking about? 
So we had her in the French school. Well, it's a very interesting thing about the French school in Washington, D.C. Two-fifths of the children are white metropolitan French. They're from France, and they're white. Two-fifths are Francophone African, and one-fifth is everybody else. Now, these two-fifths, if your parents are in the French embassy in Washington, D.C., and they have children that are school age, where are they in the pecking order of the French embassy? They are way, way, way down where? At the bottom, because to be the ambassador of France, you're damn near 70 years old and rich. So if you got two, three children in the French school, you are just a beginning what? Diplomat way down at the what? And your, school, your children come to school in, on the school what? On the school bus. Now, this two-fifths are Francophone Africans. The average age of the African ambassadors is 40. They're still having what? Children in school. If you are the ambassador's child, you come to school in a chauffeur-driven one. All right, so here are all the black children coming in at one, and the white children coming in at one, and all the other children getting there the best way they can. <laughs> So this is the Swedish ambassador's child, and the so-and-so, and the Ukrainians, and my child, you know? <laughs> All these children over here. So this is a very good image. Now, my little boy went to a birthday party at this age. They all go to birthday parties. Yeah. And he went to the, to the embassy of, Singa of uh, Senegal. In, the embassy of Senegal is a huge building, like this church. It's a great big building, great big building. And this little boy had a room almost as big as the stage up here. And my boy said, whose room is this? How many people stay in? He said, this is my room. <laughs> he said, all this is your room? He said, yes. He said, what does your father do? He's an ambassador. So when, dad, uh, when, he got, when everyone got home, he said, what does an ambassador do? How do you get to be an ambassador? That's what he wanted to know. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? OK. Now, by the same token, in this one-fifth, you have white children whose parents want them also to have exposure to multiple languages and many nationalities. Okay? They have little birthday parties, too. Well, they live out here in these little all-white suburbs, and so these children go to the birthday, plus those that are already what? In the community. Well, all these children speak what together all the time? French. French. They don't even think about it. They just literally in French, okay? Now, they're at the birthday party, and of course, the idea that you speak French puts you someplace what? Oh, way up here. So these little girls, white girls out here, felt inadequate. And one little white girl said, I am white. Everybody looked around. <laughs> and so the other little girl said, I'm white. And said, I'm white. Got to my daughter, she said, I'm beige. <laughs> she didn't know, you know. I was as good a color as this white, this is beige. <laughs> OK? So that's how she handled it. Now, one time she came home. And I said, Lisa, what are you doing? Lisa has large plaits. Lisa has thick hair, you know? And she has long plaits, and they're thick, OK? And Lisa was going about to break her neck. I said, Lisa, what are you doing? Oh, I'm shaking my head. I said, what is that? Oh, she went to, she, I said, oh. I said, Lisa, there is human hair, and there is animal hair. <laughs> They call that a pony what? Yeah. And it looks like horse what? Yeah. I said, why on earth would you want to degenerate to such a level? <laughs> I said, don't you know the first thing we lose is our hair when we intermarry? The first thing you lose is your hair. It becomes what? Straight and stringy. You wouldn't want that kind of hair, would you? So everybody does it differently. <laughs> you see? You see? Now, it backs up on you sometimes. I have a son, and he was at Morehouse. And for a whole year, he was trying to grow enough hair to have dreads. And in a whole year's growth, it got that tall right down the middle of his head. <laughs> and his friend told him, Edwin, you have got to get it cut. You know, you got to do something with it. He wanted dreads. 
I was so upset about my child and his dreads, I went through Atlanta, picked him up and carried him to the Bahamas with me and said, took him to the woman who did the hair, the dreads. The whole island knows she is the woman. I took him there and she said, I can't put dreads in his hair. I said, can't you do something? She, no, she says, too short. I said, he's been growing it a whole year. Do something. <laughs> did not have enough that we could do anything with. I said, do something with my child's hair. She said, it's too short. I said, don't say that. Do something with my child's hair. She said, the only thing I can do is I can tell him the, the, you know, the, the consequences of dreads. She said, men that have these very long dreadlocks, what happens is they become so long and so heavy that they break off and tear at the roots, and you lose, you go bald. So that's what she told Edwin, and Edwin was finally convinced. But thank God his time is now, because men have a bald what? And Edwin was the first with the bald head. You hear me? Okay. So your children are different. Different things are important to them. And you have to figure out what is OK for her. She can have her little white doll and still be very comfortable with the fact that she is one, black and beautiful. You always say the two together, because white people tell you black and what? Yes. So you would just reinforce the different one. All right, more questions. Let's go. More questions. What do we got? Yes, sir. At the family reunions. Um, I think in Brazil, that's the only place I know, um, other than right here, right now, once a year, in the northern part of Brazil where it's black, they have a ceremony where they go down to the water, like you're going to go down, and pray and bless the water for the relatives that died in the Middle Passage. So when you have a family reunion, you should be able, to, whoever, you know, in, when you go to someplace like Senegal, not Senegal, but to, um, no, um, no, no, on the East Coast, uh, uh, S, Somali. 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 When you go to Somali and you ask someone, what is your name? <gasps> you remember in the Bible when they say, and Jacob begot so and so and so and so begot so and so, that's how they tell you what their name is. And people coming together say those things together, and you can hear where relatives were, you see in those linkages. So what you do is you have the oldest person to say who begot whom and who begot whom and who begot whom. And when they stop, then that's where you can do a ceremony for the relatives that died that we do not know and for the relatives that died in the Middle Passage and make that a ritual to give recognition to those ancestors. That's how I would do it. And, and it keeps it alive. They do that here, Doctor. They do it in Coney Island every year. Oh, okay. Well, I, they do it in Brazil. They do it in Brazil. I didn't know they do it in Coney Island. But in a family uh, reunion, just name as many people as far back as you can. And then when you can't name them anymore. Now, why can't we name them anymore? Well, the reality is this. So when you look up, you know they came from that plantation. How are you going to know which one is yours? Because they just list them as what? And then what? Because they're counting and what? Measuring. So you won't be able to tell on this kind of census data who was your relative, because in this country they didn't receive what? Names. Now, in Catholic countries, or in New Orleans, they were given a what? No, they were given, yes, through, they were ha they had to be given a what? In order to be what? Baptized. Baptized. So in Catholic countries, you'll have greater records on black people as slaves because they had to be given a what? <coughs> to be baptized. But sometimes it's confusing because they just give a what name? 
first name, Mary, Sally, Hattie. And you don't know who Hattie, who's Hattie's mother. See what I'm talking about? They didn't have last names. So that's why we can't know very far back. That's when, you, that's when you connect yourself to your ancestral heritage. That's when you pray to the ancestors for the linkage. Okay? Because after a certain point you can't know, but you do know they were there because you were here. Okay? So then you ask them, let me pray. Join with, help me, assist me. And that's how you make the linkage. Yes? Captain? Okay. So that is a tracing line, no matter how far the boy or the girls go, because the mother's maiden name is retained in the middle name for the marriage name. Okay, did you hear that? He says in his culture, the way they did it was the maiden name was the middle name of the girls, and that's how you knew who she was. You can trace all of the, the maiden name, the mother's maiden name was the middle name of the daughter. And that's how you could trace who they were, because you get that maiden name. In spite of the fact, who was she married? You ask, well, what is her middle name? Well, see, that's interesting, because my daughter's middle name is her mother's maiden name. So she's a Han. So she is Lisa Han Nichols. And so we know she's a Han. Isn't that interesting? OK. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to ask, yes, sir. Um, I'm going to have to struggle to frame, frame this question. But, but how do we? Dr. West referred to as the hybridity uh, in order to um, survive. In essence. Well, you have to tell them what hybridity means. Tell them what that means. Well, he referred to us as being uh, New World Africans. Yes. Africans of the West. Yes. Okay, we are Africans of the West by what? By birth. Not by belief. We are in the United States, but we are not of because we still live in segregated communities. We have not been assimilated into the mainstream. So we retained our African heritage. Sometimes distorted, sometimes unappreciated, but we still have it. We see it in our early child rearing practices. Okay? We hear it in our spiritual gatherings. Okay? hear it in speech patterns. We have a new group of Nigerian priests coming to our Catholic Church because we can't get enough priests over here. And they have foreign th sounds are very difficult. They're as bad as the Germans. They can't say th, the th sound. It comes out t or d. Okay? So it's the Lord rather than the Lord. So there are many things that we still carry with us that are part of our heritage. So we are Africans of the West by birth, but not by belief and spirituality. Yes. Yes, ma'am.
or dread being something to fear? Oh, to fear. Dreadful, dreading, dread, who's coming here? Oh, I see. Okay. So it's locks. Okay, I don't have those problems. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, one. Thank you, because that, that's very important for me to know. Appreciate it. Are you? Uh, what is my evaluation of the uh, post-civil rights youth, I guess? Is that what we're saying? Okay. Well, for the post-civil rights youth, first of all, they have no knowledge of the what? Yes. No knowledge of the struggle. They assume that they are entitled to have, and particularly if you raise the middle class, particularly if you raise the middle class. Okay? So no knowledge of the struggle, a sense of entitlement, and that's fine because they develop their creativity and all the other things, but it is not so good when they run into the wall of what? Racism. Because they're not prepared to deal with it. Okay? So when you raise them in the suburbs, or you raise them here, anywhere you raise them, and they don't encounter this experience, they're not prepared to deal with it. And they're very frustrated. <coughs> uh, they have to understand that white people do not see them as positives. Okay? So what happens is when you send young uh, prep school blacks from the Washington, D.C. area to Princeton, to Yale, to Georgia, uh, to Georgia Tech, they come home at Christmas and Thanksgiving, they're completely shattered, and you're trying to figure out what happened to this A-plus student that you sent down there, or sent there, and they've been told, you do not deserve to be here. You have taken the place of a deserving white male. And if they have not had an understanding of this what? They are not prepared and they are destroyed. So that's right, suicide, drugs, all kinds of things. So what we have to do is prepare them for this existentialistic reality. They can feel, yes, they don't know so much, but knowing about the struggle is helpful. Because many of them tell you, well, I didn't, they, if you ask some of these, young, not in this building, but in the community, who was Malcolm X, who was Martin Luther King? They don't know, they don't have a clue. What was Birmingham? They don't know. They don't know. And for your generation, you wouldn't have known anything about World War I, you know, if you were born in the 30s. Somebody said the Battle of the so You wouldn't have known what they were talking about. So they don't have a clue about it. But we have to give them some of this history. Yeah. See, Jews constantly reinforce in their children that they are their history. Yeah. And if we do it, then we're racist. We're not racist. We're doing the same thing other people are doing. We're reinforcing in our history. You see what I'm saying? Now, the sense of entitlement is because they, they have not had to what? struggle, all right? So they don't know what it is to do that. But the thing that is, is uh, re you have two reward systems. You have one system that really upsets me, and that is those that are not middle class males begin to think that the only way you can prove that you're male is to go to where? And do some what? And then that equals man. And you have to have had one what? Yes. 
and that equals what? Okay. Now let's track systemically what this is going to do. If you have no education, you have to earn what? But they, they feel as entitled as the others, but they, they don't have any way to what? Earn, earn. earn it. So they what? Steal. Or sell. Uh -huh. And that will put you where? Yeah. To do what? Time. All right. Now you have to have at least one one Time. that you are not supporting. <laughs> OK? Now let's examine and see what that does. If you sell crack, it used to be that you would get so much time based on the amount. Okay? And time could be measured by the person who was the what? Yes. Now they have come they have what? Mandatory. Now why you see, let me let me show you something. Uh, that's what I can talk about this afternoon. When you're dealing with white power structure, okay, there is always a, an overt action, and it has a covert agenda. So whenever you see an overt action, you have to ask yourself, what is the one? What is that covert agenda? All right, the overt action, mandatory time in jail to get the dope dealers off the street and make communities safe for black people in their own communities. That's the overt agenda. And people bought it. That's the overt statement, rather, or action. Now, what's the covert agenda? You are building up the population in the one. So you have hundreds of thousands of black men in where? And they're going to be there for how long? Yes, at least 20 years. So if they go in, they're going to be 40-something years old when they come out. This is the best time of their one and the most productive time. Now, it costs to keep them in jail, in the cheapest jail, 15000 per year, very often 30000 and right here in Rikers, it's 45000 a year. You can go to Yale, Harvard, and Oxford for less than 45000 a year. So now it becomes for a culture that counts and what? that this is not cost beneficial. So we will privatize the jails. And in order to pay for their board and keep, these men will have to work for less than, yeah, for what? Yeah. So this is the new what? The new slavery. It's the new slavery. The new slavery. One, two. Yes, sir. How do you see us here as mentors? How do you see yourself? And what is your prognosis of us in the future? Well, I have been to many churches, many institutions, uh, many schools, but this is number one. I'm not saying it because I'm here, but I'm saying it because it's real. Your pastor has a vision, OK? So when you talk about organizational structure, you tell people you want them to get a vision. And then you tell them they have to develop a mission statement. And they have to have goals and objectives to accomplish them and timelines. He has a vision, and you share his vision. Okay, and his vision is to change this community. And the mission varies in the sense that how do you go about changing it? You buy property. You give people homes. 
you educate them, you give them jobs. All right? Now, I have said this before, and I'm going to say it again. What you get at this church in a week, any week out of the year, in terms of speakers and what have you, there are many universities that don't have that quality of speaker in a year. Do you hear me? Okay. And the reason you have that is because you tithe. The reason you have it is because you what? No, no chickens sacrifice their lives for no. your programs here. Okay? Okay? There ain't no fish frying in here, is there? Put your what? And when you put your money out there, he gives you programs that you could not have anywhere, anywhere. If you just look back for two years over the names of the people, okay? You have people that, do you know the man that was here yesterday? Do you know how much he ordinarily comes for? A lot of money. He don't go no place for less than $15,000. 20 is his normal fee. <clears throat> he don't even get on the plane. You hear? And when he gets on the plane to talk to these white institutions, he doesn't talk as long as he did here. Do you think he would ruin his talk that long? No. Could damage his voice. <laughs> he talks for 10 minutes, uses vocabulary that white people are scribbling down the word, trying to think, what did he say, what did he say, what did he say? <laughs> sits out there and signs his book, gets back on the plane, and it's gone. <laughs> he came in and spent the whole day with you. That's because he, one, loves and respects your pastor. Yes, sir. Okay? All right? And he knows that you are a responsive, educated audience. You're an educated audience, and that's why I like to come here, because you're an, you've had enough experience about enough things that you're, you're very like a university. Okay? Now that's how I see this church and your pastor. Now what you have to think of is in terms of where are we going when the pastor retires. And you've got to think about that because your pastor is getting to the point where he will want to what? Retire, Retire and turn this over to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you don't need to. Okay. The, the time will come. <laughs> Yes, yes. Where do I see myself? I see myself doing what I'm doing with you as a group. I generally do it with one or two students. And I'm going to share two of my students with you. Okay? Because I give the framework. I give the philosophical framework, just like I gave to you. And then pieces of that people pick up, and they apply it. And it develops into something that is really viable and meaningful. So I have given you, now I'm going to show you the practical side. I'm going to ask uh, Buford, come up and show them what you do with things. And then I'm going to ask Joy, because you heard from Joy, but I want her to do another part of her thing. She has her original ideas, which was her post-traumatic slave syndrome. That's her post, that's her other thing. But the thing that she started on, one of the things was to take an idea that I had and to develop it. Okay. Philosophical aspects of culture difference up here. Okay. Do I need a mic? No. Yes, no. yeah. Here, here, give him the mic. Here we go. So. You know? Okay. No, no, keep it. Keep All right, it. okay. Uh, Dr. Nichols uh, came to the university where I, I worked in the late 70s and uh, shared with us uh, this, uh, this format, a few different words on it, but basically the same format uh, in, uh, in 1979 at a conference on, uh, on black mental health uh, issues. And at that time, uh, I, was, uh, I was involved in some things in the community because of the military trying to take over some public schools. And I also was involved just in terms of my own interest in words that define people of African descent. Uh, after, um, after meeting Dr. Nichols, and being exposed to, uh, to this framework that's, uh, that's on the uh, screen here, 
I, uh, I was able to, to put the interest that I had in words into a more scientific and a more analytic approach, and it, and it opened it up. Uh, how many of you have been to the Undoing Racism workshop? We just did one. So uh, what, uh, what I'm going to show you, uh, those of you who have been through the Undoing Racism workshop, you will recognize this as being part of the presentation on linguistic racism. And just very quickly, what linguistic racism is, uh, this is an idea that I came up with to, just to describe this uh, thing. This is racism as it manifests itself in language. And linguistic racism occurs when a dominant group uh, forces the people that they have dominated and conquered to redefine themselves now according to the language of the conqueror. So then if the conqueror is a, uh, is a conqueror with a worldview that turns people into objects, that has a, an epistemology wherein you are able to verify knowledge and information by counting and measuring, and has a logic set that, uh, that makes sense out of life by splitting things into dualities and dichotomies, then you begin to see this reflected in the language of that culture. Can I get a, a half a amen? <laughs> to uh, the counting and measuring epistemology. Uh, what you, one of the things you find is, is that there's a need to count and measure the humanity of people <coughs> of African descent. There's a need to count and measure how close we are to being white.
away from it and which has the highest value. The system, they're taken away from it. Now, there's other things that we can point out about this, but just moving across here, it says technology. All sets are repeatable and reproducible. This is the way it is all over the country, isn't it? Not only is this the way it is all over the country, this is the way it is inside of each one of our minds as we understand the English language. Because unless you're an artist, unless you sing and moan, or you can do a picture, or you can do something else, you can't think and express your thought without using a word. If all the words that you have at your disposal have you coming up short, then you will logically be coming up short, according to the language. And all over the place, you will see these kinds of things repeated and reproduced. So then, uh, just to, in conclusion, I'll just say that when you, you listen to what Dr. Nichols has been talking about, uh, it's not just what he's saying, but it how, it's how it can be applied to other things that you might even be interested in. I mean, you know, we're not even going to talk about the development of our intuition. As Dr. Nichols talked about, spirituality is something that is disregarded. 
Did you know that your spirituality is another capacity for knowing? Yes. I mean, do they test your spirituality on the SAT no. test? No. That's because they can't count and measure it. But it is a way of knowing. Yes. So then it's in these kinds of institutions of higher learning where we are right now where we can first of all know that we have that capacity and also be able to develop it and then using the kind of scientific framework that Dr. Nichols has provided us with look at language. And uh, I'll just say, say this last thing in closing. There's a, um, a linguist that worked for MIT uh, named Harold Laswell, wrote a book called The Language of Politics. And he said that the, uh, that the weapon, that the, 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 the word is a weapon. He likened the word to a weapon. But he says that the word is a weapon because it's like a bullet or a missile, because both can inflict damage at a long distance. We have a long distance from the development of words like Negro, mulatto, quadroon, and octoroon. But here, we're still running around calling ourselves a minority, wounded from a distance by something in the way that we see ourselves. So then. Words, sticks and stones can break our bones, but words can alter your reality. So then, when we're talking about this, we're not just talking about changing words, but we gotta do something about changing our reality. And that's where this whole thing with the Mayatha uh, really comes into play, because this is a spiritual way that we can begin to change our reality in here, and then have the strength to go out and really do something about it in the society. Thank you. Okay. Another, another answer. I mean, that, that's so powerful in terms of words. And uh, a lot of the work that, that I developed based on um, Dr. Nichols' model had to do with education and children, specifically developing a model that our children would be, would be able to function and actually excel. Another piece of that puzzle, when I was looking at your words, my husband said to me, because he was look, he's been looking at the economics of our community, and that is profit and nonprofit. You know, one of the things that happened when I, you know, as I've worked in the school system, they're always talking about our kids don't actually, you know, they aren't able, they're falling through the cracks. They aren't making it. And when I was working with Dr. Nichols, I said, Dr. Nichols, if it's true that our axiology is real for us and is alive right now and will probably be with us for quite a while, then we sh I should be able to develop a model based on this and it should work. And what I call that model was a relationship model of education, the, the relationship model. In other words, that the key to our children learning was based on the relationship itself. So the first thing I had to look at is who was educating our children. Okay, now you guys know about Juwanza Kanjufu. Okay, you know, Juwanza talks about fourth grade failure syndrome, you know. And the whole idea is who, who is that? They're afraid of our children. They don't like our children. They don't love our children. And then there was another brother that talked about um, dead teachers should not be allowed to teach live children. Right. So what we're looking at is a relationship. And so what, what I did was I, I started to develop a way that teachers can begin to look at their, themselves as an instrument for working with the children. Okay. Now the first thing I said is that they have three roles in the classroom. I developed these roles. One is the parent. The other is instructor. And then there's the mentor. I'm saying that when you walk in a classroom, you're not just a teacher. You can't be. Now, if you have Johnny in the classroom, Johnny's crawling over the seat and throwing spitballs, which one of the roles as a teacher are you going to go into to correct that student? You're going to go into parent because the first thing our children will say when you say, get yourself up and sit over there, you ain't my mama. I am today and you're gonna sit yourself down. And I, there's a reason why I can move into that role. 
I can move into that role because I have a relationship with that child. Now, sometimes people don't understand what that means because you can correct that child, and there's only one reason why a child will obey a parent or respond and accept punishment because it's something that they know. And what's that? They know you love them. Therefore, I'm going to do what you say. And in order for a child to, in reciprocity, show that love back to you, they are obedient. So now we have a system that you can test. If you're telling a child to do something, the child is not responding to you. There's something wrong with the relationship. And if there's something wrong with the relationship, you've got to ask, am I not loving that child? Is that child not loving me? Because if that child's not being obedient to me, it is immediate reflection on the relationship, not the child. So now we're looking at me being able to discipline, which is very important. And if you're not disciplining in the right role, you're not going to get anywhere. Okay, now I'm walking, I'm walking around in the, in the mall, you know, I'm somewhere in, in, uh, at, at a movie theater, and I see one of my kids. I'm the teacher. Which role am I in? Oh, mom, that's my teacher. Hi. Hi, Miss Leary. Okay. If I'm getting anything other than that, I'm not mentoring that child. And the role and the responsibility of the mentor is to inspire that child. I'm supposed to inspire them. And that child is then supposed to aspire to something. They're going to reach for something because that's what they're getting from me. And the role of the instructor, which I thought was the most important, was to cherish the child. And I really do believe that. I believe that every single person, every single child should be cherished by their instructors. They should be cherished. And when you cherish someone, they begin to appreciate what you're doing for them. And that's where you get respect as a teacher. So I'm saying that this is a, these are roles that are very important. They sounded like words, and people would go, well, I don't know how that works. Well, it does indeed work. I'll give you an example of it. Our children don't respond very strongly for, to people just giving them rules and setting up rules for them. There was a little girl that was in a, I was covered in the, um, in, into the school, it's a middle school. And this little girl had a whole set of kids lined up waiting for this little boy to come through the door. You know, they were setting him up, whoever he was, right? So the little boy comes, and he's a little kind of round, little round white boy, right? And you could see he was shaking. <laughs> he was shaking because this was something that happened. And I'm just sitting there observing it. So he comes through the door, and they go, Michael, can you, you know, they were teasing him because he was a stutterer, right? So the worst thing that happens when you tease a stutterer is he does what? He stutters more. So this kid is turning red in the face, spitting, trying to curse back, and, and then they all laugh. When they all laugh, they turn and they see me. And I just look at them. A couple of them kind of shuffle away because they know they're wrong. And this little girl who's kind of like running it, <laughs> she looks at me like, <laughs> you know, ca kind of calling me out. So I said, you come here. I said, come here. I said, you know what it feels like to hurt? Yeah. Now, let me tell you what she looked like. She was kind of tall in that kind of middle stage of growing, you know, that kind of gangly, you know, teeth. Nothing was going right for her, okay? <laughs> nothing was, it was, you know, another couple of years it was going to straighten out, you know, but right now it was kind of going awry. And I know she was the object of what? Teasing. She was always teasing. So I said, I said you know what it feels like to hurt? She goes, yeah, because she was in lots of fights. I don't feel like I'd be hurt. I, I said, no, no, I'm not talking about that kind of hurt. I'm talking about the hurt that crawls way down in your stomach. It just rolls around there. And no matter where you go, you can't get away from that hurt. I said, you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of know that. I said, you know, when somebody says something to you that hurts so bad you can't, can't get away from it? Yeah. I said, let me tell you what, what happens to this little boy every day when he goes home. So when he goes home, he has a difficult time going to sleep because he's wondering whether or not you're going to be at the door tomorrow. When he finally gets to sleep, he wakes up, and the first thing he thinks about, he can begin to feel his stomach muscles tighten up before he gets out of the bed because he's wondering, once again, if you're going to be at the door. He tries to walk very, very slowly, to move slowly, because perhaps he can be late enough so the bell will ring, and he'll be able to get to that door before, after you're already gone, he can get to his class and sneak on in. Then he sits at the table, and he can't finish his breakfast because his stomach is in knots 
Now he can, he can barely, he can barely breathe because he can feel his, his throat choking up because he's so worried about what is going to be waiting for him. I said, and then he gets in the car with his mother and he doesn't want to get out of the car. And she says, no, you got to get out of the car. So he walks as slowly as he can, hoping to God that when he walks through that door, you won't be on the other side of it. I said, that's what he deals with every single day. And you're the cause of it. Now you go home, you close your eyes, and you get with your God on that. You think she did it again? She never did it again. I, I didn't know. I didn't know. I, did. I said, I know you didn't know, but no one has the right to do that to another person. No one does. I made her feel it. I got inside of her because I know that if she could connect on a personal level with that, then she could let go of it and she could stop. Now, the teachers in the school weren't ready to do that. This wasn't my student. I didn't even teach in the school. But I knew where to reach it. Now, the other ones are going, you know, that child, she ain't going to never do it. She's a bad mother probably on crack. That's why she act that way. That's not true. It's not at all true. But you have to have a relationship with that child. And when she saw me every single day, there was a level of respect she gave to me. She didn't know my name. But that's what we instill in our children, that sense of respect for an adult, for an elder, and for anyone else. You know, but she had to make her feel that you couldn't cerebrally say you're going to get in trouble if you do that to that little boy again. Because she's going to do it when, they, when you're not looking, right? So then the next piece that I had to do was, Dr. Nichols always talks about symbolic imagery and rhythm, which is really hard to explain to folks, right? So what I did was I developed a couple of strategies for working with this. I'll tell you how it was born. I was working in a program called Self-Enhancement Incorporated, where I had to, I work with severely at-risk kids. And that was, at-risk was a term associated with money. <laughs> okay, it's the, like drug and alcohol, you know, that's how funders look at things. You look at fun funding cycles, gang prevention, you know, crisis, crisis intervention, all those kind of things. Well, this was at-risk, right? So I'm in this classroom, and I got, a, you know, a good 75, 80% boys. And in my program, what I do is I would send out criteria for how you could be in the program. And the way you could be in the program was, one, that you're below reading or math level. Two, you have a leadership. In other words, you're at level or above, but you have difficulty interacting with other people, low self-esteem or whatever, you know, social skills. And, you know, all of the in-between. Well, when I would send this list off to teachers, because they would refer kids, the teachers would look at it and go, okay, who do I most hate? And do I want out my classroom? And they were in mine. All of them were in my classroom. So one day I'm at the board, and, you know, children are carrying on and behaving, you know, kind of rowdy before the class starts. And four gentlemen walk through the door. They're all white men. They have suits on, and they have pens and paper. What are they going to do? Count and measure. So I walk in the back of the room. I said, hello, my name is Joy. I didn't know who they were because at the time, you know, people would send folks to my room, to my directors, you know, just to kind of sit in. I would always be the room they'd send them to sit in on. So they said, oh, no, no, just keep going. We're funders, <laughs> you know, and we're going to determine whether we're going to fund drugs and alcohol curriculum. Now, I taught drugs and alcohol stuff, right? So now I've got to prove for them in 50 minutes that they should give me the money, right? This is what I got to do in 50 minutes. Meanwhile, kids are crawling off through round desks and throwing spitballs, okay? So, um, you know, I gather myself together, you know. <laughs> so I hand them my post-test, which is true or false, dichotomous, you know, so that they could know you either, either true or false, not hard. But it's a drugs and alcohol test, which I'm going to give to these very same sixth graders in approximately six weeks. So I turn to walk away, and I hear the gentleman going, well, can you get one? I know I have three. What's four? I can't get four. I, and what the heck is five? I can't get five at all. So they're back there, can't pass the test, right? <laughs> But because I never gave my children remedial stuff, I always gave them college level material, always. And they always met that standard. So these gentlemen are now looking around chuckling because they're saying, okay, so she's giving us this test. She's going to try to come, that these kids are going to. So I kind of hear them and I turn around and go, excuse me, are you, are you suggesting that um, my students won't be able to? Oh, yeah, they're going to pass the test. Ma matter of fact, they're going to pass the test with flying colors, okay? Not only that, I'm going to teach them using symbolic imagery and rhythm, okay? Matter of fact, I'm going to teach you something today, <laughs> okay? And I'm going to teach you using symbolic imagery and rhythm. Matter of fact, what I teach you today, you are never going to forget what I teach you. In other words, I am guaranteeing for you today that what I teach you, you're going to have 100% retention. 
In other words, that means never will you forget barring head injury or Alzheimer's. Okay? <laughs> so, now I turned around, and you know, this is a perfect example when the ego has gone awry. Because <laughs> I didn't have a clue. Not a clue. I'm telling you the truth. I turned around and said, all right, God, Lord, hit me with it. Hit, hit me with it. I know you with me. You got my back on this. So I turned around, and I am going to do something today using symbolic imagery and rhythm. I'm going to teach you today what I taught them that day. And I'm going to guarantee that you are going to never forget what I teach you today. And I'm going to teach you using symbolic imagery and rhythm. Okay? What I'm going to teach you about is amphetamines and barbiturates. Now, I want you to say this with me. A, amphetamines take you to the top. Say that. B, barbiturate takes you to the bottom. Is it safe to assume that an amphetamine is the opposite of a barbiturate? Yes. Okay, ain't going to get no deeper than that because now I'm going to tell you a story. Now, the story I'm going to tell you, what's important about it is it's true. It's from my childhood. I grew up in, in South Central Los Angeles. This is a childhood story. Now, the reason why I insist in my curriculum that you tell children the truth is because truth communicates with the heart and the soul. It's something that immediately is absorbed. Our children respond to the truth. Don't be making up nothing. You don't need to. And when I, when I finish this, you understand why. So I'm going to tell you the story of Barbara. Now, Barbara was addicted to something. What do you think that might have been? That's the truth. Barbara was addicted to barbiturates. Now, in my day growing up, a barbiturate was a downer. That meant that... You want to get loaded, real loaded. I mean, it was Red Devils. That's what they called them. I, they call them different stuff now, but they call them Red Devils. And the drug of choice when I was growing up was a kind of drugs where you were so loaded, you would be asking, well, who would I leave with? <laughs> what would I have on when I left? You know, folks wanted to be so loaded, they just couldn't even remember what the day was before. Okay, Central nervous system stimulant is a drug of choice in the 90s. And that's cocaine. Okay. Now, cocaine makes you feel on top of things, alive, capable, competent, which suggests to you what the majority of people feel when they're not on cocaine, right? So now you're seeing a nation of people who are addicted to a stimulant that doesn't get you high as much as it does give you a sense of capability, okay? So people are feeling very dysfunctional, thus we have Prozac. So now, <laughs> I'm going to tell you the story of Barbara. Now, let me tell you, Barbara was one of those people, and every community has Barbara, or several of them. My community had quite a few. Now, Barbara was the kind of person that everybody knew. They knew her because she was, you know, the liquor store people knew her, the grocery store, because she was always doing something wrong. Now, she wasn't all there, okay? On a good day when Barbara wasn't loaded, she wasn't all there, right? She talked to herself occasionally, <laughs> okay, and she would have curse herself out. In addition, you know, she would, and you out, whoever was around, Barbara was always doing that. So everyone knew Barbara, and all communities have them. You know, we had those folks, you know, they over there talking to themselves, but they all right, you know, we accept them, you know. So Barbara, one day, we were out in the street, and we are playing kick the can, which, of course, baited me with my children who said, what you kicking a can for, Miss, Miss Larry? I said, it's a game. Y'all know what kick the can is, right? Yeah. See, they didn't know what kick the can was, because they played a hide, I said, it's a hide-and-go-seek kind of thing with a can, all right? So we're playing kick the can in the street. And lo and behold, we see Barbara turn the corner, and she's spitting and talking to herself and cursing, which is kind of normal. But today, Barbara has a hammer, a big hammer. And we know Barbara's going to do something wrong. So Barbara comes up to where we are, and there parked in front of where we were playing is a brand-new Cadillac, a symbol in itself. This Cadillac was beautiful, shiny, chrome, everything's, you know, just beautiful. You know, bucket seats, you know, shine, buff. That Barbara broke every window to that Cadillac. Broke the headlights, broke the taillights, got on the hood, dented the hood in, got off the car, went to the man who owned it, his, his, his house, his little apartment, broke every window. Then she sat on the car and talked to herself. So we were playing, you know, it was getting to be about dusk, but everybody was looking around because we knew two things. One, the man's on foot, and it's getting dark, he's coming home. <laughs> okay, so we was waiting. Barbara's still on the, on the, uh, sitting there on the car. Suddenly the man turns the corner. He starts walking towards us. Everybody in the street stops. We stared at it, look at Barbara on the car with the hammer. We stared at it. Man walks slowly up, you know, it's like, like a scene from West Side Story. <laughs> Cad rolls out in the gutter. 
Man walks up to the car. African American man takes off his glasses. Not a typical response. Looks at Barb. Barb starts cursing at him. He just kind of looks at the car slowly. Walk. Just kind of surveys it. You know, sort of puts his glasses back on. Walks over to his apartment. You know, steps over the glass. E everything's just you know. Then he goes into his apartment, which is your cue to run in the hood. Okay. <laughs> Because when people go in, they're coming out with something. <laughs> okay. So everybody, everybody breaks away, you know, running behind stuff. Joy runs behind the bush. I'm about as far as I am from Dr. Nichols behind the bush. And the man yanks Barbara off the car. I'm that far because I can see everything. Yanks her off the car, throws her on the ground, begins to beat her into a whole new form of existence right there in front of me. And it's getting to be so dark, and in my neighborhood, there wasn't a lot of street lights, so you could barely see. But because I was closest to Barbara, I could see something no one else could see. Every time he pulled his fist back, I'd see something shining. So he wasn't hitting Barbara. He was stabbing Barbara. So I'm nine years old, and I'm just petrified because I'm thinking, he going to get me. He going to get me. What I'm going to do, he going to get me. So I decided, give it your best. So I'm three blocks running, <laughs> down the street, running. I get to my house. I run in the house. My mother's in the back, hanging out clothes on the clothes. Mama Barbara broke the man's stand. <laughs> you know, Joy is hysterical, traumatized. So she sits me down. She says, Where, where's Barbara? What happened to Barbara? I tell my mother, South Central LA, 30 minutes for the ambulance to get there. What's your concern for Barbara? She's going to die from? Right. So 30 minutes later, the police paramedics arrive. Now we go back down the street where Barbara was. I got to show them where Barbara was. It's pitch black, can't see anything. So they're flashing lights. Now we can't hear Barbara. We don't hear her at all. So our assumption, Barbara's what? Yeah. Right. So we flash the light, and they're on the graph of blood everywhere. Everywhere you could look, there was blood. But they couldn't see Barbara. So they decide, oh, here's a novel idea. Give the children flashlights. So the children are looking for Barbara. Barbara, Barbara, hoping not to find her. Barbara, Barbara. So I'm standing on the curb. And I notice across the street, a light goes out. And I notice it, because it's dark. And it went out. It should have come on. And then a door slam, and a car kind of drive away. Well, that's a local drug dealer. So I walk over there. And as I walk over there, the police are following me. They flash the light onto the porch. And there's Barbara. She crawled up onto the porch of this lo local drug dealer. Barbara turned around, looked at us, rolled her eyes, and started cursing at us. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Why wasn't Barbara dead? What must they do? What must they do? Why was she? But more than that, she was alive. Why was Barbara alive? What did those drugs do? Slowed what? Slowed that heart rate down so she didn't do what? Bleed to death. OK, now, when I saw Barbara, it was the first time I saw the femur bone while it was in someone's body. He cut her to the bone from the hip to the knee. And everywhere else he cut her, he cut her to the bone. Now, my sixth graders at this point are like, Miss Leary, did she die? <laughs> did Barbara die? Barbara did not die. Barbara was confined to a wheelchair because he tore the ligaments out of her leg. Now, despite all of that, the paramedics cried when they wa worked on Barbara because, you see, everybody loved her. Despite the fact that she acted out, we never wanted to see her hurt. Why wasn't Barbara screaming, though? She didn't feel it. How come she didn't feel it? Now, true or false, objective test. Amphetamines decrease the heart rate. True or false? Barbiturates increase the pain threshold. Increase the pain threshold. It's true. Now, in a classroom that is linear and sequential, dichotomous thinking, they're going to do this to you when you study this particular lesson. They're going to give you a chapter in a book or a piece of paper with an amphetamine or barbiturate. Amphetamine and barbiturate tell you that properties of an amphetamine, properties of barbiturate, have some questions, test on Friday. Right? OK, now had I brought in a little piece of paper with amphetamine and barbiturate, the properties on the side, and little questions, they'd have said, ooh, Michael, this will make a good airplane. Let's see, you get, you fold that with you. They'd have rolled, that have been flying across the room before I could turn my back. But now. You know what an amphetamine does and a barbiturate does, and you'll never forget it because who won't you forget? Awesome. Symbolic imagery and rhythm. Yeah. 
You have a relationship. You can almost see Barbara. Now, let me tell you why I use Barbara. How many people in this audience know someone that has a drug or alcohol problem? Raise your hand. Do we need to lie about it? No, we don't, because Barbara was somebody's mama in my classroom. That was her sister or their cousin, and they never forgot it. Now, day two, I bring out the little piece of paper with the amphetamine and the barbiturate. I don't even have to pass it out. Put it on the table. Just put it on the table. Ronnie, that's the pill Barbara took. No, it's not. Yes, it Read it. That's right. That's what it did to Barbara. Remember? Yeah. Give it to me. You get your own. <laughs> Got my now I have children interested in the curriculum. I now have children that have a relationship with it, that understand it, and are never going to forget it, just like you will. These are my students. <laughs> okay. What I Nichols is a clinical industrial psychologist who was educated at Assumption College in Winston, Windsor, Canada. Uh, various universities in Germany and Austria. He is a doctor, uh, holds a doctor of philosophy in psychology and psychiatry, cum laude. Uh, for over 20 years, he has held various positions at the National Institute of Mental Health. He is currently the director of his own behavioral science firm. Nichols and Associates based in Washington, D.C. And certainly there's a lot to study about our behavior, especially in a time like this with everything that's happening around us with Lemrick Nelson and Tawana Brawley and our reactions and maybe non-reactions to some of the things that are going on, but certainly the behaviors of our enemies as well. And so we are grateful for his scholarship we're certainly grateful for his presence here this evening. It is a very timely, as I'm sure you'll see, lecture. Let us welcome, give a united African movement welcome to Dr. Edwin J. Nichols. Dr. Edwin J. Nichols. Dr. Edwin J. Nichols. Dr. Edwin J. Nichols. Hotep. First, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for inviting me to come to be with you today and uh, for coming out in all the rainstorm to take part in this lecture series. I, um, I'm going to address a very important issue today, which is employment in the 21st century, black males at the crossroads. Uh, it's not often that I write things down uh, because I generally have something in my mind and I express it. But this morning, um, I woke up very early and these things were in my mind and I put them down to be sure that I didn't miss something and I would be able to share it with you. As we enter the 21st century, am I hearing drums from someplace else? Oh, from upstairs. Oh, okay. All right. I didn't, I thought they had stopped and <laughs> that was some music was coming somewhere, you know, a little, just a little schizophrenia, that's all. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I see. Okay. All right. Okay. As we enter the 21st century, black males in the United States are at the crossroads of employment opportunity. 
We can either accept the challenge and gain the necessary skills for survival or return to indentured servitude and slavery. That's my thesis. In Africa, at the bidding of white slave traders, some black traitors sold other blacks into slavery for their own personal gain, glass beads. The black trader did not share in the great wealth created by the slave trade. Okay, there was a man who was sitting behind me, and he was talking about the, uh, I'll, I'll pull it out here in a minute. Yes, he called about the head whoopers. Yes, as a, okay. So they didn't share in the great wealth of the head whoopers, okay. Subsequently, Africa was carved up by the Europeans and the traitors became the betrayed. They lived under the yoke of colonialism and today under the yoke of economic imperialism, the INF, International Monetary Fund, IMF, World Bank. Black males first came to the United States through the Middle Passage and entered centuries of slavery. Today, my question is, are we repeating the past? Here in Harlem, at the bidding of white dope dealers, black traitors introduced drugs to other blacks for their own personal gain, gold chains, and a car. Once again, they do not share in the great wealth of the dope trade. Black addiction to pot, heroin, cocaine, and crack is the hell of the Middle Passage. Many lives are lost in that journey, our sisters and brothers, our sons and daughters, our grandchildren born addicted. At the end of the drug middle passage, years of slavery, young men, our army, spend their entire productive lives in the slavery prison. Prison industries is their slavery. The system says, of course, all of you in jail have to pay for your room and board. Keeping you in jail for one year costs the system, the taxpayers, more money than, spending, uh, than sending a deserving child to private college for one year. It costs more to keep one man in confinement in jail than it does to send one to Harvard University and pay all tuition, room, board, books, and everything for a full year. It is not fair to expect the system to carry the burden for your incarceration. Therefore, prison industries doing industrial manufacturing at less than minimum wage is going to be the way, is going to be the slave labor with all these young men, okay? There's no job out here for them but there's work provided for them in prison with no money. And they are spending the best, most productive years of their lives in jail. And you know the sentencing. As a white, you can have a whole pound of cocaine, okay? And you, yours is not a federal crime. It's a local crime. You're a little gram of coke, of uh, crack cocaine, and you're in jail for a, a a definite sentence, which means we know we can get that many years of work out of you. Young black male in prison, men, uh, young black males in prison are lost and most cannot be saved. That's the sad part of this. They will be released from prison to once again prey upon the black community. Now the reason they're not saved is because there's nothing in the prison to rehabilitate. 
all the programs and psychotherapies and things that would be in there to help have been cut back, cut down, and cut out. And the only thing that is there is the repetition of the same behavior that got them there in the first place through guards who make their money through selling drugs in the prison. The reason is that as young black males are not willing, now the reason that I'm addressing to you is, why are we having these problems in our community? Because we as black men are not willing to take up arms to regain the control of our communities. We are not willing to search out and extricate the slave traders who make great wealth from the black community selling drugs and then leave our communities in shambles. An unsafe environment of fear, anger, and daily killings. In most major cities, a young black male is killed every single day. Now, if you know anything about epidemiology or about health, if you had any other illness that killed in every major city one person a day, there would be a national program because it would be seen as a peril and an epidemic. And we just accept it as normal. Because some here in New York, you don't even put it on the radio anymore, on the television. Nothing is done about it because their lives are not valued by the system. How bad are conditions in our communities? My mother is 4 foot and 11 inches tall. She weighs 92 pounds. She wears a size 2 shoe. And she is 92 years old. She was taking groceries into the house, not asking anybody to do anything for her, taking her own groceries into the house. Crackhead ran up behind her, put a gun to her head, broke her wrist, and took her purse of $20. Now listen to how we have come to accept this as reality. My mother said plaintively, well, it could have been worse. I came to Detroit at 14, and this is only the second time I've been mugged. Isn't that ironic? This black woman worked hard all of her life. As a youth, she fought the Ku Klux Klan with her father to save their home from being burned because niggers didn't deserve to have a house that good. She doesn't ask me or my sister for anything and takes complete care of herself and her house. At 92, she, she, ha she has earned the right to walk to the store and to the church in safety. Where are our young black men? Where is our army? Where are the defenders of our women and our society? When a dog is rabid, it is killed to protect the society. Islam is more benevolent because it believes that some can be saved. They just cut off one hand to teach the lesson and hope that the individual will learn from the lesson and others will not have to be taught the same lesson. What I'm suggesting to you is that there are times when you can talk and there are times when, as a community, you have to take action. Okay. In the last quarter of this century, black males were considered obsolete in the workforce. Manual labor is not needed. And when it is needed, someone from Central America will do it better and cheaper. Now, for the young black men that remain in our communities and have very little education, they will be unemployed in the 21st century. What are they going to do where are the jobs? That's what I want to talk about now. Um, 
in order to understand this, I, I want to give you some history about what has happened to the workplace so that you'll be very clear. And for some of you, it'll be repetitious, maybe. For others, it will not be. So I, bear with me so I can go through it. I'm going to ask you some technical questions, and I want you, since you're a black audience, you won't have any problems with call and response. You'll be able to respond right away, OK? OK. Isms give privilege. If you were a white group and you wrote something down, then that would be the sentence to write down. But since you're black, let's repeat it about two times. Isms give? Privilege. Isms give? Privilege. All right, what ism is this? <clears throat> what ism is that? Can you see it? Who gets the privilege? What do you have to have to get that privilege? A? No. What? A what? A penis. You have to have a penis. If you don't have one, you don't get that privilege. All right. What ism is this? Who gets the privilege? What is required to get the privilege? Can you be high yellow? Can you be almost white? You have to be what? All right. Now, we have one privilege. Boy, it gets one privilege for what? What ism? One privilege is for what? And another privilege is for what? Who gets two privileges? Who loses two privileges? Well, Dr. Nichols, are there epidemiographic data to corroborate that? Yes, and these are they. These are high school graduates, 25 years of age and older. The white male with double privilege earns $26,000, which is the beginning of middle class income. For the same high school diploma, the black woman who loses double privilege earns 16000 So ism, sexism, and racism gives a $10,000 differentiation. Same high school diploma. Now, I didn't talk about college, because all white men are nuclear physicists when they graduate from college. We know that. <laughs> but when everybody comes out of high school, they're the same. Now let's look at these isms very carefully. If you look at race-ism, the white man earns 6000 more than the black man. The white woman earns 2000 more than the black woman. That's based on race. That's based on gender. The black woman earns 4000 less than the black man. The white woman earns 2000 less than the black man. But she earns 8000 less than the white man. But the woman who suffers the most is the black woman. And she loses double privilege. And she makes $10,000 less for the same high school diploma than the white male who has double privilege. Now we can turn the lights back up. Now the reason I want to share that with you is because I want you to understand what is at stake. All right? So let's do what I do with white groups to see how, how real is it that the workforce, we can expect the workforce through the benevolence of white people to come to parity. That's what I want to ask you to see if you can do that. All right. We said that the, um, thank you. We said that the, um, the income of the white male was 26,000. The income of the black male was 20,000. So 20,000 will be parity. All right. The income of the white female is 18,000 and the income of the black female is 16,000. All right, if 20 is going to be parity, how much more money? Whoa, let me move this. Whoa. 
That almost did more than the rain did. <laughs> How much more money does the white woman need to come to parity? $20,000. $2,000 would bring her to parity. How much more does the black woman need? That'll bring her to parity. Now, two and four are what? Where are we going to get that six? How likely is that to occur? So as long as you trust the benevolence of white people to bring you to parity, you're a fool. Okay. So what you got to do about it? Well, you have to understand where the jobs are and where they're going to be. So let's go back to the theme and see what we're talking about for jobs. Outsourcing. Have you heard of outsourcing? Okay. Black people must cre they create their own jobs and insist on an equal share of all outsourced contracts. Now, the courts are not in your favor because we had set-asides and quotas and things like that for black construct uh, contractors and so on, and the court struck it down because we were beginning to have a little piece of that pie. But what I'm saying to you is, uh, because whites are locked into their axiology, the highest value lying in the object, and are unwilling or unable to share the wealth of the resources of a society, you have to have a new tactic. And the new tactic is, if I won't get a piece of the pie, there won't be any pie. <laughs> Who did that? There was a black mayor of Atlanta. The Atlanta power structure wanted an international airport. And they had all of the money and everything ready. And Jackson said, if black contracts don't get apart, ain't gonna be no airport. They didn't believe him. They tried to destroy his character. They tried to attack him in all kinds of ways. And he said, if blacks do not have a sizable portion of the construction of this and the concessions that are at the airport after it's built, it will not be built. And the blacks in Atlanta who were on those councils and things with him did not split and divide themselves as handkerchief heads, but they held together. And I want you to know when you walk through that airport, as many airports as I go through, it's the only one that I know where you can see black people in major positions in that airport. Okay. When the court says no, the court can be tied up. Now you see what, when people develop systems, we have to understand how the systems work. The Republicans don't want certain things to go through the legislature. You can win by majority rule. So they use parliamentary procedure to tie it up, change the rules, and keep on going. We can use the same procedures. You can file a suit, and the court can stop action on any project until the suit is, re until the suit is taken care of. And as soon as the court says, strike it down, we won't let that stand, have another one filed to hold those things in abeyance until such time as someone comes to you and say, all right, what do you want? Then you tell them what you want and you get it done. But you have to keep them tied up, one after another. It has to be like 50, 60 things that the court has to make a decision on. That means they've got to go in, look up the documentation on it, write a statement saying we won't do it this way, hand it out, and you give them something that next day, that same day saying, well, if that didn't work, try this. And that's the only way you can get a whole system to be willing to change. Do you have any idea how much money is spent in the school system here in this city? Do you have any idea how much money is spent in construction in this city? And my question to you is how much of that money is in the hands of black people? Okay. Do you pay taxes in this city? 
Okay, then you are entitled to a part of it. The other thing is to black, is to bank black. If your money is not in a black bank, it's not helping you. It's paying for someone else to buy capital equipment to beat you out on a contract. Because when you go and ask with the same proposal as the white man for the same loan, you won't get it. Okay? Now you have to understand that you had a bank here that collapsed, but that's how the system works. Don't give up on the idea. Just make sure that they don't get caught short the next time around. You have to be vigilant and recognize that your institutions as you build them are always going to be under attack. Now, what is the next part of this job preparation? Qualify and prepare yourself for the job to get your share of the pie. What are some of the new jobs that are out there? I'm going to talk about the high-end high-tech because that's what the whole system is about. If you don't have the skills, and computerized skills are very important skills, if you don't have the minimum of calculus as a math skill, then you will not be able to survive. And the way I ask that, because whites have the same problems as we do, I say, how many people in this room took calculus and passed it? Raise your hand. You will have a job. Others will be unemployed. Now, that's just how bad it is and how real it is. Is it that you cannot learn calculus? No. Math skills in this country have been a weed out. The way you weed people out and you keep people from competing in the job market is to make math difficult, not easy. How many of you graduated from high school in the West Indies? Okay, if you graduated in the West Indies, was math a requirement? Did they say that you could graduate without it? No. Did women pass it as well as men? Yes. Or they didn't pass. It was taught differently. Another point is that you have to understand that we have a different way of knowing than the school systems very often teach. How many of you were with sisters and brothers in the West Indies? The family moved to, to New York. Same gene pool, sisters and brothers. The brothers that were born in the West Indies could read, but when they got here, they were dyslexic and learning disabled and retarded. It's the same gene pool. How did that happen? Because the methods and teaching methods are different. And they were taught to learn, and here they're taught to weed out. Be clear about what's happening to your children in schools. Now, there's a whole section for people that don't do calculus and won't go to college, what kind of jobs are they going to have? Well, you can't have medial jobs if you don't have specialized trades. So let me tell you about some of the specialized trades. Have any of you seen slate roofs on houses and public buildings? Slate roofs? Do you see the tile roofs on churches and things like that? Who knows how to repair that? Raise your hand if you know how to repair that in here. Who knows how to put a slate roof for a tile? Not a soul in here. Do you know how much money you make doing that? A lot. A lot. How many of you know about the, you see the, the molding along here where it has the, the symbol for music and the, the, that uh, kind of like a vine work in the plaster over there? Do you see that? How do you make that? There's only one place in Washington, D.C. that makes it, and the men are as old as I am in there making it, and they can't get young people to come in and learn how to do the trade. And you pay hundreds of dollars for one of those pieces, and all it is is plaster, but you've got to know how to do it. Watch repair. Most watches are now with a battery, but people still have watches that run and have to be repaired. You can't find people who will sit down and learn how to do watch repair. Refinishing of furniture. Now, there's a whole lot of guys that say, oh, yes, I can refinish it. I can take it off because I saw it on television. That's not the fine refinishing of furniture that will give you the money that you need to support your family. I'm saying that if you are not Du Bois's talented 10, 
then you could certainly be Booker T. Washington's 90 skilled workers. Do you see what I'm saying? There are many trades that are gone without anyone doing anything. In Washington, D.C., there was a black man, Mason, printer, had his printing shop and everything. He could not find, his wife died, and finally he died, and he could not find one black youth to give his equipment to. And white people want hand-printed, hand-set type for invitations and things like that, and will pay good prices for that. OK? Where, if you, you see, and then we talk about there are no jobs. There are jobs, but you have to be willing to study for them. Now, does it mean that you can do it in a year? No, you have to be an apprentice for three to four years and learn every aspect of that trade. And then when you finish, you can open your own store and have your own place. Now, why is that going to be so very important in the future? Simply because in this new century, like you live here in New York, much of the rest of the world is going to live in the same way throughout the United States. You don't really, well, I guess you do experience it. How many, are you begin, how many of you are beginning to see white people moving into your neighborhood? OK. Well, they are tired of living miles and miles away. OK. And they're coming back. And all of these brownstones that were all boarded up and what have you, they're renovating them. And the people who know how to do the renovation are people who have those skills who will make that money. And they're coming back because what they want is a sense of community and neighborhood where you can walk to those things that you want and need and they are in your community. That is the 21st century community. That's how it's going to look. Everything is going to be within a few blocks of where you live. People are going to have the stores on the ground level, and the second and third and fifth floors all the way up are going to be apartments, and people will live in them. Those stores are there now in New York. Who owns them and who runs them? Do they look like you? Do they look like me? They don't look like any of us in here. That's where the money's going to be. You have two choices, high and high tech, the town to 10, or 90 who do the dry cleaning, the tailoring, and all those other things at the lesser level. That does not mean that you don't earn a good living. You do. It does not mean that you cannot take care of your family. You can. It does not mean that you're a lesser person. It says that's your job, but you come to places like this to stimulate your intellect to make yourself work for the rest of the time. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of more sets that I think are very important so that you will understand why white people are so upset and so angry. The young white male, 25 and older, that had the $26,000 a year job, no longer has that job. White male, high school graduate with military experience because Asia is ascending. Now, let's talk about that for a moment. On the 1st of July last year, Hong Kong went to China. That really means that the Bank of Hong Kong became the Bank of China. When the Bank of Hong Kong became the Bank of China, hundreds of millions of Chinese workers hundreds of thousands of Chinese professionals, for the first time in recent history, had the necessary money to buy capital equipment to produce electronic, computerized items in industrial manufacturing more cheaply than any other place in the world. They can make it for 15 cents, send it here for 5 cents, and sell it for 25 cents and make a profit. And it would cost us $15 to try to do the same thing here. So all these little small companies that white men worked at in those little communities that you couldn't go in or go through are closed. And so white male high school graduate with military experience does not have a job. And if you were the FBI and you heard that someone was white and male, high school graduate and no job, you would profile him as, what, as some of these people going around here blowing up places. Okay. Now, I'm going to share something else with you, and I want you to see what has happened to cause the election changes that we had. 
Democrats to Republicans. Why did that happen? First time in 40 years, the House of, House of, uh, the, the, uh, House of Representatives changed two, year, two elections ago from Democrat to Republican. What was that all about? Why did that happen? What is the future employment in the world going to look like? Well, historically, we have had a vertical and hierarchical organizational structure. It is going to horizontal and flat. Now, this is how I do it with white groups, and you just have to play along with me. All right, how many of you of European descent have relatives that came to the United States shortly after the Civil War? Raise your hands. All right. <laughs> you can lie. <laughs> now, here's the point that's very important. How much education did they have coming from Europe shortly after the Civil War? They had zero. Why? Because there was no free public education in Europe at that time. So they came here and they worked in the factories with their hands. They were paid by the hour, paid by the piece. They worked whenever they could. They were not assured of anything. First building they built in their community was a church. And that was their life experience. That was better than Europe because at least they were earning something. All right, now it's time for you to go back to your lie status. How many of you of European descent have relatives that were in this country before the Civil War? All right. They had the advantage of the one room what? Schoolhouse that went to the eighth grade. They entered the workforce and worked with their heads. They were clerks, payroll clerk, timekeeper clerk, inventory clerk, stockroom clerk, anything that required reading and writing of the English language and arithmetic, and they could do it and do it adequately. They had an annual salary. If you have an annual salary, you can go to the bank and get a and by A, that's the beginning of urban middle class in the United States. Now, the people that are doing all the work are here, and these are the people getting paid, but they have what? Education. Now, the people here want some of that money. So what is the second building they built right next to their church? A school to the eighth grade. But the way you maintain power and control is you constantly change the what? The role. So it's time to do what? Yes, of course. And you have to justify it. Well, if you want to be a supervisor, then you need a high school diploma. Well, Dr. Nichols, what do supervisors do? Well, supervisors specialize in the supervision of supervisors who supervise supervisors who supervise who are supervisors, the workers. World War II comes along, it becomes very clear that if we are to maintain the competitive world edge, we need a workforce that is better educated. So we give the GI Bill to returning servicemen, and what will they do? They will become managers. But what are they going to manage? Well, they specialize in the management of managers who manage managers who manage managers and the workers. The workers want more what? But they don't have enough what? Who comes to save the workers? The union. The union saves the workers. But for these people up here, the union is the scourge of Western civilization. Okay? Now, when you have that many managers, somebody has got to be responsible for all of those managers. Those have to be vice presidents, and you need the MBA to do that. Well, what about the vice presidents? Well, the junior vice president reports to a vice president who reports to a senior vice president who reports to an executive vice president who reports to the senior executive vice president. Okay. Now it's time to do what to the rules? Yes, we're going to change the rules. And here we go. We have a group of people here who are called administrative executives. Nothing is written out here because they deserve to be here. They're the good old boys. Way up on top is the CEO, God reigning supreme. Okay. 
Now that's the structure of organization in the United States. It is vertical and hierarchical. The way you move in the system, you prove you love us. Every time you're up for promotion, you relocate your family. You move to another town. Then you're rooted where? In the town, in the people, in your community? No, you're rooted in the what? In your company or corporation. Now, if you say, I'm not moving because my daughter's a senior in high school and has to go to her what? Or the world will? Yes. You're given a lateral until such time as you can relocate. If you fail to relocate the next time around, they demote you one level, give you a six months to get out without a negative letter of reference. And that's how it worked. Everyone knew the rules, and that's how it worked. Now, instead of investing in this industrial equipment to keep it current with the world markets, they just took all the profits and raked them off. What happened is, if you put this superstructure on top of this little tiny base, what's going to happen to that structure? Fifteen years ago, many corporations in the United States, significant numbers of them, collapsed along this eastern shore and across Pennsylvania and Ohio and Indiana. When they collapsed, the good old boys lost everything because their stock was in that company. When their stock was in that company and they lost everything, they were very upset and they told that to the other good old boys who said, that ain't gonna happen to us. So the other good old boys, when they saw their company going down the drain, they knew they had to get out. Now the only way you can get out is to sell your stock. You cannot sell your stock in a company that is failing. So the question is, how can you sell that stock in a company that's failing? Well, the way you sell that stock in a company that is failing is you turn a profit, but you do not create wealth. Let's say that together. You turn a one, but you do not create wealth. Now, how do you do that, Nichols? Well, it's the shiftless, lazy, worthless workers. They have to be punished. We fire 1,000 of them times their three months' salary, and that turns a what? but we have not created what? You see the difference? Okay? See the difference? Now, if I fire a thousand, I have one, two, three workers, and I fire one, the two of you will work one and one half times as hard. So I'm getting the production of three from the salary of how many? Two. Okay? What happens then is at the end of six months, you burn out. So I now have two workers that are completely burnt out. But I got six months, two quarters out of their hide before they burn out. How many more quarters do I have to get before I can get out? Two more? If they're burnt out, are they of any worth or avail to me? What is the logical thing to do? Yes, fire another thousand, and it's nothing personal. So we fire another thousand. Now, what I want you to look at is to look at the people above the glass ceiling. Not the good old boys, because they're gone. Now, if you're way up here, you get ready to jump. You could hurt yourself seriously if you didn't have a what? Yeah, what kind? Golden parachute, and that's what those guys had. They're gone. The people above the glass ceiling are educated, white men, 45 and older. But this morning, they don't have a what? Because they don't have the necessary what for today's workforce? Skills. They don't have them. They are trained to be managers of managers, or supervised managers of managers, but they don't have a job. Every Monday they type another resume for manager of manager looking for a man, but they don't have a job. There are no jobs for that. You have to have skills, and more than one, in order to fill any vacancy that comes along. The structure has collapsed and changed. What happened to these men? They lost their homes because there was nobody at the end of the cul-de-sac to buy it. Well, 
we have set aside money for our children to go to private universities and they don't have to go to public universities with your children. What happened to that money? They lost it. They had to use it, didn't they? Now listen to what the ramifications are. That means that my children are going to have to go to school with your children at the state university. So we have to do what to the rules at the state university, make sure not too many of you get there. Is I beginning to make sense to you now? Okay, and you thought, well, why would that be happening now? Why did they have the handkerchief head up there going through all those changes? The one who is married to the white woman who was getting uh, all of his uh, set-asides, that's how his company got to be so big? Yes, our black brother. Okay, the Negro. Okay, let's move right along here. What happened to these men was they have never been without work. Black men have been without work many times. This is the first time in their history they were out with work. work. And so they began to take a little what? Just a little drink to help them through the day because they could no longer afford weekend what? Okay. All right. Now let's see what happened next to them. What happened to spousal relationships? All right, now let's look to see what happened next. This is the last part of that. Significant number of white males in this situation in the state of Massachusetts did what? Committed suicide. They killed themselves because they couldn't cope with being educated and not having a job. Now, if that was our value system and our, our axiology, highest value in the object, we'd all be dead by now. You have to understand that they have a different value system and it affects them differently. That's why they fight so desperately to hold on to objects. They don't have the capacity to share. The only way we can get them to share is to take it. Okay. These men vote. That's why for the first time in 40 years, the House of Representatives changed from Democrat to Republican, because the Republicans had a Republican agenda an American plan. And they voted because they believed it would help. Did it help them? No, because they don't have the necessary what for today's workforce. But they had been told that it was because of affirmative action, civil rights legislation, equal employment opportunity. None of that is real. The reality is they don't have the necessary what for today's workforce? Skills. They don't have those skills. They cannot operate those computers. They cannot change the programs in those computers. And if we as black people can't do it, we don't have a job either. Okay? Now, here's what I do when I have these all white male groups. So you're going to have to play the roles here. All right, we're going to ask these two white men to stand right here, please. <laughs> all right, they were in college together. They were best friends in college. They were roommates, they were the same fraternity, <clears throat> best men at each other's wedding, and godfather to each other's children. One is brighter than the other. Which one is the brighter? All right, that's the brighter one. Okay. Whenever he moves up in the corporation, he always makes sure that his friend what? Moves up with him. Okay. <clears throat> now let's have this black woman right here to stand, please. <clears throat> Yes, would she stand? Yeah, do it. All right. This black woman is the secretary to the one who's not very bright. Everybody in this corporation, though, knows that if a job has to be done or anything about that job, who has the answer to that job? She does. All right. Now I ask for the 30 year old white woman to please stand. So, 30 year old white woman, please stand. This is the. <laughs> All right, Stan, this is the 30-year-old white woman who runs her own company and gets contracts through outsourcing. You see? See those outsourced contracts? Contracts for buying toilet paper for the city schools, 
contracts for buying paper for the cities. Do you see what I'm talking about? Those outsourced contract for doing the janitorial services, contract for repairing the roof, doing the electrical wiring, those outsourced contracts. She has several of those outsourced contracts. She knows, though, if she messes up two days, she'll not get a new contract. So she says, I only tell people the day they mess up is the day they're gone. That gives her some backup to keep that contract. Now, she tells the bright one over here, this white male, very bright, been out of work six months, I'm going to give you the contract, but you have to understand the day you mess up is the day you're out. You can bring one person with you. Whom are you going to bring with you? That's a bright white man, isn't it? Thank you very much. Now, the, the message there is black, young black people recognize that for the first time in modern history since Reconstruction, if you have the skills, you can have the one and make the one because it is now what you know, not who. Some dumb white men choose their friend. And everybody in the audience says, oh! because they know that within that first day, they'll be what? Now, how many times do you think he's going to choose his friend when he's been out of work six months and then work for two days and then out again? Here's, here's how I want to close. <clears throat> There's a whole system. <clears throat> <Let's see. clears throat> Presently, our industry faces the reality of demographic changes. Industrial and institutional downsizing have caused us to look carefully at market share. How do you make money? How do you keep yourself on top? The diverse workforce helps you to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. There are principles three of them, Inter, intra group, this is in your office, that means between the staff members in your room, <coughs> excuse me, inter group in the organization, extra group, the community. Do you make full utilization of all the people with whom you have to work in your little office? Or do you see some people is not worthy of making a contribution? So for the first time, <coughs> excuse me, these white managers are going to have to look at you to see what your contribution can be in their staff because if you don't produce, they can't produce. If they don't use all the skills you have, they won't make it. <coughs> now, I'm talking about systems, and you need to spend some time reading general systems theory, because that will tell you how things work. So there's an intra-system, inter-system, extra-system, and they all have to work together. If they don't work together, you don't have what we call systemic congruence. In many organizations, you have systems that 
you have a confluence, that is, things come together, but they run in parallel lines. Parallel lines never touch. They never intersect. And that reality is what makes many of our corporations fail. They don't interact with each other and share resources. But the new job in the 21st century says, you don't have all these tiers, you have projects. And people work on a project, finish it, break up and go someplace else. Work on another project, finish it, break up and go someplace else. The only way you will have a job is you have to have the skills necessary to get one of those projects or to be on one. As black people, we've got to go down <clears throat> to the offices that put out contracts. You have got to, excuse me, you've got to make sure that you understand how to fill out the papers to make the contract. You've got to know how to do the estimation of what your costs are. If you understand systems and systems theory, then you can plan what you're doing more succinctly. If you don't know how to do it, there are many young black masters in business administration who know how to. Buy you one and sit down and write the contract. Don't be so proud <clears throat> that you won't take a contract because you think that's not good enough for me. Do you know how much money that the man who has the contract that supplies toilet paper to the city makes? He don't even live in Manhattan. He lives miles out in the suburbs with a big beautiful mansion and the only thing he does is buys toilet paper from the wholesaler and brings it and distributes it to the schools and the municipal organizations here in the city. Now, some of you would be too ashamed to say that you distribute toilet paper, okay? But it's better to distribute it than be cleaning up it, cleaning it up, <clears throat> okay? They have thousands of contracts down there, all kinds of contracts. Now, just because you put your name in doesn't mean that you're going to get it because there are games that are played and you're in competition with other people. But what you have to do is you have to monitor who gets the contracts, what their bids were, when that was delivered, and so forth. And when you find that's an appreciable difference between the numbers of minorities getting contracts and whites, white males, then scream and holler, close the city down. Let me share something with you about Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia, all black, everybody in Richmond's black, mayor, everybody's black, put into its own city council's regulations that a third of the contracts, just a third, that's not greedy, when everybody in the city's black paying taxes are all black, okay, a third would go to black companies. <clears throat> they carried that all the way to the Supreme Court and said it's not fair. Now when you look, it took, it was tied up in the courts like five or six years. When you could see the number of black people that earned money, now these are people that put their bid in, <clears throat> did the construction, passed the state's laws, and was the quality, and all the things for bridge building, all the things that they did, they were perfect. There was nothing wrong with it. So they had the skills. After that law changed, less than 1% of the contracts went to minority people. Now, the people in Richmond should be up in what? Yes. You see, if anybody says anything about Jews, they're dead. They're dead. But you can talk about black people, you can kill black people off, you can do anything with black people, and we just say, well, we'll just wait until it's over. We have to take responsibility for our own future. If we don't claim our neighborhoods, educate our children, we'll be dead. We won't exist. We won't exist. 
the 21st century is going to be a time when community life is the center focus. Number two, jobs will be within those community facilities. Who owns them? Do we own them or does somebody that lives someplace else own them that looks differently from us? Number three, <clears throat> there are many skills and trades that are dying out because no one is willing to do the apprenticeship work necessary to learn how to do them. And we are letting our 90 not learn what Booker T. Washington had to teach them. We're all trying to be the elite 10% of, of uh, Du Bois, the talent to 10. We need both. Number four, community action that in ties up the system in the court system is the only way to force change within the system. Every time they say, no, you have to have it right in there, asking it in a different way that ties them up and keeps them from carrying out the task. Do you know what would happen if you had road construction ready to go and you kept it tied up for six months? The people cannot afford to have their equipment tied up for six months while you have things going through the courts. So someone will come to you in the middle of the night and say, how much do you want to change it? And you say, we want 20% of the action. You got it. That's how it works. Magnum magnus lavat. One hand washes the other. White people understand that. That's the only thing they understand. But you have to be willing to get in there and wash in that basin with them in order to get your part of the share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, take, I'll take questions. I'll take questions. One moment. Uh, Dr. Nichols will take uh, just a few minutes of questions and then we're going to close with the video collage that Minister Brown prepared. Uh, some of you came in late so you were not able to see uh, what he prepared, uh, a very really magnificent piece, an update on the trial featuring footage from C. Vernon Mason, Stephen Pogonis, um, uh, all the, d the defendant attorneys, as well as attorney Alton Maddox. So we're actually going to close with that after just uh, maybe 10 minutes or so of questions. Do we have any questions? Okay. <laughs> well, we, I think we can. That the old boy or old girl network is still in operation and that the managers of managers are still at the game. Um, how can we uh, bypass that? That's number one. And two, um, it seems that even with your analysis, we are being sent back to the system to be high-tech slaves. What can we do at this time to create entirely for ourselves by ourselves with land because we have never mentioned land we're still dealing with an analysis that is just labor and not accounting for land so um what can we do around that that's the second question and three um you are correct about the fact that they are coming back to the cities and so on but we are not entirely blind about those things. So if we are very good at analyzing something, and we've been doing that for a very long time, why can't we have a problem-solving concept to deal with that? Imagine about My reality is we have to operate within the system unless we're going to make our own system. That's why I said, <clears throat> twofold. You have to get the contracts that the city of New York puts out. 
you have to demand your portion of those contracts because we live in New York. We don't live someplace else. You pay taxes here and the money is to be made in that system. If the people who do not look like us did not own the stores in our community, then you would have an economic base for the beginning of a middle class within the black community. How much money do you think we spend in non-black stores in our own community? When you look at any other ethnic group, the money turns over in their community six to seven to eight to nine to ten times. Our money turns over once. We get it and we give it to somebody else. Okay? So it isn't that we don't know. We have to begin to take action and make steps. Right. Now the second part <clears throat> to going back to be the high-tech slaves. Yes, that's true that many people work in these computer pools and they're the high-tech slaves. But the people who run the high-tech pool have a contract from someone else to run that pool. In Washington, D.C., we have young black people who own their own companies and run these pools. Why can't you do it here in New York? Those contracts are let. I'm saying there's a gold mine down in that city hall in terms of where those contracts are. Why do you think that they let Mayor Washington die rather than giving him the treatment that he needed there in Chicago? because he was changing the way the what was being distributed. That's right. And the game they played was, rather than let one black come back in and continue the same process, they pitted two blacks against each other and the white man came back and Daly will be there until his grandchildren come into power. The contracts are there. That's where you have the money. You cannot go to Africa because Africa is is poverty-stricken. They are so under the influence of the colonial imperialism that they can't even reap the benefits from their own ore. And the last thing that the Congress passed about dealing with Africa was to be able to go to Africa and get the man who's in charge to sign a paper to give all the mineral rights to that company or to that group of people. That just recently passed. You didn't hear any big noise about that, did you? That's why Clinton is over there. Why do you think he's over there? And they will do the same thing they've done in Nigeria. 100 people will have a beautiful home in England around the Lake of Zurich, around the Lake of Switzerland, okay, uh, Lausanne, and the rest of the country will go to shambles. You have contracts in this city, what percentage of those contracts for all kinds of work do we have in the black community? Then that's wrong, isn't it? Because you pay what percent of the taxes for the city? That's what you have to ask yourself. Now the whole issue of land, I'm very much for land. But you have to recognize that Africa has a lot of land, but somebody else owns the productive capacity to produce from the land. Okay? What we have lost in farmland that belong to black people is because people living in Chicago, in New York, in Detroit, in Washington, D.C., were told by white land speculators coming from the South, you deserve your share of the money for the property that's down there. You've got relatives working on the land. It was bought by slaves and bought to be kept within the family into perpetuity. But they did what to the rules? Came to you in New York and said, do you need a new car? Here's $6,000. Give me your portion of the land. Then they forced through the court that the land would be what? Sold to pay them their $6,000. Did the people in the, in the South have the $6,000 to pay it? Did the bank give them a loan for $6,000 to pay it? No. So the land went for auction, and it sold for the 6000 That's because we did things that were against our best interests that our slave forebearers had paid for. So the whole issue of land is contingent upon what can you produce from the land. 
okay? Just to have land and no capital goods and no products that you can produce from it is worthless. You have to have the capital. The only way we can get the capital living in Harlem, in New York City, is to get the money through the what? Through the contracts. You haven't heard me all evening. I'm very upset about that. You get the money through what? You have to monitor every damn contract that comes through that office and find out who gets it, how much they pay for it, and who's kissing whom. You know what I'm talking about, to get that contract. So that you can break those networks up and get your share of the contracts or close the city. That's the only way that you can manage it. The money's not going to fall from someplace else. We're not going to create factors. Let me, let me give you another example. Um, um, uh, Minister Farrakhan made a decision that he was going to take one of the things that black people spend most of their money on and put it into supermarkets. Soap and toothpaste. He had everything ready to go. But there were a group of people that said no. And what happened to the whole project? Okay. You have to have their contracts. Now the problem, uh, I, th what, the third one was, um, I wasn't clear about the third problem. Yeah. I answered them. We'll just take two more questions, and then we're going to move right into the documentary. Uh, into the document, uh, documentary. Uh, Dr. Nichols will be here for a while, too, if you want to speak with him one-on-one. -on -one. But uh, we'll take two more questions. This brother right here. Yes, sir. All right, um, Dr. Nichols, um, first I want to thank you for the timely dissertation you gave us about um, black men and the dilemma that we face um, in the upcoming 21st century, um, Ashe, as far as that goes. Um, but more importantly, or well, not more importantly, but I also like some book titles. Um, and, you know, you mentioned about systems and systems theory, and I like to, um, you know, bring myself up to par on those things. What, is there any books that you could recommend, or did you author any books on these subjects?
Okay. There are many books. That you just have to go to the library or to, a, to one of the bookstores, and you're looking for general systems theory. Anything that you see a title in that says systems of systems theory, systems operations, those are the basic books. Now, Bertha Lanfi, Ludwig von Bertha Lanfi, B E R T A, Bertha, Land, L A N, Fi, F E E. All right, Ludwig von Bertha Lanfi is the person who wrote that book in Germany in 1929 on general systems theory. He got his ideas from Leibniz, L E I B N I T Z, Leibniz who wrote the monad, M-O-N-A-D, in 16-something. The monad tells you how systems work from a philosophical perspective. Betalanfi's book puts it into, into action. The Third Reich, under Hitler, used this technology, okay? And when I was in school, the way I learned about it was I was looking at the systems that was used to take product, take a cargo from all over Germany to a designated point in Poland to be disposed of. And they talked about how the, the troop trains had to come first, how the supply trains had to go next, and they had to keep putting the cargo off to the side tracks. They had to worry whether the cargo would spoil or not spoil. The cargo was what? Yes, Jews going to the Holocaust. Another part of systems theory was how long can you burn the grates in the ovens and not burn them out? If you run those grates 24 hours a day, they will burn out. So they had to figure through systems that they could run the ovens for 20 hours, let them cool for four and run for 20 and cool for four, and they could keep them longer than if they burned them 24 hours, 24 hours, 24 hours, because they couldn't replace them. The, the plants were being bombed, and they couldn't replace the grapes. Now, that's how I learned. It's a horrible way to learn about it. But systems and systems theory is how all these things work. There's an intrasystem, an intersystem, and an extrasystem. When you learn how that works at the simplest level, you got it from that point on. Okay. Uh, doctor, we have a, well, to my, in my view, this is probably one of the most uh, racist towns in the world, New York City, that we all live in. Uh, sh are you suggesting that based on the direction that we go to uh, in terms of getting the contracts that we cancel the voting process? Because uh, very simply, it hasn't really worked very much for us. Uh, we had a, a mayoral candidate in the, in the name of Al Sharpton that we pushed towards uh, becoming the mayor, and they just... Uh, ripped up the uh, numbers and said, uh, you know, whatever we came up with is no good. We also attempted to uh, create our own uh, party in the state of New York. They just tore that up and said, well, that's no good also. So based on what I'm hearing from you is that if the voting process, well, if I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that we should directly go directly towards the money and just not even worry about the voting process, or what do you think? It cannot always be either or. It has to be both and. But the most important thing that was said this evening was the man told you that next first Thursday, where to be? Okay? Next fr first Wednesday, where to be? And my point is this. Those organizations that he's, the, the, where they're going for the meetings, they have people that volunteer to serve on committees. The way you learn how something works is you volunteer to work on those committees. And whatever they want you to do, long as you can sit in there and hear what's going on, if it's type up the minutes or whatever it is, or take out the garbage, do it. Now I'm going to share something with you that's very personal and then I'm going to be through. When I went to the National Institute of Mental Health in 1969, I was one of the few black PhDs that had a position that was like in charge of something. I wasn't in charge of much, but I was in charge of something. 
Okay? Okay? Now, the way we cracked that system was I put, you know, when you have these grants that are for several hundred thousand dollars, like the hospitals all around here have all these grants to study something, okay, and make the money. Those grants are written up, and then people have to review the grants. Well, you don't know how to write a grant if you've never read one. So the first thing I did was to put black people on committees to review the grants. You don't get paid for it. They pay your hotel, and that's it, but that's all. Okay? That's all they pay. But Lord, what happens in terms of what you learn from reading 50 grants by the top people in the country all bidding against each other for money? You get a chance to see what all 50 of them are thinking and why they failed and didn't get the grant and who did get the grant, what was in there, and you know how then to do what? Write your own grant. <clears throat> Serve on those committees and see how they make an assessment and evaluation of those contracts. A part of the contract is what have you done in the past? A part of the contract is how much capital equipment do you have? How much money can you be loaned from the bank? All of these are things that are technical in terms of how you make those contracts. But sitting here, we couldn't pull one together because we don't know how to do it. The only way you're going to know is to be at that meeting, volunteer and get on those committees. And in terms of the vote, they have stolen our vote always. We know that. Don't even worry about that. But the number of people in one city, if you're Korean, you couldn't change the vote, could you? But the Korean community in this community holds a lot of money, don't they? And they can buy some things, can't they? Like some votes or whatever they want. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Edwin Nichols, yes. Thank you very much. But you must always ask yourself, when you read history, I do it in two ways. The first thing I do is I say, what is the overstatement that is being made by the author? And then I always look for the <coughs> covert agenda. What, what is the purpose of him having written this text? See, the text material is the overt. We are talking about the Vietnam War. We are talking about whatever they're talking about. But then you look at the covert agenda, and it may be to suggest that there was a, a valid reason for having done what they did. It's a justification. Sometimes it's an apology. There are different things that are, are the motivating factor. But if you're to glean from what is written covertly, you must understand covertly what was their agenda, so you don't get swallowed up. So there are many texts that talk and address the issue of slavery and uh, the economics of the South and Reconstruction, all those eras and, and statements. The material can be factual, but what is the motivation for having done it is what you must be clear about. And in that way, you can see the nuance in the way they write, the way they address paragraphs, and the way you come up with an overall feeling that this is what, oh, I feel this way about it. And you don't know why you feel that way about it. You feel that way about it because he's written it at a covert level so that you would come out feeling that way. Because you can take the same set of facts, mm -hmm. we know about statistics, mm -hmm. and you can come up with anything you want. So your task as a student is to see the overt statements and read them. But to always ask yourself, what is the covert agenda? What is underneath this? Why is he doing this? And what is he trying to sell me so that you can be clear about what's going on? So that's what I suggest to young people as you look at the myriad of textbooks that are available to you to read and to understand. And as you can see here in this library, there are people from all perspectives talking about all kinds of things. But as you read them so you don't get swallowed up by their propaganda, you must always look to see why did he write it? What is the covert agenda? What is he really putting out there for me to, to see? 
then you have to make an assessment and evaluation of whether it's valuable to you or not. <coughs> and that's, uh, that's the critical analysis of the material. Okay. Uh, I'm Eugene Ridge. Uh, Dr. Nichols, uh, uh, we're discussing the economics of slavery. I'd like to ask you a few questions. What did uh, Europe gain from the enslavement of Africa? Number one. Well, as uh, you know, and others who've heard me lecture on other occasions, I'm always concerned about axiology, which is the study of values. And if you take my supposition that the highest value for the European is the object for its acquisition, then slavery represented an object of economic value. So the manpower of the African slave was an economic good or an economic object which enhanced, developed, and made Europe rich. So from my perspective, the, what Europe gained from the enslavement of African people was it gained the object of economic wealth that made it um, great in terms of the rest of the world. Um, can you, can we look at um, some of this wealth? Um, uh, can we identify some of the objects of its wealth, for an example? Well, if you look at the United States when the um, pilgrims and the founding fathers and so on arrived, Mm -hmm. uh, there were vast forests, and in order to grow crops, you need to clear the land. Mm -hmm. Well, if anyone in the audience has ever removed a stump, then you have some idea of how difficult it was <coughs> to remove an acre of forest land to make it for cultivation of crops. Mm -hmm. Now remember they were doing this manually with tools that were dull and at best they might have a mule or a horse to help to do a part of the labor. But that's the removal of one stump now you have stumps and rocks that have to be cleared. So the fact that you can look out over vast areas that you know previously were forest areas, and it's now all cleared land of 300 acres, and they're plowing it, and not breaking the plow with the rocks in the land, gives you some clue as to how much energy was necessary to expend to accomplish that task. See, if you leave Washington, D.C., and you go to uh, George Washington's plantation just south of here, and you see all that area that's open, but around it is all that forest land. That area, too, was forest land at one time. So how much energy was necessary to accomplish that? And those are the things that it is the best way for me to explain what was done and how much it really cost in terms of human effort to accomplish those goals and uh, objectives. So that's, for me, an example, just the clearing of the land, how much energy was necessary to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. Then you had blacks that had knowledge of rice growing, and they had to go into the swamps and clear out the snakes and alligators and all that sort of thing, and then arrange dams irrigation, and levees irrigation. and irrigation to make it work. Well, you know, how much, how many hands and how many hours did, how many hands have to take to do that? And the point that is, is not understood is the diet of the slaves was by no means enough to give full nourishment, to say nothing of replenishing 
the uh, amount of energy expended <coughs> in food because food was scarce. So we see that slaves, the life expectancy of a male slave was nine years, and they died. Now that's why so many had to be brought into the country. Because if you've worked from the time you were about 15 to 25, 26, 27, 28, <coughs> you didn't make it much beyond that. So when you had a black male slave that had been a slave all of his life and he was 30, then he was old. He was old. And of course, that enhanced our gene pool because those that survived procreated. Those that didn't mm -hmm. lost their genetic pool. Dr. Nichols, are you saying that the average life expectancy of the African once brought here and put to work was around 30 and that they generally only lasted about nine years? Yes, if you take, uh, when you take a slave that was brought to Virginia and sold, in the first four years you had top labor from him. Fifth year he begins to deteriorate. So what we do is we fatten him, oil him, grease him, and sell him to South Carolina. And he works in South Carolina for the next two years, and they sell him then to Georgia. Now, when the man buys him in Georgia, it is known that within a short time he will be dead. So when slaves, slaves went to Georgia, they knew that they were going to be worked to what? Death. Death. Because they were at a point in which they didn't survive. Now, we don't talk about that. But that's very important to know because you talk about grandmother who lived to be 80 and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. All those people who lived all those different years. But you don't talk about all the others who didn't live. Mm -hmm. They're dead. They didn't survive. If you go again to uh, George Washington's place here at Mount Vernon, uh, the biggest offense that was punished uh, on the slave plantation was the stealing. What they do is they don't give you the prepositional phrase <clears throat> of food. They stole food because they were hungry and didn't have enough to eat. Very poorly treated. Yes. And malnutrition was, of course, great. Dr. Dr. I'd like to ask you a question about the, uh, I'd like to ask you a question about the corn diet. Well, the, I, you know, I, I've been doing some research about the corn diet and found out uh, some, some things that were happening because of the corn diet. You know. mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? Well, um, I know that if you stay on, if you, if you look at white people in, like West Virginia, mm -hmm. where they have how many grits for breakfast or grits for breakfast, and the, they have the, um, the red oil and grease that comes from the smoked ham, uh, they have extreme malnutrition. Their gums go, their teeth go, uh, and all these kinds of things. Uh, I think what helped black people to survive was the fact that when you're on the slave plantation and they are chopping, which is the expression for weeding the main crop, there were weeds that would be weeds for northerners, but become vegetables for consumption of the black people, like poke salad. Poke salad in the north is a weed, but in the south it's, it's a viable green. So many of the greens gave the nutrition. Collard mm -hmm. greens are very high in vitamin C and many other vitamins mm -hmm. and minerals. So if you ate the collard yes, greens, yes, yes. you see what I'm talking about? <laughs> so if you look at the indigenous diet, it was a healthy diet. Balanced diet <clears throat> gave you protein, or the beans and the peas that people ate and so forth. But just to have stayed on one diet, sometimes it was, was detrimental. Now, there mother may have been other products or, or uh, other advantages to some of the grains of the corn. You might share with us. But the, to make corn <clears throat> last over the winter or to go from here in Washington all the way out to the Western Reserve, which is Ohio, 
if you're going to take something, then you, 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 you take corn, you soak it in lye, which makes it hominy, dry it, and grind it, and you have hominy bricks. And they'll last for two, three years. And there are not many things that will get into them, like in flour, you get little worms, and you don't get very much into grits. Well, I need a point of clarification, Dr. Nichols, because you said that the greatest offense was to steal uh, from the slave master, but did the slaves grow the collard green crops and give everything to the slave master, or didn't they take some for themselves? No, if you took anything for yourself that was stealing, and that was punishable. Now, what some people had was if you had a slave master that was gracious, you had a small patch of land in which you could grow your own things. But the things they didn't want very often were weeds, and black people ate them. What, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about a, a, a slave master, an overseer, who did not allow people to eat? How, how are... No, what it is, is we have a... You see, you have to remember again, now back to my axiology and epistemology. Mm -hmm. The way you know something in Western culture, epistemology, is through counting and measuring. So food allocations were counted and measured in terms of how many pounds of that you got for a week. Pounds of beans, pounds of this, and it was all measured to last for a long period of time until the next harvest. Well, if you come, if you live in Africa, you don't have to deal with seasons. Food grows all the time. So you have a group of people who are accustomed to being able to eat fresh food at any time, who are coming into a place where you have fresh food in the spring, maybe in the summer, and then that's about it. And you've got to then store food to survive for the winter. Well, those are two conflicting cultures about food, food storage. And if you're accustomed to thinking that it's going to be there all the time, and the winter comes and your slave master has not controlled the quantity of food, he cannot then have slaves around next spring, because there will be enough food for them. So that's why the food is rationed as it is. But the point that people don't understand is that they weren't stealing food just to have parties. They were stealing food because they had worked physically so hard they were hungry. And the slave master was saying, that's all you're going to get. Well then, how, what innovative things can you do to do things differently? Well, one of the things was to kill uh, an animal that the, the master didn't want, a possum. Well, you, you didn't have to have a gun to kill a possum. You bludgeon a possum. You can smoke it and keep its meat for months. And it's high in protein. So things that others didn't want became viable as a part of survival for the slave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Nichols, I've done some re uh, little research on, mm -hmm. on blood pressure mm -hmm. of uh, Africans as they were coming over on, on, the, on the ships. And, uh, Somehow they attribute the, uh, the blood pressure due to the salt content of the Africans. And then, do, you, do, you know anything, do you know anything about that? Well, there's a most recent study that comes out of um, researchers. And it was published in one of the Philadelphia newspapers. Mm -hmm. What they did was to go to, you know, people do the counting and measuring. Mm -hmm. So they went to Africa and went to the areas from which the majority of the American slaves were taken and looked for heart disease, blood pressure, and things like that in those indigenous populations, <coughs> and found it to be normal. Then they came and they said, well, it's because of the diet. We eat too much salt as black people. So they looked at black people who weren't using salt. They said, well, it's the food. So they looked at those blacks that were eating Western food, no salt, and white, still high cholesterol, high blood pressure. They finally factored, it, factored the whole thing down to the reality that it is stress. Black people experience many of the illnesses that we do because we're in a state of chronic stress. And the stress is the fact that we live under institutional racism. 
And if you think as black people, and particularly as black men, can you name a day that you walked out and you didn't get some tinge or some little cringing feeling about some form of racist behavior? And I'm saying if you were the black working as the CEO someplace, how many times do they, does the, does the guard in the building want to see your papers? just to remind you that where's your past coming from the African experience, the slave experience. Right. How many times do you go someplace and you question whether the slight that you receive from a clerk is because you're black or is it some other reason? So it's the fact that we live under this chronic stress that we're dying in the numbers in which we are and from the illnesses that we have because our original gene pool wasn't this dimension. Uh, Dr. Nichols, originally we started with um, trying to learn the how to assess and evaluate black history. Now that we've got this uh, tremendous amount of history that we're aware of, can you suggest any ways of how we can begin to identify? There are many black historians that have done excellent jobs, but what happens is when you take the information, uh, it does not <coughs> give credence to what whites want to continue to believe. And the best example I can give you is we were just downstairs in one of the rooms and we saw a painting, classical mm -hmm. painting, of the Moorish chief. Right. And we talk about Orthello the Moor. Well, that's always a black character. And we see all the uses of Moor, meaning black. Now, three years ago, uh, National Geographic did a special issue on the Moors of Spain. Well, when you look through there and all the data that they give you, and the first statement that they make is that Moors were not black Africans. <coughs> well, then, what were they? Well, they they were they were white. Ah, uh, how much cognitive dissonance can that create? But yet, no one challenged National Geographic to say, why was they saying that the Moors were not a, a group of black people? Now you have to ask, that's the overt statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at the covert agenda. <clears throat> when you look at the rest of the article, it talks about all the things that the Moors did while they were in Spain. Okay? In Europe, people didn't bathe, so the, those Moors went in there and put some public baths in there, so everybody take a bath two, three times a day, wash some of that <coughs> hunk off of you. Okay? Mm -hmm. They had public libraries. They had all forms of government that, and other facilities that people just had no idea for the rest of Europe. It was just an unknown. They had flush toilets, had, you know, public, indoor pub, plumbing. And the rest of Europe is still using slap jars. Totally, See what I'm saying? Totally use underwear. <laughs> yeah, that's another, that's another point, yes, yes. No underpants on. Okay? And, and to wash themselves after they urinate and defecate. That's what we talk about. Because in Europe, what happens, happens. It might get clean, might not. Okay? So these are things that we don't that you don't want the European culture to see today. Uh, that these contributions were made to bring civilization. Okay? Now, that's a very that's that's one way of looking at that. It's it's that you have always to ask what is the hidden agenda. You cannot say that blacks had a greater civilization than whites, because that defeats institutional racism. So we have to make more white, or at least high yellow. The tremendous psychological damage to the European in order for them to outright not tell the truth about oh, the Oh, no, no, their belief system is that they really believe it. They believe it. They believe it. See, the ones who are actually writing the documentation right. fantasize that it's not true. Let me, let me give you another example. Let, let, ask the question, I'll give you an example with, with the Thomas Jefferson we'll situation. Start, we'll start now. Yeah. yeah, okay. okay. Right. All right. Whether people who write things actually believe what they write. Okay. We have to understand that people who write these histories mm -hmm. very often believe what they write themselves. 
okay? They, they, they work very hard to make it real for themselves. Now, they do what I call acts of cognitive dissonance. They distort. So let's go back to the Moors. What they will say is that the Moors are Arabs. But you have Moors and Arabs, the two different groups of people. See, when, the, when you have black people living in North Africa all the way to ancient time, so let's look at the Christian wave movement of Christianity. Christianity goes across the north of Africa and into Ethiopia before it gets to Rome. <coughs> You see what I'm talking about? It gets to Greece, but long before it gets to Rome, it's all over North Africa. All right? Now, we don't understand that because we don't have many Christian churches in North Africa now, but that's because in 711, the Arabs came with Islam, <coughs> but the Arabs were a small group of people who married into, brought with them the existing people. The people who were already there were these Moors. Okay? And they united together and brought more black blood into Spain. <coughs> you see? and they conquered and did all the things that they did. Now let's look at the idea of people taking information and data and not, not, under, not being able to see. They're not able to see because they're blinded by their racism. In other words, if you look at uh, the newest information that we have about Thomas Jefferson, okay? Thomas Jefferson, we now know, indeed did father <coughs> some of those children. Now, they're only giving credit for one, but there are several others that were fathered. Now, the point that I'm making is the authors that wrote about this have always said, many of them, oh, it's impossible. He could not have. They've talked about his character as an as a, as a upstanding white male. As, look at what he wrote about slavery and all these things to justify. <coughs> but no one could explain to you how you got these mulatto children on this plantation. Well, it could have been his other relatives. It could have been a whole lot of other people that lived 20 miles away. Well, 20 miles away, why would one white man ride 20 miles to have sex with a slave on another plantation when he has sl slaves on his own plantation? What would be the advantage of riding 20 miles to have sex? So you see what I'm saying is that their whole sense of reality changes when it deals with <coughs> things that they're convinced of in a racist way. McLaughlin talks about uh, this whole situation, and he said, we are besmirching the character of Thomas Jefferson with this nonsense and foolishness. And here he is with no knowledge of genetics, no knowledge of DNA, relying on some clerk that typed something up to go on national television and try to say that it's not true. You see? So what I'm sharing with you is that people hold on to myths because if you don't hold on to it, then there's no white supremacy. You can't justify treatment of other people. But let me give you something else here very quickly. Isms give privilege, all right? So if you're, you're the Sesame Street generation, so our word for today, children, is privilege, all right? If you have sexism, then who gets the privilege in a sexist society? Males because they're male. What is required to get the privilege? Or if you go right down to the minimum requirement, it's that you have a penis. That's all you have to have to get the privilege in a sexist <coughs> society. All right, we're a racist society. Let's look at white. Well, if we have many blacks who look white and work white, but the moment it's find out that they're not white, they lose the privilege, you see? Now, we live in a sexist, racist society. Who gets double privilege? White males. Who loses double privilege? Black females. Now, do you want to give up your privilege? Of course not. Let's put it at its basis, count, measure, object. Economics. White male high school graduate. $26,000 a year. Black female high school graduate, same high school diploma, 16000 So what is the advantage of <coughs> double privilege? $10,000. Are you likely to give up $10,000? Now, single privilege, 
black men. Well, you don't get anything for being black, but you get a privilege for being male. So as black men, we earn 20,000. Well, white women, what privilege do they get? They're white, but they lose privilege because they're women. There's 18,000. So you have here one privilege for gender, one for race, and there's like 20,000 and 18,000. But when you look at loss of double privilege and gain of double privilege, it's $10,000 difference. So you can see that it's important to keep institutional racist thinking going at any cost. And the cost is cognitive dissonance. Nine years he's mm -hmm. to death. Maybe we should continue along that vein. Let's look <coughs> at the time he's put on the ship to, to damage psychologically okay. uh, those that were lost mm -hmm. on the ship. Can you explain uh, that experience, that ship experience, okay. Okay. and the damage mm -hmm. done there? Okay, all right. Let's um, look at the experience of the Middle Passage. First of all, um, you as an individual are very happy and complete in a society that nurtures you. <coughs> you have been physically carried. There's a lot of psych psychological data now about touch and what it means to the development of children. African children are placed on the backs of their mothers and carried naked, right next to the naked skin of their mother, which gives a maximum amount and efficiency of touch. Mm -hmm. Now, with that whole idea of touch, they intellectually uh, have a higher IQ and many other things. Mm -hmm. So here is a culture of highly intellectual people, very comfortable, very complete within their culture and society and uh, making tremendous strides in terms of learning, understanding, and so on. What learning, what understanding? Well, if you go to the people of Mali and you read the Silver Fox, I mean the, the, the what was, I'm blocking on the name of the book, the, 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 the Washington yeah. Fox, mm -hmm. you'll we'll get it in a moment. I know. Or read any of those, then you know that they understood more in, in the understanding of, the, of, uh, of what is out there in the stratosphere than our people with all of their microscopes, uh, telescopes, and everything else that they can find. Right. So how did they know it? Well, it was because they had an advanced civilization. Now, you take people like that and you capture them. Now, you have to realize what fright comes over an individual who is captured, physically abused, and carried to the, from in, in country to be placed in the slave castle pits. If you've ever gone into any of those, there is no light in there at all. All right, and the stench is horrendous. The floor slopes so that the blood, feces, and urine can flow down to the outer end of that, in, of that, in, of that uh, enslaved dungeon. We know, psychologically, that solitary confinement or confinement in darkness. In other words, if I take you and put you into a dark closet, that within a very short time, you'll begin to hallucinate. So here are hundreds of people in total darkness for a month, or two months at a time until enough people are collected to get onto a slave ship and be sold. And they don't know what's going to happen to they them. They have no idea about anything. And it's totally dark. Not a pin of light comes into that place. Now, wonder what that must be like. OK? Now you're going to take them out of there, shackled, and put them onto a ship. There are different ways of packing the numbers of people that you're going to put onto the ship. Because you make your money on the number that arrive. And the perception was, the more you put on, the greater probability is that you'll have a higher number when you, when you get to the other shore. Mm -hmm. Because already from their experience, they knew that 
major portions of the cargo could just simply die in the middle passage and have to be thrown overboard. Now, if you pack people next to each other, like you lay spoons together, yes. that's how they were packed. All right, now we're on this ship, packed down in the hole, packed between rafters. You see what I'm saying, the upper and lower, how close they were packed together. You, really, you couldn't stand. You couldn't really sit up. A lot of the pictures depict them sitting up. There wasn't that much room. Mm -hmm. You 36 had to. 36 inches. 36 inches. Three feet high. All right. About five, seven average. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now pack people into that space. That's not one person sitting in that three feet high. Mm -hmm. You got people laying on top of each other just like spoons lying together in that space. Now we are now 10 hours out to sea. And the ocean is pitching and tossing this ship. People get seasick. Well, you are chained in this place. What's going to happen when you get seasick? Where is the vomit going? OK? You had amoebic dysentery. And you have hot feces and hot blood pouring out of your rectum. Where is it going? when you're all chained there and lying on top of each other. Mm. 10 hours out, somebody has to urinate. No one says, would you be kind enough to unchain me and let me go forward and please urinate? Where did you urinate? Now let's just take the vomit, the feces, the urine. And the ship is going to roll forward and roll back. So you're collecting it from everyone as it rolls forward, and it's going to roll right back over you, and then roll forward with some more. What do you think the conditions were like in there? Now add to that body odor from not being able to wash, to brush your teeth, and you're there for three months. Suppose you had claustrophobia. Can you say to the person, oh, I'm just too claustrophobic. I can't. Please don't fasten me in here. What do you think happened to those people? Now, what you have is you have numbers of people physically going insane, yelling, screaming, thrashing, scratching, biting. How can you get away from them? What can you do? How can you control them? And you are all chained together. Now, you have come, you have arrived. Now, many people don't arrive. So here's someone that was next to you. This is a friend you grew up with. That person dies. They unchain them and throw him into the ocean. Oh my goodness, there's a British frigate coming. If they catch us with these slaves on here, they'll take our ship, object, highest value. We can't afford to lose the ship. They're all chained together, <coughs> throw them overboard. Chained together, they won't float. There's no evidence. If the highest value lies in the object, of course that's the appropriate thing to do. You don't want to leave, lose the ship and the stockholder's share of investment in the ship when you can go back to Africa and get another set of slaves. I must ask you this question, the same question that Dennis just asked, but it's put in a different way. Um, this was not uh, by accident, when I said by accident, this was not trial and error that they um, learned to break, uh, that they um, to confine, to control. Was, was this scientifically uh, worked out? How did the Europeans know how to break the African? To confine him? Did they keep him in the dark by accident? Were all these things that were actually planned? Did they know the results of it, etc.? <coughs> I don't think they knew the results of all of it, but when we look back, we can see the results of it based on studies that have been done since that time. I think it was just their inhumanity to man. They perceived a, a black people as animals. So there's no problem in putting a horse in a, in a dark stall or a dark room. 
So if, you're, if you see them as animals, then you treat them as animals. But they're not animals, they're human, and therefore they have all the psychological issues that humans have with being confined in a small space in total darkness. You see? Okay. But people still continue to do things in spite of the fact that they know that they're detrimental. We still continue to have people in solitary confinement in prisons today because they're members of a gang. Not that they've done anything wrong, but the assumption is if you're a member of a gang, then you will go into this uh, isolation and solitary confinement for the whole number of years you'll be here. And of course, the ramifications are the same. People go insane. Now, wh what are we talking about when we look at numbers? And let's look at who was taken from Africa and the numbers of people, as um, your study may reveal, uh, in terms of those that may have Brown, been taken. Brown, can I ask this question first? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Nichols, in, in my research, I found out that uh, the mortality rate amongst Africans that were captured and taken from the inlands of Africa to the coast was greater than the Middle Passage. Do you find that to be true? I wouldn't doubt it. I don't know it. But I would doubt it. I'd like for you to talk about it because I, I, don't, I don't have data on that. But I would not doubt it. Now, you have to understand one of the psychological reasons for that is that you're being taken from all that you know. And then, of course, what happens is people, when you're being carried at a certain point, you revolt and you fight because if you can just break loose, you can get back. Right. And of course, like they had them strung out there on that slave thing I have downstairs on, the, on that floor down there. Right. You see that thing is depicting it? Right. Well, then that's when, you take, that's when you get the biggest fighting. And of course, that's when you get the largest number of, of deaths. Yeah. That's, that's the research I found out. Yes, yes. That's what they're fighting to get loose. There's, they didn't people, people didn't go like Jews went in, in to the concentration camp. Those people fought. And that's why white people began to pay other Africans to bring them out. Mm -hmm. See? Are you saying white people initially were trying to bring out? They tried to bring them out themselves at first, like this thing that you have pictured downstairs. The, you know, the one guard at the back and one guard in the front with the, with the, on the horseback, and they're bringing some slaves out. That was, that was the image they would like to give you. But that image didn't work because, those, you know, if you've got 12 men on a, on, even you've got them chained together, mm -hmm. they'll attack you and kill you. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they were, these were warriors. These are people who are used to dying for a cause. Mm -hmm. Okay? So you have large numbers of people who are killed before you get there. But now once you get them there, you've got to put them into some kind of situation so that you can be sure that they can't do anything to you. So you, you take all their clothing off them, absolutely naked, and you put them into this dark pit until such time as you're going to take them out under heavy guard, chain them, and then care, transport them to the ship. Mm -hmm. Now once on the ship, people are terrified of them again. So they put them down into those holes, cram them in, lock them in, and keep them there. They don't take them out every day to do anything with them. Okay? Because it's too dangerous. They're too frightened. So that's how you have the large numbers that die in the Middle Passage. Mm -hmm. Now, you are now here in the United States. And I have some books over there that talk about the conditions of slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, one is dealing with the Danes in, uh, in the Virgin Islands. And this was a cargo that had come in there to be sold. Uh, what had happened was you had people with amoebic dysentery. And they didn't want to sell. They, they don't sell when they're standing up there in line. And all of a sudden, there's a, a rush of, uh, of feces because of uh, dysentery and blood coming out. Mm -hmm. So what they did in order to sell them was they took the pitch, you know, the black pitch and tar that you tar a boat with, Correct. and put that into the rectum of these men so that they wouldn't have any, any uh, flow of blood and feces from their rectum. Mm -hmm. Now. Do you know how much pitch and tar burns? If you cut yourself, how it burns? Can you imagine it? Insert it into a rectum that's raw from amoebic dysentery and blood and mucus. OK? And the joke was they sold them to the Jews on the island, because the Jews didn't realize the trick that they had played. And the joke was they sold them to the Jews. When the Jews got them to the other end of the island, they found that these people were half dead. But they'd, uh, they'd been tricked, OK? Now, my point is this. Um, if you made past all of that, 
then you had a form of humiliation that takes all of your humanity away from you. You wouldn't even do it with an animal, okay? And that's when you begin to destroy black men. Here you have a man standing there, and they're going to examine him. They examine his teeth. Well, Africans had, and still have, very good teeth and very few cavities, and you want to know why. They use a chewing stick. Well, what has the chewing stick got to do? First of all, there are secretions of chemicals from the chewing stick mm -hmm. that will even do things like keep you from triggering sickle cell. The little bit of secretion that you get is enough mm -hmm. to immunize you from, sickle, from having a sickle cell attack on that day. But beyond that, from pure dental hygiene, they are doing what we try to do with the flossing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They have this chewing stick that cleans the gums and cleans between the teeth and gets out all the plaque. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have plaque and you have strong, healthy gums, your teeth stay fine. Mm -hmm. Okay? So their teeth was not the issue. But because the perception was bigger is better, if you want animals that breed, then you put your hand down into the man's pants to feel the size of the penis and testicles because the assumption is if they're larger, he will be more able to procreate. Okay? So this is when we begin the mythology about black men and large penises. Okay? Now, if you want women that are going to breed well, you have to look to see what the European experience is. There was a point in English nobility in which the English women had been so inbred that their pelvis was too small to pass children through the, the birth canal without great difficulty. So they began to marry German princesses. That's the whole Hanoverian line of German princesses being married into English nobility because they were broad-hipped, wide pelvis, mm. and breeders, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you have that as an image, mm -hmm. the women coming off this ship, which ones are going to be the best breeders? Broad pelvis. Broad hips, big hips, and large breasts to give milk to the children. Mm -hmm. Are you beginning to understand? Yeah. Now, if you then, if that becomes the norm for what your selections are, and you inbreed these people, then what do you get as a, a, a group of black Americans today? Big hips, <laughs> broad, broad pelvis, and big tits. That's right. So why would you, why would you be disturbed? Those are the surviving genes. Yeah. You see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now. Can you imagine how humiliating it would be to have some stranger come up and put his hand all over your testicles? And think in terms of African culture. These are very sacred parts of the body. Yes. You see? Yeah. In many African cultures, you don't have masturbation mm -hmm. because you don't want to waste semen. It's a sacred gift. Mm -hmm. OK? Mm -hmm. So many of the things that are European practices that are normal within European culture are not tolerated within the African context of behavior. So here's someone going to touch the most sacred part of your body and defile it. Mm. The, 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 the cultural values were that different in Africa than in Europe? Of that course, of course. There are many, even today, if you go among the Yorubas, uh, their uh, homosexuality is not known. It was never really an, an it, it was a European kind of thing. Now, you have some people that, within any culture, that are homosexual, mm -hmm. but they didn't practice homosexuality. What would happen is, these people would be, they would be referred to as, oh, this is the reincarnation of his dead aunt so-and-so who came back. But now he may have what we would say predisposition for or be homosexual in terms of preference. But he could never express it in that culture. 
he would marry and have children. How then does the culture permit <coughs> him to express it? When they have major festivals, these are the people that would be dressed in the raffia. You remember that you saw downstairs the raffia doll? Yeah. Well, they dress up in this raffia. And they have a capacity at that time raffia. to just raffia, like regu regular raffia, the straw raffia. Mm -hmm. And that straw, they dress up in that. Oh. And they are masquerades. And they do dances and so forth and so on. Well, in that thrashing and what have you, and the men coming to control them when they're being taken over by a different spirit, their great aunt, OK? Um, then they could touch men in places that you couldn't touch at any other time, which gratifies that unmet need of a person who is, by birth, homosexual. You see what I'm saying? Yes. yes. OK? So it's satisfied at that time. Mm -hmm. And no one complains about it because it is a, it's handled spiritually, and it's handled in a ritual. Okay. Then he, after it's over, sometimes when you examine the clothing, you see sperm in the clothing. They had ejaculation because it's a, it's a frenzied kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Then they go back to their wives and their children, and they live a very uh, normal. normal life. Mm -hmm. is, is, excuse me, Dr. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, practice of a masturbation, is that a, uh, against Christian principles? Or? It's against Christian principles. Uh, it's against Jewish principles, because it's the sin. Uh, sometimes it's misnamed as the sin of onism. But that's not what Ona did. Ona just was um, greedy. He was supposed, his brother died, and he was supposed to go and sleep with his brother's wife mm -hmm. to make sure that the name was carried on. And rather, because he wanted to come back and sleep some more, yeah. at the point of ejaculation, yeah, good. got good to me. At the point of ejaculation, he pulled, he withdrew, and ejaculated on the ground, and God killed him on the spot. So the idea of coitus interruptus or something like that was referred to as onism or masturbation. It was sometimes referred to as onism. Mm -hmm. But the idea of masturbation, masturbation goes on in all cultures and with animals and so forth. But the idea in the African culture, in the indigenous African culture, is that at a certain point you begin, you get married and you have, you have sex with women. Mm -hmm. So why would you masturbate when you could have the real thing? Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you in, in terms yes. of of, uh, of, of, of display. I mean, Africans, uh, the women, their breasts were always uh, shown most of the time. They didn't look, they were not stimulated <coughs> like in the West with seeing uh, the body as a sexual object. How, how do you explain it? How do you look at that? Well, the body is conceived of for its functionality. So if you look at the breasts of the woman, what is the function of the breast? Milk, um, to to feed give feed. Nurture. nurture. So it's, it's, it's for the child. Okay? Now, in terms of relationships, people look with their eyes, and the eyes are the window to the soul. So when you're looking for a mate, you're looking into the eyes of the individual. You see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And so what we, we ascribe as physical beauty. There's an attractiveness in what you wear and how you look and so forth. But the real thing that connects us is the eye contact through the soul. Mm -hmm. OK? And then you'll hear them people talking about what a beautiful person. And when you look at the physical part, you're thinking, I don't see that. Mm -hmm. But that's not what they're seeing. You have to look into the eyes of the soul. Mm -hmm. Now, another misperception that we have about Africa, they talk about in West Africa, they have clitorectomy. Now, I'm not talking about East Africa, where they have what they call the pharaonic clitorectomy and remove the labia minoris and majoris, and then suture back together. I'm talking about where the clitoris is removed. Right. Where people say, well, why would you remove the clitoris? You can't have any sexual pleasure. Well, that's almost seen like masturbatory behavior to play with a clitoris. It's not where you have, Freud talked about a deep vaginal orgasm. Okay? Well, that's not a clitoral orgasm. So the African women, Yorubas particularly, uh, a generation ago, at marriage, would clip the clitoris because of cleanliness. Just like men who are circumcised don't have smegma, mm -hmm. women who get rid of the clitoris don't have smegma because there's nothing to keep for, to develop a, a smegma to, to uh, lubricate that little gland so it doesn't irritate. Now, how then are they satisfied? Well, they're satisfied with a deep vaginal orgasm. 
Well, now, if you're doing the shucking and jiving, and you're there for three seconds, you can't give a deep vaginal orgasm with, you know, it's, <laughs> you can't do that. You've got to, you've got to work, <laughs> put some time in, and do what you're supposed to do. See? So their whole concept of when you have, that's why they don't have sex as often as we do. They don't have sex five and six times. You know. Now, when they have sex that evening, they may have five or six rounds in an evening, but it may be a week or two weeks or three weeks before they come back to do it again. Yeah. But when they make love, they make love all night. So you might have five, six orgasms in the course of an evening till the next morning. But you're having sex because you are in love and you're making children, things like that. So this whole thing about uh, black men and their sexual prowess is not altogether um, no, the prowess is there, but it's misused. No, I mean, yes. in general, they, they, there was, there's a mystique about black men and their ability to... Of mystique. course, that's right. Well, if, there, you're, you, if this, you're working with someone to give them a deep vaginal orgasm, as opposed to a clitoral orgasm, you spend some time in bed. I like that. You can't shuck and jive. You can't, I, I really like it. You can't hit it one, two, three, and hope for the best. You, you, got, right. you got to put some energy in there. You yeah. got to spend some time, find out where those places are. Uh, Dr. Nichols, you have just explained one of the myths that have been <laughs> mysteries for a long time. <laughs> sure. There is sure. gold in that sand. That's right. That's <laughs> right. You have to spend some time there. And but, women who have had a deep vaginal orgasm, Stick with that man wherever he is. That's why you see some of these little ugly short men. You think, what on earth could he have going for him? And they got women lined up. Well, that's because they know what they're doing. <laughs> Others are just, you know, getting people ready and they, they don't carry through. Women's all excited and they're, they're ready to go home. That won't get it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I like this because we are exploring an area of, um, of, of African culture. Yes. Well, if you take a man who has had that experience mm -hmm. and grown up in that culture, and then you humiliate him on the public auction block by publicly showing people his genitals and fondling them, you can imagine the humiliation and the anger that comes from that. You see? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, what, what would be some of the other psychological damage? I mean, how... That, that results from this whole breaking, maybe we should look at the breaking process. Okay. How, how the slave was broken. Um, well, first of all, no one that speaks the same language is going to be in close proximity with anyone else. Okay? And as soon as we find two slaves that can communicate with each other, we separate them. Uh, there will be no use of drums, because drums um, talk. Now, people are trying to understand, well, how can a drum talk? Uh, the Yoruba have a, a drum that is strung. And as you press against the strings of the drum, it raises and lowers the tone of the diaphragm of the drum. And as you tap on different places, you get different sounds. Yoruba is tritonal. You have a lower tone, middle tone, upper tone. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can tap those tones. And as you say words, oracle, then you have a pattern and a tonal quality that goes with it. And there are Yorubas that can give you messages on a talking drum that is intelligible within the context of their language. So if you have people that can talk on drums, then they can transmit messages from one end of the island to the other much faster than you can by horseback and written letter or by fire signals. Mm -hmm. So their communication was much more rapid and thoroughly understood. Mm -hmm. And back to, um, uh, to you, uh, Brother Red, mm -hmm. you're talking about how was it that they're bringing these slaves out and so many were killed? Well, if I get to a place where we're sitting down and you are a white slave driver, you don't know what I'm doing, I, you just think I'm, you know, drumming, plantation, happy slaves dancing, making music and what have you, I'm sending back a message saying what? We are at the, the, the big rock of so-and-so and so-and-so, come and get us. Right. Okay, well, when we come to get you, well, we come running with our spear, 
but uh, you then fire into all of us with cannon or with other guns, and you can see how you have so many people killed. But very quickly, whites learned that, that anyone using a drum cut their hand off. Mm. Sure. That was one of the punishments for drumming. Cut the hand off? Cut it off, of course. That means that others will not drum. And you did this in a public display? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, down in New Orleans, uh, Square. Yes. Yes. All right. Now, go ahead. Uh, uh, other breaking practices. All right. Well, there was a man whose name is Dr. Lynch, who comes out of Jamaica, and he had developed a perfect technique. And I would suggest that that might be something that one would take his letter, read it, yeah. and go through it in great detail because he gave all of the methodology for it. I'm going to talk about some additional points to that breaking. Mm -hmm. One is, if two people cannot communicate with each other, here you are, other people are around you, and you're in total isolation. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been abroad in a place where you didn't <coughs> speak the language, how did you feel after several days of not being able to even ask for a drink of water or tell They won't kill you. They'll torture you. So let's look at some of the torture that was seen. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you look at Suriname, they physically took a person and put them on a hook, and the hook went into the diaphragm, up into the area of the heart, and left them with their hands tied behind their back and their feet shackled, <coughs> and let them die in that position. Can you imagine how excruciatingly painful that would be? And everyone stands around until you physically die. So there's yelling, yelling, yelling. People can't turn away from it. They can't go away from it. They have to actually watch and listen. What does that do in terms of instilling fear and in making people recognize that it's better to go along and get along than to, re than to resist? Okay. What is that doing to a person psychologically? What does that do to their psyche? It totally dehumanizes you. You have people that didn't go into depression. Okay, I'm talking about clinical depression, not just blues. Some people become psychotic. Nobody talks about the people that actually went psychotic completely. See? Then you have others that internalize all of their anger, hatred, and frustration and it becomes hypertension, heart disease, okay? Now suppose you're being forced to carry a child by the slave master. Okay. Where do you internal internalize all of your anger then as black women? Into the child. Into the child, but also into that organ that makes children. So we have high incidence of fibroid tumors among black women because in our racist society, we st they still have to do all the mothering. So in the mother organ is where all the pain gathers, where the pathology is. And that's true today. Yeah, sure. Black women. Yes. Who were sexually exploited by both black and white because they were could not choose a mate. Mm -hmm. White men uh, sexually molested them, uh, raped them at will. Mm -hmm. What is the psychological damage that was done? And then how, what is the residual of that for black men and women today? I'm a psychotherapist for more than 40 years. When you have a, a rape victim, they carry with them to their grave the experience of the rape. They'll wake up 20 years later screaming in the middle of the night, thinking that the, they're being raped again. Uh, they'll start to have sexual relations with their husband, freak out, because they have a flashback of that rape experience. Okay? Plus, they carry with them, with great depression, all of the anxiety about what happened to them. They feel unclean. They feel all kinds of things. That's one rape, one lifetime not a whole lifetime. Now let's examine the idea of rape. Um, 
Just be physical about it. Can a man insert his penis into a woman who is not ready? <coughs> in other words, when you're making love, you stimulate the woman yes. in order that she will lubricate to be ready for the insertion. Correct. If she's panic-stricken, frightened and running and screaming and thrown down on the ground, is she lubricated for penetration? No. Are the muscles relaxed for penetration? No. Okay. Then what does he do? Force himself. What does that do then? To tissue? Mm. Yes. And then he ejaculates and he's through and he's gone. Now you have the fear. Are you one pregnant, or you do, ha or do you have you caught from him the worst thing that you could catch from him that the Europeans had, which was syphilis? Mm. If a woman's raped today, the one of the biggest things she wonders is, does she got AIDS? Well, syphilis then was as AIDS is today. Yeah. Now let's take the black man who is the one who goes out and is supposed to be on these plantations to, to have white indentured women servants. And he's to make babies with them because mulatto babies sell for a higher price than black babies. OK? Mm -hmm. oh, the, the white people don't want to talk about that. But when white English women came to this country and Irish women as indentured servants, they worked for seven years. Well, the work that they did was ostensibly to pay for their passage. But the plantation owners needed a cash crop from those women. And the cash crop was to have a baby. Well, if he had sex with them, it's a white baby. White babies don't sell. But they used to bring these quote unquote big bucks onto the plantation. He'd stay a month and fertilize as many of those white women as he could within the month. They didn't know when ovulation was or anything about that, but they knew if he stayed a month and had sex with all of them during this month, most of them would be pregnant by the time he left. Okay? Now, here's the idea of the big buck. Wouldn't he be happy doing a wonderful task? No. They were treated like animals. They ran them every morning. They bathed them down in cold water and all kinds of things like that to keep them physically strong to be able to have all these different women. But what was the fear of this man in that situation? These are English women who have left prisons in England, debtor's prison. They were not <coughs> bad people, debtor's prison. But they, even if they left England as a virgin, what is the probability they would come across on the ship with the sailors as an intact virgin? So they were raped before they got here. And what do sailors carry? Mm. Yes. Mm. Now, here you are, this man, you know what syphilis does, because you've seen other people go completely crazy from syphilis, sores, everything, mm -hmm. can't have children and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got to go and have sex with all these different women, never knowing which one of them may give you your death. Mm. So you see, they weren't excited about having <laughs> all these women. There were fears that went along with the risk of what was that all about. Not only that, but culturally, um, since we've been talking about African values and morals, yes, uh, culturally, uh, that was not that was African inappropriate, point. completely inappropriate, completely inappropriate. So the image that has been projected of black men is always wanting to jump in bed. It's not accurate. and with a white woman, is totally inaccurate. It's myth. It's myth. It gave a rallying point for white men. Save white women from miscegenation. Mm -hmm. OK? Save the white woman. What we're doing is saving the white woman from those horrible black people. Look at birth of a nation. Look at any of those things. But in Africa, um, black men were often polygamous. So they had more than one white, which makes one think that they didn't do anything but screw. No. Bef the number of wives that you have is contingent upon how much wealth you have. And you couldn't have a second wife unless you could take care of her financially. And financially means take care of her and any children that she has for you until they're grown. OK? So the value system 
the value system says that if I am a man and I have three or four wives because the wars have killed off, slavery has killed off, and so many women in our culture don't have a husband, rather than having people cheat and be an infidelity and promiscuous, wouldn't it be better to bring all those women into one compound with all of your children right there and have them and take care of them, provide for them, rather than all these extramarital affairs? That's the history behind that. You see, with the devastation of the black male population in Africa, there were women that didn't have. That's why you have the Amazon women of, uh, of Benin, the Republic of Benin. When the French came as colonialist, the male population was so deleted that the, uh, in um, uh, the, uh, the Abamako, the, the man, I'm not giving the right name, the uh, upcountry in the, in the Republic of Benin, or, or what was called the Homi, yes. um, that king was protected by Amazon women. They went down and fought the French. And the French used cannon on them. And they retreated back into the inlands. And then they came with their clothes changed, dressed like women, and became very familiar with the French, and partied with them, had sex with them, learned how to fire the cannons. <coughs> Got the French drunk one night, <coughs> rolled those cannons back up into the interior, and next morning when the French got together and organized, they marched up there to get those cannons back, and the women fired into them and defeated them. <laughs> now they ran out of gunpowder, and they didn't know how to make gunpowder, so then ultimately at, uh, at uh, Abome, that's the capital, up in that part, that's how the, that king was then taken by the French. But the Amazon women protected him, an army of women. Now, if that's the case, I mean, let's just look at then who was taken out of Africa. And, uh, I read stories that whole areas in Africa were depopulated sometimes. Yes, of course, of course. Let's talk about of course. What, what was the loss? Well, you see, what happens is people don't want to. Um, When you look at the writings of black authors that tell you that 60 million black people lost their lives in the Middle Passage, whites say it's physically impossible that that could have taken place. Mm -hmm. Could not have happened. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, they will tell you that the West African population was depleted by X number. That's the census that they have. How is it that it was de depleted by that number? Where, what happened? Where, where did they all go? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See? The devastation was done through the slavery period. So the major population was not able to re reproduce itself. That's what that's all about. Do we have any idea of the numbers when they talk about uh, West Africa was depleted by so many so many? There are numbers, but I don't have them readily at hand. I'd have to look them up for you. But, but you, you would you would say that it is quite possible that that figure that 60 million were lost in the Middle Passage could be true. I, I don't have any doubt about it. I know there are a lot of people that say there weren't that many, couldn't possibly be. But right now you have people that say, uh, with a shorter history, that in the Holocaust of the Jews, 6 million couldn't possibly have been killed. Mm -hmm. So if 6 million couldn't possibly be killed, and we have all the accuracy of counting that we do today, why is it over a 200-year period of slavery that you wouldn't have 6 million killed? 60 million. 60 million. Yes. 60 million. 60 yeah, million. 60 million. You wouldn't have 60 million killed. And I have read that at all times, and, and uh, Brother Eugene can, I think, validate this, uh, that at all times during the slave trade that there were at least 1,000 ships somewhere on the Atlantic involved in the slave trade, whether they were on the way from Europe to Africa, the from Africa, mm -hmm. doing the triangle. So we, we counted that if there were 1,000, they made an average of two voyages a year. Uh, they carried an average of 250 uh, Africans per ship. And the, the count is somewhere close to 300 million. Sure. So 60 million loss would not be uh, 60 million loss is not a possibility. Just do the math. Yes. Now. Now, when we talk about the, the loss to Africa, 
um, we are talking about those who were taken out. Who's taken out in terms of leaders, and etc.? Can you kind of look at that and what that does to a country? Well, if you take the population that is healthiest and represents the next generation, you've lost a whole generation of people. And if you do that for almost 300 years, then where is the collective knowledge yes. of a people? Where, who transmits the history? The science. Correct. Who, who's there to give that, to transmit it? It's lost. It's lost. And those things cannot be regained. When people come here, they have some knowledge, but they don't have the whole thing. <coughs> and they don't have it within the context of their, uh, uh, their sets of cosmology. For an example, if you were captured and the pale fox is the term I was trying to yes, remember. All right, if you have that as your cosmology, and you're on the <coughs> slave ship with a Yoruba who has a cosmology, those two cosmologies are different, yet there's tons of information in both of those that needs to be transmitted. Mm -hmm. So even though both of you are now on this plantation with knowledge about your own cosmology, there's no transfer of technology between the two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to do one act, I may be able to do another, but we couldn't pull them together into any type of unity to bring about some major understanding of the cosmos, of the world. See? Now, in terms of what happens to black people after you get here, and the ramifications, <coughs> we had strong family mm -hmm. values, ties, and unity. So in spite of the fact that slave families were not a family by the white way of measuring family, we created families because there is strength in that. And I'm sure of all of us here in the room, there are four of us in the room, <coughs> someone among us has an A. Mary. Mm -hmm. And if you were to go to the social worker and she would say, is this a maternal or paternal aunt? And you'd say, neither. Well, it can't be possible. How is this your Aunt Mary? Well, this is A. Mary because it's A. Mary and she performs the functions of A. Mary. She is not related to us at all in terms of that way. Mm -hmm. But her function is A. Mary. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's how you kept family, family ties and that, when families were being sold from each other. Members of families were being sold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about what does it mean to be sold? Yes. <coughs> Think what it means and the panic a child experiences when they're lost in the department store. What's the first thing they start doing? Crying. Crying. Calling the mom. Then they start screaming and calling their mother's name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the panic of the parent is seen <coughs> as the two are united. Now let's just take the situation where Sojourner Truth tells you she was in New York State down in the basement playing with her little brother in the cellar, because that's where they stayed in the cellar. And she could hear the jingle bells on the slate that was coming up. Mm -hmm. But she now knew what those jingle bells were all about, but her little brother didn't. And he went running to hear to see what was going on. It was slave buyers and sellers had come to, they had already paid for and come to pick up her little brother. When they came to t snatch him and take him away, he ran from them, ran in the house to his mother for her to hide him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The father stands there and says, don't hide him, don't create any problems, let them take him. Now why is the father not fighting, not doing something, not, people say, I would have, I would have, well let's listen to what the father says next. You remember what happened on the other plantation, when they did find the child, they took it by its heels and bashed its skull and brains out against the wall and left it. 
Now that's what Sojourner Truth writes in her first chapter of her experience. She wasn't by herself. She wasn't the only one. I have a personal friend I was in Georgia with. We were in, in Georgia, Atlanta, drove to another part of Georgia. <coughs> We came through a place that was the plantation in which her parent, her great-grandfather had been a slave. And she told me the history. She said her, grand, her great 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 grandmother, the slave coming from Africa, had three children, three male children. Their ages were seven, nine, and eleven. And on one day, the slave master came and took the three boys, shackled them, around their ankle, wrist, and neck. And they walked with him to North Carolina to be sold. Now, I want you to stop for a moment and think, what was the shackle made of? Iron. Uh, was the iron polished and smooth? No. OK. Well, when you're sweating from the heat and the iron is rubbing against your skin, what do you think happens? It tears. OK. And then, of course, the perspiration that has salt in it runs into it. And th how do you think that feels on your ankles, on your wrist, <coughs> and on your neck? And this is a 7, a 9-year-old, and an 11-year-old. The first child was sold in North Carolina. The second was sold in South Carolina. And her great-great-grandfather was sold in Georgia. His mother never saw any of her children after that. You see? Now, what is it? If you know how a parent, look, look at the parents where a child is abducted on television. Look at them still waiting for the child, even though they know the child is dead 10 years after, 20 years after as a family. They, they never function again. Now, are other human beings less human when you take their children away from them? Mm. What's the reality? What effects then does that have? Now we complain that our grandparents didn't tell us about slavery, those that were slaves. And our parents didn't say anything either. Well, just look at the victims of the Holocaust. Jews that were victims of the Holocaust in the concentration camps mm -hmm. that married, they never spoke about the Holocaust to their children. But when you look at the psychological ramifications of children that grew up in these households, they're emotionally disturbed people. So you see, even after slavery, there was a horrible experience that the children that were the first generation after that experienced the trauma of all that and not understanding all the depth of, of what was going on, because it was never discussed. Holocaust victims don't discuss it. These black people didn't discuss their experience in slavery in any great depth to their children. But the children had the same psychological ramifications that these Jews do whose parents were Holocaust victims. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Now, you compound that into a whole group of people, black people, and you continue to oppress on a daily basis. Now comes, but we're going to do something for you people. So you have laws, but the laws the rules change, and the courts corroborate the change. If you look at what black people did after re after in the period of Reconstruction after slavery, tremendous. Just examine it. More than 100 daily newspapers, 25 monthly magazines, books, accountants, physicians, pastors, school teachers, colleges, boarding schools, all built by black slaves. Banks. Every principal black city had a black bank making investments, loaning money. OK? That means that too much progress is being made. Now, how, how long was this after? This is the, this is the, this is the period from 1865 to about 1895. And blacks went from zero literacy to practically 90-something percent literacy. Now, come on, Nichols, how could that be possible? 
the way they were taught to read. Now, if, you, if I just put two letters up in front of you, A, T, what does that spell? Bat. Now, go through the alphabet and put letters in front of it. B, A, T is what? Bat. C, A, T is what? Cat. H, A, T is what? Hat. M, A, T is what? Mat. Are you learning phonics? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, what book did everybody have in their home? A, what? Bible. All right. And how do you read the Bible? You know the story. You've heard the story, so you read it how? Phonically, and you learn how to read. Mm -hmm. OK? Mm -hmm. So what you have, then, is you have a society that is moving at a great rapid pace. And they own land, because they bought the land. And they had it willed in perpetuity so it could never be taken out. Now let's see what happens <coughs> to all that farmland. White people are, are beginning to say, we want what we had back. So they fight with the Congress. OK, that's some of that impeachment that was going on, that first one with Johnson. Mm -hmm. And they change the rules. The white North begins to not support and keep in place, because they got to keep troops down there, what was there, keep, the, keep equity for black people. And it gets bad, worse. Finally, what law is passed? And you know, you have you have the uh, you have the the um, black. Court. No, yeah, you have all those, but you have the court finally, the Percy versus Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, that justifies it. Mm -hmm. And we are held back until the '60s, mm -hmm. and we're held back again now with all these rules changing, court decisions. How do you prove discrimination? You have to prove intent. How do you prove intent? Nobody tells you. See? Now let's look at social service agencies dealing with black families. It used to be that if you were on ADC, the man could stay in the home. That was because most people on aid to families with dependent children were on, were families, were white. Mm -hmm. When black social workers began to press for, that was not welfare, that was a step up from welfare, mm -hmm. began to press for the same thing for black people, it was time to change the rules in black communities. Let me give you a very specific example. In Detroit, Michigan, if you were on ADC, the husband could not be in the home and could not visit. And on weekends, they used to send welfare workers out to go break into the home at night on a weekend to see if the husband was there. If he bought shoes for his children and brought them there, and this welfare worker saw new shoes, then the cost of the new shoes was taken from the welfare check. Now, what is this doing to black families? Destroying. OK. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, let's look at the white family at the same time, and even today, in the northern five counties of Michigan and the Upper Peninsula. The mines closed years ago, and they've been on welfare ever since. And when they changed the welfare laws, they excused northern Michigan from those welfare laws that affect black people in Wayne County. Check it out. See if I'm lying. Well done. Yes. Um, Dr. Nichols, um, we left off talking about um, the way the system um, maintains control uh, we were talking about the welfare yes. system mm -hmm. and how it manipulates uh, and, and the, the rules um, Change. are changed yes. all the time. <coughs> what, what does that do uh, in terms of frustrating one's ability to, uh, to dream and to plan? And mm. How does that, in effect, what impact does that have on uh, black mobility, black uh, Expansion, black uh, stress. And so. Okay. <clears throat> um, blacks have been given the myth that in this country, if you work hard, you get ahead. And it is the existentialistic reality of non blacks. Um, the reality is you lack the privilege of sexist, racist society. Let me be very specific. 
um, if you start a welfare system that removes the father from the home, what are you doing to the home? You're destroying it. All right. If a man who is in Detroit, Michigan, works in one of the motor car companies, and he works 24 hours a day practically for the first three months, and then he works regular time, and then he's off at Christmas for three months. Say Christmas, though it's like January, February, March, he's not working. Um, and then he goes back in, say, uh, the, when they're changing the tire, car, car, when they're changing the, the models, and he works for three months and he's off again. Can you maintain a family in that kind of an environment? And the answer is no. So if your children and your wife are on ADC, they can stay in the project where it's warm. They can be assured that their community is intact. There's things that they need, and that's where they're happy. Now, what happens when he lives in a room on a, uh, he's living as a roomer in somebody else's house where there are two or three other men in the same condition. Now, if they try to go to the home in the projects where their children are and their wife, and the welfare investigator comes, they're taken off welfare. They lose their benefits. Um, so what then is there for these men to do in a boarding house other than to drink and play games? This is before television. Play cards. OK? What's there for them to do? How can they be fathers and father their children? Now, the child is growing up in a home situation where there is no father. OK? When the man does work and tries to give his wife some money and some children, some shoes, and so on, the welfare investigator sees those items and takes them, the cost of them, off of her check. So nothing is gained by it. Okay. So how does the young man then begin to perceive the relationship between husband and wife? Well, the husband has to sneak into the house at some time when the welfare worker won't be on duty and can sneak in there. And they give the children money to go to the show. So the children go to the show, and the parents have some private time to themselves. He gives her a little piece of money that she puts on food or something, but something that won't show up on the welfare bill, and he leaves. Now, what kind of an image is that in terms of a stable father in a home? Or are men just supposed to be romantic and come in and have sex and leave for a price? What, what, are, you, what are you telling children in terms of a father figure? Now, the system also says that whenever you have a child, you can declare yourself independent and have your own ADC check. So when children go through adolescent rebellion, get pregnant, have a child, and go on welfare is an answer to, I have my own place. So what are the ramifications of that over an extended period of time? Well, Howard University at one point had um, <clears throat> support groups. One of the support groups that it had for grandmothers under 30. Now, can you imagine what that is? So here's a child 13 who has a child at 13. All right? So that's a grandmother, and the, the, the next child is 13. So here's a grandmother 26, 27 years of age, and she's a grandmother. Oh, where was the adolescent period? Where was the child's growth period? Where was anything? But you've developed a society that says, this is the way we want you to function. Now, because drugs were permitted to be brought into the black community, and I say it just like that, because in Washington, D.C., <clears throat> there are drugs in numerous sections of the black community, but there are no crack houses in, in west of Rock Creek Park in upper northwest Washington, D.C. There are no crack houses over there. There's nobody selling crack on corners that you can drive by and pick up. Now, it's the same city, same police department, only that is a 99% section of the city that is white as opposed to non-white. 
So you don't have the infrastructure that promotes safety in the black community or keeps illegal and illicit products out of the black community. Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself why. Well, if you ever look at anyone that has been on crack for any period of time, their brain is shot, their body is shot, they are of no value whatsoever. So what you have developed, in essence, is a whole society of zombies. And then those that go through the jail cycle go through the prison cycle. And you see the large numbers of young black men that we have who've gone to prison, who are involved in drugs, and who are totally irresponsible in terms of taking care of children and, having, and being fathers. And you ask yourself, well, why? What is wrong with the character of black people? It's not the character of black people. It's the social conditioning that has been done through institutions that have created the monster that we now have. So the ramifications are, we as black people have to re begin to think how to undo the damage. Okay? I, I know it sounds horrible, it's a dreadful thought, but it's mine. I would like to institute just one aspect of Islamic law for two years in the black community. So if you're caught selling drugs, we just cut your hand off at the wrist. Okay? If you kill somebody, we will see you at the chopping block and we'll get your head on Saturday after, or on Friday after service. I'm not saying that we become Muslim, but I am saying if we practice that for one year, you wouldn't have crime in the ghetto. You wouldn't. And why am I so angry? I have a mother who's 92 years old, doesn't ask me for a dime, takes care of herself, lives independently in her little house. And there's a young man came with a gun, knocked her down. She's taking her groceries in the house. Knocked her down, broke her wrist, snatching her purse off, and could have killed her. OK? He's young in his 20s. My mother's 92 years old. He didn't care a thing about her. You see? Where is the respect for the elders? Where is the, all these things we talk about? Where is the unity and all the other? It's not there. Those are predators in the community, and they have to be dealt with. And the only way you deal with it is not through the legal system, because many people who are on <clears throat> right here in this community where I live in Washington, they have a halfway house for people who are waiting to go to jail. They've already been sentenced by the court. And they're living in a house in this community waiting to go to jail. Now, if they're waiting to go to jail, do you think they have any problems about stealing or robbing or anything else? You see what I'm talking about? Now, what then is the, what are we going to do about it? Hmm? The time will come when black men will have to be a militia force in the black community that just very quietly, very privately, gets rid of the dope dealers and the people who damage, do the damage. Now, my point is, in the next generation, like the Kennedys were wealthy and rich because of the trading of their father in illegal alcohol, you're going to have, in the next generation, Kennedys, quote unquote, who will be the children of the people who dealt with all this dope. You have to ask yourself, who's making the money off of dope? It's not being made off of the drug dealers that we know and see. It's not even made at the next level. It's made at very high levels. That's why it flourishes. You can't tell me that all those nickels and dimes and all that money that they collect selling isn't laundered someplace and nobody knows about it. You can't tell me that you can bring tons of narcotics into the country and nobody knows to whom the check is being paid when we can electronically trace anything that you want to trace. When right here sitting in my house, my voice can be picked up and transmitted to any place in the world, and they may even have a camera in here looking. You see what I'm talking about? So the technology is there. We know that the technology is there. It's just that certain people are being protected. And the only way you do it is you keep it out of your community by, by making the people of the community recognize that it's not something they want to do. Let me tell you what they do in China. You're dealing dope in China? 
They put you on a flatbed, uh, on the back end of a flatbedded truck, drive you around the community with a loudspeaker and say, this person's using dope, this person's passing dope in the community. Take you to the public square, put a bullet in the back of your head, go to your family, and they have to pay the cost of the bullet. Okay? Now you can imagine that you don't have many people out there pushing drugs in China. Now why? Because the English forced drugs on the Chinese. That's what the Boxer War was all about. Okay? And they saw the devastation of opium on a, a rich, vast civilization for years in terms of what it did, its damages. Okay? Let me, uh, <clears throat> um, I'm just going to go through with two sure. other things. And, sure. Uh, um, we're trying to close. But in terms of the uh, mental and physical damage, that was done to blacks. Um, I want to look at that more closely during slavery day. Mm -hmm. um, the spiritual uh, disconnectedness. Mm -hmm. I, I want to look at that and then look <coughs> at healing uh, and the mob and ceremonies that, um, uh, that are going on like at the House of the Lord, um, at uh, St. Paul's Community Baptist Church. But let's look at and again, um, as broad as we can, the psychological and mental scars from slavery that was, that was inflicted. Okay. Let's take the physical part yes. and look at that. Howard University examined the bones of slaves in Harlem, in New York, in Manhattan. Yeah. They were building a building. So you need to look at that and that be, let that be a part of your series. But the sheer amount of weight that they carried literally tore ligaments away from the bone. Okay? So in lifting and carrying such weights over such a sustained period of time, they became physically incapable of lifting those weights. Well, like any other animal that is dysfunctional, what do you do with it? Kill it. Kill it any means necessary. So what they, what, what they did with, they didn't feed. Mm -hmm. So you would have an old person who was no longer useful, and they had to, quote, fend for themselves. Well, the harsh conditions, weather and all the other things, the lack of food and so on, they died and their bones were interred in those places. Now, if you're connecting the physical then, what, what do you think happens when you are young, say 20, 25, working, and you see this 45-year-old man completely destroyed by the same work that you're doing on a daily basis? What do you have to look forward to? Same thing. How do you think you feel? What are your hopes? What, what, how do you feel when you look at your children? Now, <clears throat> Jung talks about a collective unconscious that's sort of like a memory of people. And he demonstrates that through archetypes and things like that. The slave experience for black Americans is a part of our collective unconscious. It's a memory that we have of the pain, the suffering, and the anguish. And that memory stays with us. And we access it frequently when we encounter frustrations and stress in trying to succeed in a racist society. We are, in, we are at a point at which, uh, let me give you a specific example. One of my former students, when I was doing work at Meharry Medical College. He was at Tennessee a &I. I worked with him in a, in a private seminar group for real bright kids at Tennessee a &I. All right? I was also teaching at Fisk. He went on to Northern Illinois, and he did an experiment that he created. You see it in all the psychology books. 
but you don't see his name on it because his white faculty person took the credit for his experiment. Well, you get over that. That's a part of being an undergraduate student. He goes on to Case Western Reserve, and he has a PhD. I'm mentoring him all along this, and I told him, you've got to have some publication. So at the time of graduation, at 25, PhD, OK? Case Western Reserve, six publications. Harvard grabs him. Okay. Now, every single year at Harvard, he turns out three, four papers. Okay. At Harvard, if you turn out two papers in a year that are published, you don't have, in a referee journal, you know, the top referee journals, <coughs> you don't have to teach classes. This man has now been there 29 years. He is not tenured. He is not a professor. When he got to the point where he was supposed to be in competition for professorship, another guy got it. Okay, so they said, we don't want people with all in the same field. He didn't get it. They put him in charge of <clears throat> the Harvard Foundation. Harvard Foundation is simply keep the natives happy. So he does programs, you know, invite this person, and this speaker, and so forth and so on, like a public relations. Okay? He is so brilliant. I told him one of the things you have to have is an overseas experience. You have to go overseas. I went to school in Germany. You've got to make some connections. So he elected to go to Sweden. He went to Sweden. For the last 15 years, 16 years, Sweden, the Swedish government, pays for him to come and spend the summer at the Karlinsk Institute in Sweden. They pay for him to come. And he produces three to four papers with the faculty at the Karlinsk. This is the place where they get the Nobel, Peace, uh, Nobel laureates for science and everything else. That's where he's working. Now, he thought, just like many other blacks, that you have to have more paper, more paper, you have to turn out more books, more something. He's been doing all that. He did, he did the exploring to the North Pole with Hinson, got Hinson's body moved from New York down here to Washington, D.C., to Arlington, and got Hinson's name put on the, the um, ship that does uh, scientific work. So we have a, sh uh, in a ship in the Navy with Hinson. He went into Suriname and found the people way back in the places and so on. So he's, he's a member of the Explorers, one of the few black people, men in terms in the Explorers Club. Okay? He's done everything. Now, Sweden, for the last 300 years, is one of the only or maybe the principal universities in the whole world that gives a doctorate of medical science. This is light years beyond a PhD. 20 light years beyond a, a, a medical degree, okay? That's how difficult it is to get this degree. He got it. At Harvard, there are four people that have it. Two are honorary, because one of the men is a Nobel laureate. Two people have honorary. Mm -hmm. There are two that are earned, and he has one of those that is earned. Is he a full professor? Is he a professor? Does he have 10? No. He's on a year-to-year -year contract. Now, my question to you is, if he were white or anything else, would he have been treated that way? And the answer is no. So <clears throat> the point is this. What we are being socialized and conditioned to understand as black men is successful black men are punished for being successful. That's the message. You can be as successful as you want to be. And mind you, every year he's turning three to four papers out. OK? He's published books. All right? He's done film. He's also published in his area of expertise. And they're not just little tinky, tinky things. And they're not in, in journals that are not excellent journals, top layer, see? So what is the reason that this man is not given that honor? 
Now, Poussin got it, but of course everyone laughs behind Poussin's back saying, well, you know, they had to give it to one and he's not qualified. He doesn't write in referee journals. He just writes in Ebony magazine and so forth and so on. Well, fine. But you see, what they can do is to point to Poussin and laugh, but they will not afford a scholar, a black man scholar, what he deserves. They won't give it to him because that would create the wrong message. They don't want that message out there. They want to keep talking about, we can't find any. And there are many black men, particularly a lot of young lawyers, that go into corporations to be corporate lawyers. They get to a certain point, I know four right here in, the, in Washington, D.C. And so they don't discuss it, they buy them out. But they know that they will not make it to the top in that organization, they buy them out. So they end up in small firms or developing their own firm or something, but they never get to the top of these other firms because they move them out. It's not because they're not qualified, it's because the system does not want them in there. If the system puts them in there, then you cannot keep privilege in a sexist, racist society based on race superiority. It won't hold. So now, take all those experiences plus a collective unconscious memory of slavery, and then talk about life expectancy of black males, talk about hypertension, heart trouble, prostate. prostate. Why not? Why not? Why not? Are we an endangered species? I think that we are more vulnerable than we've ever been. And I say that because I know the devastation of drugs, and I know how many young black men have been crippled, and ex not only exposed to them, but crippled and destroyed by them. I know how many young black men are disenfranchised. They have committed felons, and therefore they can't vote. So what then is the future? And if you take a man like the one I discussed for you with all this education, and they look and say, look what happened to him, why should I even bother? Then what you're developing is you're developing a whole cadre of people who go around talking about, well, you talk white. Or you got good marks in school because you think you white. Hmm. Then if you ask, well, what is black? Black is to be with the headphones on and jumping and jumping and jumping and listening to music. But if you look at the music th 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 to which they listen, it's done by machine. The drumming is all done by machine. It's all synthesized. Yes, yes, yes. Now, if you look in terms of neurophysiological damage from that kind of input to a nervous system, what are you developing for young people, in addition to the deafness from the loud noise? So here we have systems that are just destroying masses and masses of people. And it prevents and precludes us from really pulling all of our forces together and pushing in a united front. We're destroyed. I don't think we're totally destroyed. And the excitement that I feel and, and understand when I go to uh, St. Paul is that it can change. Let me just ask you one question before you go into St. Paul. This uh, syn um, synthetic, yes. this machine Synthesizer. Bomb, what does that do to, uh, uh, to us spiritually because it's not a message that's coming from, a rhythmic message comes from one's own spirit and soul. It's a machine. Yes, well, it's, what it is, is that what you're doing is you're giving, you're giving something that has the potential to be spiritual. You're taking the spirit out of it so it becomes mechanical. Yes. And so mechanically you're hearing, but you're not developing any sense of spirit. That, that to me is the frustration. Mm -hmm. See, so if you have a synthesizer, it's not saying anything, it's not doing anything, it's just boom, 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 it's the same thing, over and over again. 
And what has to be done is we have to begin to think in terms of what is the damage psychologically. And you have the neurophysiologist at the church, um, Dr. What is it? A? Akra. Akra, Dr. Akra. Mm -hmm. Let him talk to you and discuss for you the neurophysiological damage mm -hmm. of the brain being insulted as it is with this constant bombardment mm -hmm. of artificial noise. It's noise, static. Mm -hmm. In terms of the marathon and, and um, um, ceremonies, uh, trying to reconnect with that African spirit. Um, why is it important? And, and what does it do? What is it doing? What's mm -hmm. important? Sir? I think any time you have ritual, and ritual takes the phenomena and repeats it over and over and over again. So mass for Catholics is ritual the canon of the Mass. What that does is it imprints into the individual's psyche an understanding, a clarification, and a value of something positive. So I think that those acts are acts of cleansing. I think each time you see the uh, portrayal of the Middle Passage and the Maafra, that those expressions. I think they are like baths that cleanse mm -hmm. and cleanse. I think the first experience is like a baptism. You sort of come out with the capacity to be a new spiritual person. But I think it's like, uh, take me to the water in mm -hmm. spiritual. I think each time you go, you're being taken to the water to cleanse yourself and to cleanse your soul. So the deep spiritually within us, we can come to grips with the collective unconscious of the horrors of slavery, the middle passage, and we can also have a greater strength of coping with the institutional racism with which we live on a daily basis. So it's to cleanse away the past, and as it is water, the source of life, it strengthens us mm -hmm. for the future of all the things that we encounter in this culture. As a summary and a finality, mm -hmm. what message can you, can you give to black people who will be watching um, this series, this program, in terms of a renewal, in terms of hope, in terms of the future, in terms of what we can be, and mm -hmm. what the world might be if we ever uh, restore our dignity and our mm -hmm. values and our worldview. I'm thoroughly convinced that if we have more facilities like St. Paul, Community Baptist Church, that that represents for me the future. What it says there is that each person can make a contribution. And we will nurture you. We will give you every opportunity to do all the things that you can possibly do. And you can do it within the confines of safety that we have provided for you here. And you can do it to the growth of, of your maximum potential, whatever you think you can do, mm -hmm. or whatever you think you want to do, we permit you to do it here. Mm -hmm. And that is a sheltered, protected environment in which people are nurtured, supported, valued, encouraged, and pushed. Because your pastor pushes people. <laughs> and he pushes them to their greater potential. For the rest of the society that's outside of that, that cocoon of growth, I think one thing we have to do is we have to stop watching television that is derogatory. Stop 
being socialized by television that gives us only negative images of black people. Mm. Stop permitting ourselves to go to the movies that only demonstrate black people as thieves and pimps and hustlers and things like that. And to begin to demand of the people who pay for the advertising, mm -hmm. GE and so on, that they must be more accountable to the black community for the programming that they pay for through advertising. Those are the things that I think we can really do something about. In terms of the black young people, I think the time has come when they have to realize that to be black doesn't mean to be ignorant. It says to be black requires that you are better than <coughs> others. You are better than others. Because if you aren't, you won't be able to compete at all. The new society is high end, high tech. If you don't have the math skills, you won't have a job. <coughs> and there are people that can teach you if you're willing to learn. Okay? Thank you. You see how that ended? Just. <laughs> <laughs> was the end of that tape. Okay. All right. Get your... Good morning, family. Good morning. It's good to see everybody and to talk to everybody this morning. This is your host, Minister Clemson Brown. And uh, we have a very special program with us this morning. We're going to be speaking with Dr. Uh, Edward J. Nichols. Um, Dr. Nichols is an industrial psychologist. And he has done some great work over the years. And uh, I remember Dr. Nichols from uh, House of the Lord Church going back about, actually, about 30 years, wasn't it? At wasn't least. It? At, least. <laughs> At least 30 years. You you haven't aged that much. You haven't changed. <laughs> it's the lighting. It's the lighting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit this morning about um, European paradigms and their culture um, and how these paradigms uh, are different in the uh, Afri than African paradigms, the way we uh, experience our environment and the way we react to our environment and, and the differences in that. And those differences actually make a difference in the way that we relate to one another. Uh, so Dr. Nichols is going to be talking about that uh, this morning. And it's something that I think as a people we need to really be able to understand so we can understand where the, what is the impact and the differences. So uh, Dr. Nichols, I'm, I'm going to actually kind of turn everything over to you and uh, if you would uh, kind of give us a little introduction of yourself in that um, tell us a little bit about your history okay um, I'm Edwin Nichols I'm a clinical industrial psychologist I was trained I did my undergraduate work at Assumption College in Canada I did my master's at Tübingen University in Germany, and I finished on scholarship at the University of Innsbruck in Austria, cum laude. That's my classical training. I 
graduated in 1961, so it's a long time ago. I have many years of experience. I was the first African American to be a center chief at the National Institute of Mental Health. And that was through the auspices and the pushing of the Psychiatric Black Caucus um, years and years ago. They pushed to have Blacks in administrative positions at the National Institute of Mental Health. When I retired, I opened my own company called Nichols and Associates, which is an applied behavioral science firm. It means that we do research work, we'll do consultations, we do organization development work, or we will do what I'm doing here today is to come out and work with people on mm -hmm. specific issues. So I'm very glad to be able to do this for uh, Reverend Brown. And I will start by saying that in order to understand and work successfully with people that are ethnically different, we have to be able to look at the very essence of ethnic difference for ourselves and for others. What I elected to do was to use classical philosophy. And in classical philosophy, there are different disciplines like metaphysics, cosmology, and so on. I elected to use three. The first one is axiology. And axiology is the study of values. Epistemology asks the question, how do you know? Not what do you know, but how do you go about knowing things? And logic is how do you reason to an answer? So my conclusion was, if I understand what is important to you, what is your value system, how you do problem solving and how you reason to an answer, then I would have a, a better insight in how to work with you or to uh, communicate concepts and ideas to you. So in looking at this work, uh, professor, doctor, psychiatrist, Lambo, Thomas Lambo, <clears throat> he, in a conversation, talked about the difference between Europeans and Africans. He's Yoruba from Nigeria. He studied in England and he was a, a very successful psychiatrist in England dealing with all the English patients, whites primarily. Then he became a part of the World Health Organization in Geneva. And I um, was a visiting professor at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria for three years. So in one of his conversations, he said that he felt that Europeans were more concerned with objects and less concerned with the soul or the relationship, which is an African way of doing it. When he said those two things, there was a clicking in my mind and I went back to classical European philosophy. And I said, he's talking about axiology. So that helped me to begin to think about, well, how do they come to have object as the highest value? For Europeans and the relationship is highest value for the African American or for Blacks in general or Africans. So as I began to, I kind of shifted from psychologists to cultural anthropologists to go back in history and see how do these different groups of people interact with each other and what are the dependent variables. What I found is that the Europeans are the youngest ethnic group in the world. All the other ethnic groups in the world are much, much older than the European ethnic group. The reason for that is that the Ice Age didn't end in Europe uh, before about 20, maybe maximum 25,000 years ago. So that would be the first time that migrants out of Africa go directly north into Europe because you had the Swiss Alps was all uh, glacier and up into Germany and on up into uh, Sweden and over that was all covered with ice and they couldn't enter. Now, people that came directly out of Africa and sort of made a right turn into the Middle East and across Asia, into China, India, Korea, Japan, 
that was a, a, a much earlier migration. Actually, you have uh, some cities in Korea that are 30,000 years old. So you can see that they were at least 10,000 in 10,000 years in in Korea before you have people able to enter into Europe at all. So if you look at the conditions of Europe at that time, um, in order to survive, so let's let's look to see what I'm doing. I'm taking the concept object, and I'm saying to myself. What then is the most important object in Europe for them to be alive next spring? And that object would be food. So I'm taking the philosophical construct object and I'm equating it to food in all of its aspects. So in North Central Europe, 20,000 years ago, could you grow food in North Central Europe? In the months of September, grow and harvest. That's the whole idea. In the months of September, October, November, the answer is no. Well, what about December, January, February? We know that's too cold. Then October, November, um, uh, September, um, March, April, May. Now, some people want to argue about May, but my question is, in Minnesota, the ground is still what in May? It's frozen. So the top border, Minnesota and Canada is the same latitude as the southern border of Germany to Switzerland. So it gives you an idea that if, if Minnesota is that cold and you go further north into Germany, it should even be colder. So here's a culture that has to develop and think about growing food, preserving it, storing it, everything in just three months time. Now, if you didn't do that, you would, you'd end up dead. Death would be the reality. So then what behaviors as a group of people that only have three months to grow things, what behaviors do they develop in order to survive and thrive? Well, one of the things is, if this is the week to plow, you can't say, oh, I don't feel like plowing walking behind this urinating, defecating horse in the mud. I'm not just going to do it this week. Well, I'm sorry. If you don't do it this week, you don't get the seeds in the ground, they won't come to fruition, and you will be dead. Well, could you say, well, <clears throat> I'm just recovering from flu. Well, it's too bad. You've got to get out and plow. So what does it say about a group of people that are under the, the time constraint of three months? and where their personal health and other things like that are of little consequence in terms of accomplishing the task. The reality of that is when it's time to do a task, you do it. When? Now. Because if you don't, you'll end up dead. So if you take that and look at a group of people in terms of their modern behavior today, mm -hmm. Your boss says, I want the deliverable, the object. By close of business today, three months, or you're in deep trouble. Okay? Yeah. Now, why is he so concerned by close of business today? And if you don't get it in, he's very upset. Well, he's very upset because you missed, listen to the collective unconscious memory, you missed the deadline. Ah. Uh. The deadline. Okay? Now, you can begin to see how the cultural anthropologist will give you information about how people survived and thrived 20, 25,000 years ago and how they carry that in their epigenetic code and it brings itself forth today in their genetic behavior. Now, I've lived long enough, when I first began to develop this, I could only talk about Jung's collective unconscious memory. But I've lived long enough to, we are now in the era of epigenetics, and we know that things are transmitted through the genes epigenetically. Now, let's look at some other things that are of that same thinking. In order to have additional food, men had to hunt almost every day. 
And at that time, their bow and arrow was not strong enough to penetrate the hide of an elk or a deer, which would give you enough food for your clan for a week or maybe two weeks. Their bow and arrow just was not that developed. Now, they could get a, a rabbit or a squirrel or something small, but they didn't have the strong bow and arrow at that time. So the way they killed an animal of that side would be to spear it, track it down until it finally bleeds to death, and then bring it back, or develop pits, snares, and traps. Well, if a large animal falls into the pit, the strong men can then throw stones and spears to kill it. But animals don't just walk around saying, oh, where have they placed a pit, a snare, a trap for me to fall into? They have to be herded into those places. And of course, that meant that men and women together did all the noise making necessary to herd them into those places. Now, if you're a woman in your third trimester, it's not likely that you could be running up and down the hills, running to and from wild animals. So the women stayed in the place of residence uh, during this last period of gestation. They became very observant of everything around them. Early this morning, there was a little goat right over there that was uh, trying to deliver, and it was having a very difficult time. Finally, the little goat stands up, walks over to a small bush over on this side, and nibbles leaves from that bush, then immediately dilates and delivers. Now, you've seen other small animals and other animals nibble from that bush, dilate, and deliver. So if you're a woman and you're in labor and it's not going well, what would you be likely to do? Nibble from the bush. Now, because these women were confined during this last trimester, they were very observant of many things around them. And very quickly, they developed the, an understanding of roots, herbs, barks, grasses, roots, and leaves, which they later developed into a pharmacopoeia of what root, what leaf would serve what purpose in your health. So European women very quickly have a body of knowledge that men don't have. It's this pharmacopoeia. In addition to that, women had another skill that men did not have. And that is women learned to count and measure centuries before men could grasp the concepts of counting and measuring. And that was because of the internal clocks that women have. The menstrual cycle is approximately 28 days. Well, you can you can measure the moon and equate the moon and its lunar uh, time is generally 28 days. So you're connecting yourself with the outer world. If you continue to do that connection with the outer world, at, right at the middle of the cycle of the moon is what we call the harvest moon. So it didn't take long for women to equate the harvest moon in the lunar cycle to ovulation in their own cycle. So if you wanted to get pregnant, you had sex. Now in the moon cycle, there's the waning and waxing of the moon. So you equate that into your own system. So if you abstain from sex so many days before ovulation, you don't get pregnant. And if you wait to have sex so many days after your ovulation, you don't get pregnant. So women were able very quickly to control their fertilization. Now, this was too much power for women to have. And so in Europe, they changed the rules. And men then had a hierarchy and a pecking order. And with this hierarchy or pecking order, European men are at the top of this pecking order, and everyone else is coming down in descending levels. Now, let us compare that same experience with this European woman and the African woman, or the African experience. Is food omnipresent in Africa? Do you have to get everything in three months and store it? And, and what? No. You just walk out and food is omnipresent. Things come in cycles, like yams or what have you, but 
There's never a time when there's not enough food to eat that you would starve to death. There's not enough time that you don't have enough wood and, and things to keep you <clears> in <throat> winter because you freeze to death. So the things that were important to form and shape <laughs> the European axiological construct, the highest value lies in the, in the object, was of no value or consequence in the African experience. So what then did the African focus on? If you don't have to focus on trying to stay alive till next spring, then what do you focus on? You focus on interpersonal relationships because you are going to be together all the time and you want to have a relationship. So for us as Africans, uh, 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 part of the diaspora, the African diaspora, the reality is that for us, the highest value is in the relationship. So just watch my hands now. If the highest value is in the relationship, and you do something that treats me, since we're in the relationship, we're equal. And this is historically how African men and women have seen themselves as equal. Now, if you do something that treats me as less than equal, you have treated me with what? Disrespect. What was the leading song that Aretha Franklin sang in the last century? R.S. what? Okay. So it's even in our 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 vernacular of the current time. Respect is the most important thing. If you go to the prison, you ask a young man, why on earth did you kill your cousin, brother, best friend? He says, man, he dissed me, or he treated me with disrespect. So it's critical for us to understand what does it mean in our mind to be treated as equal and to destroy a relationship when we are treated as less than equal because we've been treated with disrespect. Now, those are the two axiologies, and we have to develop some ideas around those two axiologies. Uh, Reverend Brown, are there any questions that you have at this time? Um, no, um, please continue. All right. Let's not take these two situations and put them into context. If you go to Nigeria and you want to study Yoruba, you don't start with the verb to be. I am, you are, he, she, or it is. You start with greetings. I greet you this morning with a whole series of greetings. I greet you as I walk by you, as I greet you as you're sitting down and I'm walking by. There's a whole series of greetings that you have to memorize before you get to the verb, I am, you are, he, she, or it is. So it says that in these cultures, in the African culture, it's very important to know how to greet because that establishes and it retains the relationship. Now, we bring that with us as a part of the diaspora here. It's very important for people to say good morning. And you walk by someone, you don't say good morning, they roll their eyes and the next thing you hear is what's wrong with him? Well, Let's put the two of you now into an office. Because you see a lot of people that are white say, I'm not a racist, I'm not a racist. Well, they're not a racist, I'll give you that. But you are inept in cultural competence. You don't understand self and other. You place yourself here and other down here. When in reality, you should see each other with respect as equals. Now, I can outrank you because I'm your boss, and I will show you deference because you're my boss, but I still expect you to treat me with respect and as an equal in the eyes of God. That's where it all comes from. All right, let's take an example of what happens in an office where people don't understand these two dependent variables in how to relate to each other. You have a white boss in his office at 7.30. And he has just received an email from his boss saying, I want those reports by one o'clock. So that's my close of business for him is one o'clock. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't have it by one o'clock, he is as good as what? Dead. <laughs> in this okay. Now, that's at 7.30, so he's rushing around trying to get everything organized. The secretary is a black woman. She's supposed to be there at 8 o'clock. 
She said 10 minutes before 8 because she wants to be on time. She knows her boss. As soon as she gets there, she's trying to take off her coat and sit down. He runs out of his office and he drops these four folders on her desk and he says, I've got to have these by noon. And he goes back in the office. Now, what principle has he violated? That's, that's what you have to be able to do to understand axiology. Now, for her, the highest value is in the what? The relationship. How do you affirm a relationship first thing in the morning if you didn't sleep with somebody all night long? How do you affirm it? You affirm it by greetings, good morning, hello, how are you? How's the family? I hope everything is well. May God's blessings be upon you and your family. This just goes on. All right, now, I doesn't have to do that in modern offices, but at least... In her mind, she says, he rushed out here, dropped these things on my desk. He didn't even say, good morning. Now, for her, he's on the verge of treating her as less than what? Equal. on the verge of treating her with what? Disrespect. Now, from his perspective, he's not concerned about good morning, hello, how are you? He's got to get the object accomplished. His boss wants it by one o'clock. He's got to have it by 12 o'clock or he's dead because he missed the deadline. Now, if he understood the culture better, he would have come out and said, good morning, Mrs. Jones. The boss is on me for this at one o'clock. Can you get it to me by 12? How are you? How are you doing? She would have said, of course. Because she wants to maintain what with her boss. After all, she's black and he hired her as his secretary over somebody else that might have been white or something else. So he's, he says, I'm not a racist. Well, no, he's not. But he certainly isn't culturally competent in that behavior. So what I'm sharing with you is that now let's go into what happens when she is not greeted properly. Like just good morning. Uh, I'm going to push this is one of those odd days. The boss wants it by one. If you could get it to me by 12, I'd really be grateful. Well, that says to her, you respect me, you respect my ability, and I will do it. Now, because of what he did do, he just dropped it on the desk and went back in the office. She says to herself, he didn't even say good morning. He just dropped those things on my desk like I was a machine or something. Now she develops this little attitude. Well, I'll get to it when I can. And of course, that's passive aggressive. And then when he comes out and says, where is it? Where is it? When she says, I'm working on it. Well, I told you I have to have it by 12 o'clock. I'm working on it. Then, of course, she becomes the angry black woman. And he sees her as uncooperative. And, and he has all kinds of things in his mind going on about why is she acting this way and why is she blah, blah, blah. And she's thinking, you didn't even say good morning. You don't even respect me as a human being enough to say, good morning, dog. At least you'd pat your dog on the head. Well, you see now, are you seeing the complications that come about? Because two people, goodwill, not racist, not sexist, just culturally incompetent. Is that helpful, Reverend Brown? Very, very much so to understand, and you can expand that uh, into a whole nother dynamics when you come with white male, black male, and that relationship. But right now, uh, please continue to develop the yeah. well, female. Okay. All right. Well, let's look at black male, white male. When you have black male, white male, um, in this culture, well, let's do it like this. You get one plus for race and one for color. So as a white male, you get a plus for being white and a plus for being male. If you're black, you get a plus for being male, but you get a minus for being black. So you see there's already an inconsistency of who is equal in this in this framework the the black male only has the quality or the plus for being male like the white male but he doesn't have whiteness so 
in that pecking order, it makes him lower than. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, that's the same thing with white women. She has the plus for being white, but she has a minus for being a woman. Now, guess who gets the double minus? The black woman. She's black. That's no plus. She's a woman. That's no plus. So she gets the double negative. The white man gets the double plus, and the white male and the black, uh, the white female and the black male are balancing each other out for one plus and one minus. That's why there's so much friction between white women and black men in the workplace, particularly if the white woman is your supervisor. That's why mm -hmm. white women push so hard for equity. White women want equity. Well, why do they want equity? Then they'll have two what? Two Plus. They'll be like white men. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let's look at these two men in the office working together. Because of the socialization of whites, blacks always have to credential themselves or work harder or be better than their counterpart. When you work harder to be better than your counterpart, and you are in your productivity, that makes him look bad. And so his whiteness won't protect him if it's really competitive. You're really competing against each other on the same level. So what they do is they try to undercut you. And that's when they pull the race card. That's the white card. Now they'll say, oh, you're pulling the race card. You're pulling the race card. No, I'm just saying that you're pulling the white card. And that's not the game. It's very difficult to have two, one white man, one black man competing in the same area. The white man feels that he has privilege, but when he actually has to compete, then he will go to his boss or around his boss, to the boss's boss, to try to set up some system in which you don't have to be evaluated on the same level, same principles. That's one of the things that happens. And of course, black men become very angry at that. They feel they've been in and uh, sometimes the tasks that assign the two are not the same. But what I found is that black men that say absolutely nothing, just get to work out and, and at a certain level, there's a time when a company says, the, produ the production and the accuracy of the production of whoever's doing black or white is more important to us than somebody who's shiftless or, or shucking and jiving. So you have this white man who's struggling and who's not quite making it. But if you have this black guy who makes it all the time, because of money, the highest value lies in the object. What's the highest value in industry? Money. So if he can make the money for me and the other one can't, this one's got to go. So these are some of the, you now, when you have a white man that loses his job and a black man is in that place, boy, that upsets the whole paradigm of white privilege. That's when you get large numbers of white people who lost their jobs when there was a globalization, a lot of jobs going overseas. They lost their jobs. And now when they look at the marketplace, the people that have those jobs are younger people who have the technology. They are able to do all of the technological things that are necessary to have a job. Well, if you had a job, you don't have a job, and you see people that you feel are less than you with the job, where's the advantage of whiteness? So that's when you get the these different groups like the Proud Boys and the others that are and the white supremacists. They're trying to regain and recapture what we call whiteness, but it simply means privilege. And in this new 21st century, they're losing privilege. You see, it's no longer a struggle between whites and blacks to survive. If whites and blacks in this country don't work together, we won't survive as a nation. Why? Because China will take over. Do you think the Chinese care whether you're a white man or a black man? They don't care. You're not Chinese. So 
what is what do you think you are? You're not as good as we are. So that's what the European male has to begin to register in his head that the competition with China is real. They're talking about it now, they see it as a threat, but let me give you one example. I live here in Washington, DC, and every year, just before the, the, the year changes, the, the fiscal year changes here uh, in July, uh, August, the end of August, so the beginning of September is the beginning of, of the new fiscal year. If I have a department and I'm trying to plan for the year, how much money I'm going to spend for what projects, and all I get is a continuing resolution up to July, and then in August they pass something and say, spend all that money. Well, then people are calling on, oh, take some of this money, because if I don't spend all of it, then I don't get as much next year. Now, how can you plan a year in advance if I don't know at the beginning of the year how much I'm going to get. Well, let's look to see what happened in China at the last um, a communist, con a con communist uh, party conference that they had. The premier got up from China and said, we now have our plan in place to the year 2050. And in this country, we were still on a continuing resolution. Now, how are you going to be able to compete with people who are planning 2050 and you don't have next year's budget plan? So unless we as Americans begin to think more seriously about the fact that we need unity in order to be competitive. Now, why do we need unity to be competitive? University of Michigan professor, Dr. Page, Scott Page, wrote a book called um, cultural competence. And in his, no, The Difference is the name of his book, The Difference. And in his book, he said that all white male teams, homogeneous teams, are not as productive or creative as heterogeneous teams, meaning men, women, different, a multi ethnic, pluralistic, linguistically diverse group of workers are more creative and more productive than the old all white male group that made the decisions. Now we have the data, we have tons of it, but unless people recognize that white and black fighting each other, that's stupid, that's not going anywhere. We have to unite together in order to beat the competition that's out there. That's the point that I want to raise. Now let's look at some other examples. Uh, uh, Reverend Brown, you have to break in and tell me what any questions that come up that you wanna answer or ask, and then we'll move on from there. No, I, I think that you are covering things in a very natural way. And you are certainly getting, because one of the things that I, you know, we try to find the answer to is why is, 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 is this conflict between black males and white males so intense and it's historically intense so um, I knew that you would cover it in, in just in the uh, progression of explaining these cultural differences and why we have them. So you are, you are definitely doing what I had hoped you would do, but I would like for you to continue. All right, thank you. Well, let's go back to when that division happens. Uh, there's history before uh, 1619. So we have a great history as an African country. If you look in the, uh, one of the recent textbooks from Texas, uh, Texas has one of the largest printing of high school textbooks or school textbooks of any uh, organization around. So when Texas comes out with a textbook for school, because they can print so many for their own schools, then other school districts will buy their textbook because they're cheaper there it's already set up than to try to make their own or try to buy them through private resources. But one of the issues is that the, the Texas textbook is trying to negate slavery. They stated that the people that came were indentured servants and they came to the United States to learn how to 
to farm and to do agriculture? Well, now first of all, first part, the first people came here in 1619, they were indentured servants. They worked seven years and they were free. And that procedure lasted up to 1664. So all these people from 1619 to 1664 were indentured servants. Coming in from Africa to their seven years and out. Okay. When you understand that, then the question that is bothering you about the Texas explication is why would they come from Africa to learn how to farm? Did they not do any farming in in Africa? You see how silly some of these things are. You have to look at these things and see just how ridiculous they are. And that's where you make your attack on the, the ridiculousness of it. Um, one person was saying to me that the um, the gala, you know, where they were growing rice and so forth, that it was the, the English planters that in that demonstrated to them how to do it and and how important it was to do it with the water sources and everything that they had. And my question to this person that said that, I said, oh my goodness, that's very interesting because I want to know how many rice plants, how many rice patties do you have growing rice in England? So you see, you have to be able to get a, a false idea and just cut it in half with pure logic. Not hostile, not you know, no hating, we're not going to do hating, but just give information that makes it look so ridiculous. So they have to stop that. Now let's go back to this division about white men and black men. In England, you always have the upper class and the lower class. The upper class has absolutely nothing to do with the lower class. And they don't care what you do as lower class because you will never be upper class. So when the people came from England as indentured servants, some came from the prison, some came from debtor's prison, all kind of reasons that they came here. When they got here, they were lower class. And no one from the upper class would want to marry them or have anything to do with them other than to have them work as indentured servants. So black indentured servants and white indentured servants all work together, males and females. So were white women a privilege or something special? No, because she wasn't upper class. She was just another lower class person. What happens is, if I work for you for seven years and I am now free, I can have my own land in this country, which I could not have in, in England. I can have my own land. And if I worked as hard as I did for you, how much harder will I work for myself in order to take care of my land and have my land. Well, that's a very important thing. And of course, this white woman who was working right along there with you may easily want to marry you or be with you because the two of you working together, you can really do things well. Well, this was of no concern to, to the upper class. George Washington and all those were, they can trace their lineage back to England where they are part of the nobility. Maybe lesser mobility, but they, they're that class. Now, what happens is you have a revolt. It's called the Bacon Revolt. And this man is pressing that they can have their own land and their own profits. Well, when you do that, you're taking the plantation owner, this other group, you're taking all of his permanent workforce and they become competition for him in the marketplace. So we have to change the rules. And the House of Burgess systemically begins to change the rules. So if you have a white woman, indigenous servant, now free, and a black woman, former indigenous servant, and now free, on the black woman, when she gets her salary, <clears throat> a tax is put on it. So even though she makes the same money as the white, she loses money because the tax for being a black woman is taxed on her income, not on the white woman. So you're making a differentiation. And finally, they get to a point that blacks are channel slaves, meaning that you 
and all of your children forever and ever and ever, amen, are slaves for their whole life, period. Now, <clears throat> what, what does that do then? Because you have some black men who own property, and when you're owning property, you can vote. So you've got black men owning property that can vote, then white men with no property cannot vote. So you see, <clears throat> what do we have to do to keep the black and white people from uniting against the upper class? We move it from a class distinction of upper class and lower class. We move it to white and not white. So I tell you, even though you're dirt poor and white, and you're looking at this black over here that has his own horse, own house, and even a mule, that you're better than he is because you are white. That's the introduction of whiteness and what it carries. If we look at history, we will see other Europeans that came here. And when they came, an example are the Italians. They were not considered white. They were considered so lower class that they even worked in the cane farms of Louisiana <clears throat> when blacks refused to work in those farms. They, what happens is they become acculturated. That is, their children speak English with American schools, wear American clothes, have American slang, all these different things. They become acculturated into American cultural thinking. Once thinking that way and acting that way, they are then assimilated into whiteness. There are two books you might want to look at. One is When the Irish Became White. It's a textbook, a book. And then there's another book, When Jews Became White Folks. And both of these books talk about how much had to be done by Jews and by Irish, what they had to do to be assimilated. And once assimilated, they could then be, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, once acculturated, they could then be assimilated into whiteness. So that's the story in terms of this idea of white being superior. So that no matter how low I'm on the totem pole as a black, I can always look at you and call you the N-word because I'm better. Now what that creates is it creates a caste system and I'm reaching for my book. Here we are. Hold on. A caste says that no matter what you accomplish, <clears throat> you always remain at this level. So that no matter how much acculturation Blacks have, we are not going to be assimilated. And that puts you into what is called a caste. And I would strongly recommend that this book be read by everyone. And if you can't read that fast, it's a 24-hour tape that you can get the, 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 the text read to you on tape. But this is a very powerful work and it helps you to understand what does it mean to be in a caste system like the Indians have in India. The caste system says that no matter what you accomplish and who you are, you will always remain less than the rest of the society. That's a very powerful work and you should get it and, and read it. And if you can get her to come on your program, you really want her to come on and make, uh, make uh, an address to your audience. All right, we have about 10 or 15 minutes more. Um, <clears throat> let me, um, let's, let's talk about the workplace and how people are evaluated in the workplace. Sometimes when you go into a system and they say there's equity, there's diversity and inclusion, that's the new set of words now. It used to be race relations and, and workforce 2000. It was a lot of other things, but it, now it has come up to the new thing. Those are the new three words, okay? One way to look to see if you're receiving promotions like everyone else is that when when the, when the work is laid out saying that you must accomplish red, 
green and blue before you can move to the next level. What they typically will do with white is give you all three in the first year and you can move on. Black will only give you two of them, which means you've got to work another year to get the third one. And your competition has already moved another year ahead. So you could never catch up. That's one way of doing it. Now, what Asians experience is they will say to them, oh, you're so good in math. We're going to, you just stay and you do come, you do the, the statistical math thing. And we're going to pay you more each year. So they get the pay. But when they say, well, I want to move to the next level, they say, well, but you don't have the blue, the green, and the red. They say, well, I didn't get a chance to get the blue, the green, and the red because I was always doing the black. Well, why are you dissatisfied? You're making the same money. No, I want to be a supervisor. No, well, you can't until you do these. So this is how people are sometimes locked in a position because they're good at it, but that doesn't move them toward becoming supervisors or managers. And the other is of the three things that's necessary to move from step from year one to year two are three items, but I will only give you one to do and I'll give you another this next year. I'll give you the next, next one the third year. So it takes you three years to do the three things and my competition has moved up in those three years closer to supervision and management. So those are techniques that are used, and that is called the spider chart. It was developed by a black who went to the University of Vienna years and years ago. So that gives you a way to look at when I'm in a job and I feel that I'm stuck, then you go in and you ask, what are the requirements to move from space one to space two? Let them spell them out, and you put that on your performance appraisal sheet. Then you want to make sure that you're given the opportunity to do each of those things. And if you're not given the opportunity to do it, then you have to ask, why am I not given the opportunity to do it when my white counter counterpart is doing all three of them in this year, and you're only giving me two or one of these, which is putting me behind in terms of inclusion, equity, and diversity. That's one of the games that's played. So you want to be mindful of that. Now in the remaining time, I want to talk about increasingly we have more Asians in our culture. And we're going to, particularly on the West Coast, you have a lot of Asians in different positions. And you're going to have um, Asians moving throughout the country in different positions. So let's examine and see what their value is. Their highest value is in the cohesiveness of the group. The group has to stay together, cohesive. What is important about that is how they make decisions to keep the group cohesive. You have a person who is the titular head. That means they're in charge for right now. Somebody else will be charged later. That who's gonna be in charge kind of rotates. But this group of people are going to do a task and they have to make a consensus before they can do it. So if you have 10 people, they're your group, you're the titular head, the guy says, I wanna know how many of your people are coming to my workshop. And everybody knows this is the child is the head. But he says to you, I'll get back to you. Now, if you don't understand that, you say, well, he said, hey, why can't you just go in and tell me how many are coming? That's all I want to know. He's always pushing me off, pushing me off, telling me, I'll get back to you, I'll get back to you. Why doesn't he just tell me? He can't tell you anything until he goes back to those other nine and asks them, are you willing to do this? Will you do this? And everyone says in a consensus, yes, we will all do it. So when he goes back to you and says, 10 will be at the meeting, 10 will be at the meeting, as all 10 said, with their voice and their heart, I will be there, which indicated their intent. And they'll all be there. Now let's see what happens when you send out your email and um, I, Reverend Brown just sent out this email saying that he wants me to come to his workshop and he sends it to everybody. 
He has the workshop and Nichols doesn't appear. Mm -hmm. He calls me, he says, Nichols, you know, why didn't you come to my workshop? And my response is, now, Reverend Brown, you know, if you want me to come to your workshop, you'd have called me. Because that's <laughs> what? That's the relationship. You just sent me an object, an email. That's okay for white folks, but that ain't okay for me. If you want me to come, you, you call me. Because that's our relationship. Now, you see how people can get all upset? Here, here are two black people. One is upset with the other. I sent you the email. Why didn't you come? And because I have a relationship with you, I thought I had a relationship with you. Now, man, you know, if you want me to come, you should call me and tell me, come. You see, now, how do I do that when I know that I have, I want to, I have an audience of white people. I have an audience of Asians and I want my audience of black people to be there. I call my friends and I say, now, look, don't y'all have me stand up in front of all them white folks and them Asians and ain't nobody y'all coming. You better come and bring somebody with you. Okay, everybody laughs because I've established the what, the relationship. And then, of course, you'll have two or three rows of black people sitting there looking at you, doing your workshop. So I hope this has been helpful for you in understanding that even though we are having the, we have the same value system, we have to be mindful to carry it over into our value system rather than the supposition that this is European, the object, it's the email, and I got it. But if I don't respond, you have to realize, well, why? Why didn't you respond? Oh, I didn't do the appropriate ethnic thing. I didn't contact him in a one-on-one -on -one to maintain the relationship. So thank you, Reverend Brown. I hope this has been helpful in understanding the differences in axiologies. Oh, it is. Um, it has been most helpful. One question that that may seem obvious to some people and may not, but most black people say, well, we have survived slavery. We have survived everything white folk have been able to throw at us. And we will survive whatever else they throw at us. Do you feel that survival among African Americans is kind of automatic, or do you feel that our uh, progress and survival is really dependent upon how we come together and lay out a platform to make sure we do survive? Do you think we can actually be exterminated here in America? Yeah, um, let's look at it in terms of a, a different way. The way I want to look at it is um, that we survived everything because the family unit was the unit of survival for us as African Americans. The family was the unit. But systematically, the family was destroyed to a point that a part of that was the drugs that destroyed the Black family. Because when you have a young man that will hurt his mother, hurt his grandmother for money to go buy drugs, the black family is completely destroyed. So one way that we have to recapture the blackness and survive is we have to reclaim the family. But we have all these things that are out there to prevent us from doing that. You take the young men you don't give them an education, you don't give them a job, and they turn to self-medication because they're depressed, or they start to sell to make money to survive. And then you give them these long prison sentences, which, which happened. So all of your productive years, if you go in jail at 18, and you've got 20 years in jail, 18, okay, 28, 38 before you come out and you have no skills, you have no trade, you can't get a job because you're a felon, you can't get an apartment in this building because you're a felon, then what do you do other than get caught back up in the circle and you're gone for some more? So when are the productive years? When can you produce healthy children? We know what 
what happens when have people have this geriatric spermatozoa. Just look at your president, your fa your former president. Oh, that's naughty, Nicole. Stop hating. <laughs> Shame on me. But um, no, the black family will survive if we can reshape the family unity. That's the biggest thing that has been destroyed. And a part of that has been children, having children, having children, because there's no memory to tell you how to raise children, how to take care of them, or even to have been a child yourself. Years ago at Howard University, they had support groups for grandmothers, 30 and younger. Now, just try to wash that through your head. And you can see that the destruction of the black reality and survival has been the destruction of the black family. And that's the unit that we have to pull back together in order to survive the 21st century. Dr. Nichols, I want to thank you. And um, I look forward to uh, continuing this dialogue with you in the near future. Again, thank you so much. You're quite welcome, Reverend Brown. I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you.